few better people to take you for a tour of this amazing racetrack. Marcus Ambrose with the track guide. Uh, what a cool lap that is. And that Ford Mustang will be right in the mix today, you feel, with a really well-balanced driving combination. They go off grid 11, but you can win this race from anywhere you like. Six hours starts right now. The clock is ticking as the field sets off for their formation lap. They run one lap behind the Hyundai safety car and then the green flag drops and they will attack Mount Panorama at speed on a really chilly morning here on Easter Sunday in the central west of New South Wales. For the first time, it's just cracked 10 degrees here. 10.3 degrees now, but there's a 40 kilometre hour breeze blowing down pit straight, and it feels like four degrees, not 10. So it's properly frosty this morning, but this will be a really cool race. Marcus Ambrose will start the Mediki Motor Group Ford Mustang GT. 10 speed auto and everything and he's been a great insight this weekend as part of our Stan Sport team. I'm Richard Crow with me in the commentary box my good mate Matt Nolte and super cheap auto TCR Australia superstar. He's pretty good at commentary too annoyingly. Josh Buckins with us as well. Boys good morning to you. We're looking forward to this. A classic Bathurst Enduro awaits us. Yeah good morning gents. Thank you for having me and that uh, lovely intro. Uh, while we're on board with uh, a much bigger superstar than me, I can assure you. Uh, lots of that up and down the grid. There are some huge names uh, mixed in with some names you may not recognise. Uh, so great opportunity for some guys who are trying to forge a career to really punch above their weight and uh, upset the apple cart. And we're taking you through some of our range of in-car cameras. The Barguanas are back. The Burst and Auto Parts team, Ben and Jude Barguana. Jude starting the car today from down the field in 17th position. Grant Daniel, who spent a bit of time on the deck chair yesterday during the GT4 race down at turn number one. This is another strong combination. Sure, they may not rock the top of the tree early in the day, but they'll be there all day long. And that's the ride on board, the Berwick Linton number 23 BMW from pole position. And they've got the family shout out, including Will Jr. who's baking away. Uh, Rihanna here this weekend. Congratulations to the Davison Crean clan for the uh, incoming birth, but well done to them. And they've got their nice little Easter message. This is the GWR Mercedes AMG A45, a car that has dominated the uh, Class A1 class for forced induction extreme performance cars. And they will start this race from uh, just inside the top 10 with Mike Sheargold behind the wheel from ninth position. And that's the scene at Mount Panorama. It's a beautiful day, but it is cold as we check the starting grid for the seventh running of the High Tech Oils Bath of Six Hour. So, Beric Linton, Tim Lane, Will Davison starting from the pole. Linton starting the car. The Russells and Overcastrians locking out the front row and the go-karts go BMW. You've got the Saul Burgess and Deepa Squally BMW joined by Cabbage and Cabbage and Tom Randall who jump into the yellow 92 BMW. The best way to understand the classes is check out the colour on the left-hand side of the graphic so you can tell the orange cars class X, A2 in yellow, A1 in blue. That will be your ID across the course of the race and we'll keep you up to speed with our class leaderboards with who's leading each category. And that's the joy of this race. There's a race within a race, within, within a, race. a race and another race as well. <laughs> Eight classes filling up the six hour field. We work our way through to the middle of a 59 car starting grid. Jim Usel actually a long way back in that Harding Performance Golf in 30th position. Thought they'd be a little bit higher up. Watch out Jake Camilleri and Scotty Nicholas in that Mazda 3 from Class C pole and 33rd outright. That is a giant killing car. Any sort of weather comes in, that thing will rocket to the front. You can see the Class D pole sitter back there in 42nd place. The Subaru BRZ, Lockie Blocks will do the job in qualifying. The Les Lights, father and son combination. And then right down to the Class E pole sitter, Bathurst own Shane Fowler did the business there in the Mazda 3 SP25. 59 cars to take the grid. The distance record, 131 laps or just over 813 kilometres. The biggest winning margin of this race is a lap, the smallest last year at 7.4 seconds. The winners last year came from 63rd and last position. And the winner of this race has come from pole position two of the previous six times. And last year, Matt Nolte, 11 lead changes 
between seven different drivers and no reason to expect that will be any different on this chilly Easter Sunday and this year's six-hour classic. We have a couple of cars at the tail of the field as well to keep an eye on as well. The Jordan Cox car and Carl Beck joined by David Russell. It's again a BMW lockout here. The 2023 high-tech oils back the six-hour. Settle in and get comfy. The lights go out. The cars make their way up to the line right now. You watch the charge on the way down to turn number one. No start. Yellows have come back on. Yeah, the formation at the back there was pretty scrappy. I'd say that's what's caused that. And uh, Has that happened before? Oh, I, don't, I don't recall not, it. I don't, I don't recall. Race, no. I'm used to it at Super Speedway events, but not at Bathurst like that. So you're right, there's a lot of cars. I was watching through the chase. There's a lot of cars still yeah. taking their way through. I'll tell so you what, as a driver, it's the worst thing to have a, a rolling start <laughs> delayed. Try to be a commentator just then building it up. <laughs> I know, you're going to have to do it all over again. Did you, re you remember what you said? No, it's gone. <laughs> but trying to now, for the next six kilometres, get yourself into that same place you got yourself coming out of that last corner. The adrenaline dump that you might have just had, you've got to go all over again. So, yeah, just confirm, two spread out at the back, and that can happen in a nearly 60-car field. I mean, we can't really blame them for that, can we? So uh, it is their job to form up uh, usually when safety car lights go out, but perhaps uh, perhaps they need to do a little bit beforehand. I caught the yellows come on and the start gantry just out of our window here on the main straight, which got my attention. So confirming the back half of the field, too far back. I mean, there's a 40-second discrepancy between the pole car and the last car without the penalties. So it's not going to take long to find lap traffic, trying to keep them as much as they can. Well, that's the aim of the game here in the early stages. The thing is, this continues, the clock countdown straight yeah, away. We're only nine minutes. Uh, sorry, six minutes into the race already. Yeah, without having an official lap score yeah. yet because yeah. we haven't actually started properly racing. The clock ticks from when they go off on the formation lap. It's a good opportunity now to talk about some of the drivers starting this race because there's some split strategies throughout this field. So the two cars in the front row have elected to start they're non-professional driver, so they could plug in Will Davison in the car we're riding on now. Uh, Wayne Russell will start the 58 go-karts go-car. It could have been Drew or Aaron. Drew qualified the car so brilliantly on the front row. But on the second row of the grid, they've gone a little bit different. Anton Di Pasquale starts the number four car that he'll share with Anthony Sewell. Tom Randall will start the BMW M2 competition that he'll share with the brothers Cavich. So a little bit of a split strategy there, which is really interesting, and it's going to make those opening couple of laps where, in theory, Anton and Tom Randall should go to the front of the field on yeah. raw pace. Hey, look, it is, make brave. It, it, it is brave to put your, with respect, non-professional driver in the car to start because everyone wants to be a bit of a winner at the start, right? You want to... Uh, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, you, you, in the front, you're you, away from the trouble, as we're on board here with Ambrose. Speaking of professionals, <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty good CV on the old Ambrose, doesn't, isn't it? He goes okay. And in front, <laughs> Jason Gomisal, not a pro driver, but a guy with a lot of experience and a, a lot of time behind the wheel of these cars. They've really enjoyed their build-up this weekend for this race. So a uh, couple of Ford Mustangs just outside the top 10. So they'll grid up this time and hopefully have a better shot at getting this race underway. This is viewing the comp box. You had your sunnies on a second ago. No, I didn't. Don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> at least it's warm in here. It's cosy, but it's warmer than it is outside. It is nice. It's one of those days. I used to complain about how hot this box would get on a day like this, but it is really, really cold conditions here right now. The cars are making their way back around to attempt the start once again. We haven't seen this before in the six hour. And they get back out into... The Rosa 2, so the word is they will go regardless of the situation this time, letting the cars gather at the back of the field. So this is that point you talk about, you build yourself up again, you've got to get the your, your emotions right, you've got to make sure you're not too put off by what just happened a few moments ago. I guess the guys in the middle will be focused on that more than maybe the pole sitter. I think the guy, I'm, I'm just looking at the race from an outside point. I think the guys in the front, the front two rows, those two BMWs, this is a great spot. They've burnt nearly 10 minutes of uh, AM driver time. I think this is already putting them in a good spot for the race. Well, take two on Easter Sunday, the traditional Bathurst Enduro, multi-classes, multi-cars, a big field. And this time we go racing. 
BMWs lock out the top spot, but this is as wide open as a Bathurst Enduro has ever been. Away we go on Easter Sunday. The high-tech oils Bathurst six-hour bursts into life. Pulsitter leads us into turn number one, and look at the amount of cars, 59 of them. They're still coming up underneath the high-tech oils bridge. The BMWs lead us up Mountain Straight for the first time with five hours and 48 left on the clock, and already the battles begin, not even two kilometres into the race. Well, that's the age-old one, isn't it? Evo and WRX. I'm sure our friend Molly down at the sidelines will be uh, waving the flag for the boxer <laughs> engine there, but it, there's just so many of them. They just don't stop. Arm wrestle at the front already, and Anton Di Pasquale was looking to make some moves, and he's made them. He's got to second position. Oh, oh. that's tight on the opening lap. So it's Hodges in the 21 car looking to go up the inside of Wayne Russell through the kink before the worth cutting. Tom Randall's in there in that bright yellow BMW. Just behind them, Tyler Everingham in the 24. Then we go back to Ryland Gray at 16 years of age, making his first Bathurst start and got the job of starting his Ford Mustang. It could have been much worse up there at the cutting on that first lap. Terrible gag to start the race. But it's too early for these kind I of shenanigans. Oh, here's the a GT4 move. Oh. <laughs> it moves over into the high-tech oils race. They've been watching the GT4 guys taking inspiration. Uh, for those of you who didn't tune in, every move in the GT4 category for the lead was made at McPhillamy Park. Don't worry about Nowhere conventional 90-degree <laughs> corners and braking zones. Let's do it at 180 while turning hard left. Di Pasquale is looking racy here early. They want to get that car to the front and get some clear air and some track position. As we watch from our drone, that's the view through the S's and down to Forest Elbow. There's a move. Another move. Oh, there'll, there'll be plenty. There's 59 cars all trying to make <laughs> Not them really start. narrowing it down, is there, saying there's a move? So the field nicely done across the top of Mount Panorama, sorting themselves out early as we watch a side-by-side -side battle. Tom Randall and Tyler Everingham, Super 2 rivals a couple of years ago, and Everingham's got a very good run. And this for the race lead. Anton Di Pasquale up the inside at the kink on Berwick Linton and wrestles that spot away. Yeah, I think that's smart from Berwick to uh, not really fight too much. Uh, they are in the same race, but I think for driver pairings, they're not. And if you look at it from a time point of view, he's effectively spent 11 minutes in the lead. It's probably 10 minutes more than they thought they might have uh, in the lead of this race with the pairing that they're at at the moment. So all things are still uh, still well for, for that Berwick car. And, and just confirming, that car that's now in second place Timing says one thing, but the list of nominated starting drivers said it was Jaden Ojeda behind the wheel of car 21. So the young star from Sydney who's been very successful. So he is starting that yep. car. It's not Simon Hodges, his teammate. So that's why that car's going real quick to the front of the field, car number 21. So Anton Di Pasquale, the first racing lap of the High Tech Oils back to six hour, goes the way of Shelby Power Racing Supercar star. Ojeda next, Linton in third position, Everingham fourth and Wayne Russell off the front row back to fifth with Thomas Randall next and then everybody else down to 59th place. <laughs> Car 96, of course, has started from the tail of the field. The fierce racing BMW driven at the start by Scott Turner. It's made up at least 16 positions inside the top 40 now from the tail of the field. So we'll keep an eye on that. One of the B1 cars that was penalised earlier today, the pole sitter from that class. So they'll be charging their way up in the early stages. And that's the margin already. As Steve Pasquale, Ojeda, Linton, Everingham, and Wayne Russell climb the top of Mount Panorama on the second flying lap. And for Anton Di Pasquale, these are probably the three or four laps of peace he's going to get for the rest of the day, external to safety cars. Because in two or three laps time, he is going to get to the back of the field Correct. and start lapping slower cars. Yep, exactly. And, you know, you can really, really set your race up now get a nice gap and start making your own way through the lapped cars and not being dictated by who's behind you trying to rush it or anything like that. So I think what's interesting as well here is uh, obviously Jaden in uh, P2 here. He's got uh, the sectors on Anton at the front at the moment. And I spoke to Jaden yesterday and I said, mate, you know, you've done a wild card or two, you've done Super 2 and you, you do the, the, the Enduros, but wouldn't it nice to be knock off, to knock off a few of the, uh, the main guys in relatively equal machinery as we can see here? He played it cool, but I guarantee that's going through his head at the moment. How's you telegraphing what Jaden O'Jada wants to do? 
make this commentary game look easy. Nice call by Josh Buck, and that's exactly what's happened. He's sliced it down the inside of Anton Di Pasquale, and the number 21 BMW, after two racing laps, becomes the third different leader of this year's high-tech oils path the six hour. Pretty decent tone setter, isn't it? But he has to be careful at this point. It is so easy to see the red mist. You've got you've obviously two quick drivers in the cars. You've got a big gap to third. You do not want to blow the tyres off it, and you don't want to absolutely drink all of your fuel uh, that is going to throw you away from your numbers. So uh, that is also a very important point. You don't want to throw everything at it 15 minutes into the race. Yeah, and to give you an idea, that 2.25.3 on the first lap is some three tenths quicker, five tenths quicker than what they went in qualifying yesterday. So they're not just taking this easy on the first lap. They're out here to put a margin. It's out to five seconds now on Beric Linton, who started the car from pole position, and another one and a half seconds back to Tyler Everingham as we have a bit of a waiter here on the field and check in with the local legends car on its way up into the top with Grant Denyer behind the wheel. The Sharons, fresh from their run earlier today in the GT4 race. It's Randall works the back of Wayne Russell here in the Go-Karts Go BMW. Battle here for fourth, uh, fifth position. For those of you following some drivers charging from the back of the field, Carl Beck started car 40. That's the Speed Cafe BMW M4. They've been had a range of fuel pressure issues in that car all weekend. They started this race from 57th position, and last time they were 29th after two laps of racing. That's so not bad, is it? Blazing their way through. And that's the thing with, with the discrepancies in cars on the grid. Yes, starting last doesn't sound so great on the run sheet, but. Uh, you can pretty easily get a lot of that ground back to get into at least a competitive position, but all the while, some of the guys you're racing at the front are uh, not navigating through traffic and making making hay while the and, and you've got to be you've got to watch what's going on. There's cars out there that are battling within their own race out there, but you've got fast cars trying to pick them off. Easy to make a mistake, easy to be caught up in someone else's drama in the early stages. And once they start making their way to the top 10, it's like this rarefied air, isn't there? They don't have to worry about too much lap traffic in the early stages. How's the steering wheel on the Mustang? Is that factory, is it? it, it that is not a factory four <laughs> option. That's the Denier Edition Mustang. It's taken straight off a GT4 car, I think you'll find, for the local Legends car. So this is Tony Quinn, Ryder Quinn and Grant Denyer, who's behind the wheel. Local Legends doesn't get much more legendary <laughs> than that bloke at this place. It's rather appropriate, isn't it? It just so is. So he's running second in class A2, eighth outright, Ryland Gray in front at 16. I saw his dad, Jeremy, who's a well-known racer in production cars and touring car masters, among other things. And he said, yep, yeah, we're, we're throwing the 16-year-old kid at the start of the race, we'll see how he goes. Well, right now, he's leading the bloke that's been on the podium at this place in GT Racing and the six hour. Last winner last year. Nice start in that Century 21. And then further back, we find the Sharon BMW. And there's Marcus Ambrose, who started the Mediki Motor Group car. This will be Jim Yusel behind the wheel of the 222 Harding Performance Volkswagen Golf R. Yeah, and these guys would be one of the uh, several cars on the grid praying for rain. Golf R, obviously, an all-wheel drive car. So uh, if it rains, this will... Uh, this car will be one of the ones to be watching, along with the A45s, along with, uh, what else is all we'll driving the grid? Evos, Evo obviously. Lances, yeah. Evos, Cameron Crick back there in 17th at the moment. You'd be an Evo guy. Surely you've had an Evo in your car history. I'd like an Evo in the car history. I'm a Skyline guy, so, oh, okay. you know. It's probably more a case of what haven't you driven. <laughs> like, like, I, I'm, I'm more about unreliability and short bursts of speed. So if I want an Evo and reliability, then maybe, but. Uh, Jeez. Jesus. He is a commentator. Skyline's yes, a is. Sky I'm a Skyline, I'll perform a Skyline owner. Bug and they are terrible. They explode at the drop of a hat. Bargwana up the inside with the pass in the Audi TTRS. So 21st position with Jude Bargwana behind the wheel. Benjamin Bargwana will jump in later. Cousins going racing. And the whole Bargwana clan here, I think I counted 12, but I could be wrong. And this is on board that. Personal Auto Parts Audi TT RS right in the thick of the action. Oh, there's a bit going on here with the Evos. Yeah. And that's the Class B1 leader as well with Matt Charter behind the oh, wheels. Oh, bugs. No good. Just kept it off the gravel as well. We'll drop at least half a dozen positions. He was at the back of that train of cars that was headed by Mike Sheargold. But they started 17th. Remember, they lost four or five positions in the first couple of laps. They've lost a lot more now. 
down yeah. to 24th at that sector, but I think there'll be a few more when it corrects itself down here at the exit of Forest Elbow. That's unfortunate. And a great driver pairing in that uh, Burst and Auto Parts Audi TT again, another all-wheel drive car, uh, and two very, very good operators in uh, Benny Bargs and Jude there. So, again, another car to watch through the race. Both uh, probably, well... Here it is. Here so, we go. so what they were here? three wide at McPhillamy Park, and Jude just went the full send around the outside of the Campbell Evo. And that 41 Class B Commodore SSV in there as well. A bit early for that kind yeah, of stuff, I think. Kind of did race. that on his own there, and um, probably avoidable, but look, you can, you can just get away with a mistake like that, I think, now that we've had some dry running over the last day or so. Those marbles are starting to build up. And, I think that's probably what you saw there. Just got on some dirty track and away it went from him. Well, that's two wides a bit crazy up there. Three wide, just forget three, it. Three wides starting to really push the envelope, yeah. isn't it? Uh, Age-old racing car driver once told me, Richard, the throttle pedal is not binary. It has positions <laughs> you can lift off. <laughs> you say yes, it says no. Meantime, Marcus Ambrose. And that's a change of position for Tony D'Alberto. So this is a battle of the commentary team oh, no. because if you haven't... Been Last time he us. went through here in a co with a Commodore oh, next to him. Oh, no. I don't want to bring it up. Don't do it, Josh. Uh, Tony D'Alberto has been with us in the commentary box for GT World Challenge this weekend, and Mark is part of our Stan Sport team. So the HSV working its way forward, and Tony doing a nice job, really. So that's for 10th position. Beautiful livery on the HSV just ahead. You ride with two-time supercar champ Marcus Ambrose. That thing sounds great. Listen to it, Rev. This seems like it's got revs for days. And you can see the speed, 170, 180, 90, 196 indicated. So if you ever thought these cars were uh, were not overly fast relative to what you think, that's nearly 200 k's an hour into uh, McPhillamy. That's as quick as any other car out there. Yeah, these are not slow cars. No. They're, they may be production stretch. cars, but they're not slow. The mid 220s for pole position at this place. So we've ridden aboard the local Legends car, and that's your traditional six-speed H-pattern gearbox. This team elected to go with the 10-speed auto, so there are paddle shifters as well. They can use those. They can leave it in auto as well if they want, and often the car brain is smarter than the driver brain sometimes, so they can just leave it in auto. But the reason they did that and, and rolled the gamble to go with the auto is that the gearing's better. 10 speeds, you've got more selection, you've got more choice. And they felt like the Mustangs relative to the BMWs were struggling going up the hill. So this team, when they built this car a couple of years ago, went, we're going to try the 10 speed auto, the gear ratios are better, we've got more choice, we can use more of the engine, more of that RPM Josh Buckingham was talking about just before. Uh, and turn it into a good package. Right now, it seems like it's going okay. Yeah, I think uh, in the manual car, you go and use third and fourth. Uh, in the automatic, you use fourth to eighth. So you've got 10 gears and you only use four of them. So uh, shows how high a speed the, the track is that you don't get below fourth gear in, uh, in the Mustang. So high average speed around Bathurst Slowest Corner is the elbow, obviously, but it's downhill. You can always afford to run a bit of a higher gear there so that you're not making a gear change immediately after that. Uh, but even turn one, turn one's a 100k an hour corner. It doesn't look it, but it's certainly a very fast corner. Unlike the local Legends guy, it's carrying the conventional steering wheel, <laughs> which Marcus was talking about during the weekend, that all the usual alarms would come up in the road car, has to keep resetting when they yep. pop up. So he's learning this car on the run. He'll hand over to George Medici, who's fresh from his honeymoon. It's very relaxed and cheerful down in the paddock. And the very underrated Tim Brook in that car as well. Looking forward to see how TB goes over the course of the day. As we go back to our leading group of cars, with Jade No Jada out by nearly four seconds now to Deep Pasquale, Everingham, Randall and Linton still the top five, but some 17 seconds away. So five laps into the race, they're in the traffic. And that will be the story of the day. And traffic management in this race is more important than any other race at Mount Panorama because the speed differential is so much higher. So if you watch the Bathurst 1000, all the supercars are within a second and a half of each other in that race. If you watch the Bathurst 12 hour, even a GT th uh, GT4 car is 10 to 12 seconds a lap slower than a fast GT3 car. In this race, the leaders are doing 225s. The cars at the back are doing 255s or slower. Yeah. So it's a huge difference in speed, but it's not just lap speed. The, the straight line speed difference is huge. The cornering speed difference is huge. So there's so many variables 
and traffic management in this race is one of the absolute keys to getting to the end. And it can and may will decide the way this race plays out in the closing stages. And like we saw in the GT4 race today, it's where you catch these cars on the track. You'd want to catch them on Mountain Straight or Conrad Straight, not from Skyline onwards, or so, sorry, from the cutting towards Skyline. Yeah, you're certainly right. And it can really, really make or break your, your stint. If you are tussling with a car that's at a very similar pace, you catch a lap car, you lose a spot, that can really upset uh, your stint. But uh, at the moment, it seems like everyone's doing quite a good job. I'm just trying to look at the car behaviour of uh, Jaden Ojeda here relative to what we just saw with Anton Di Pasquale in the number four uh, BMW M4. Just trying to see if how differently they're driving and if Jaden's pushing on a little bit more relative to Anton. Uh, five and a half seconds is the gap so I would suggest Jaden has dropped the hammer uh, maybe now he's starting to reel it back because the car still looks quite under control and I know when these cars are fast they uh, start to move around a bit this is the battle of the V8 so Tony Delberto there in the Commodore HSV is in the X class, which is ultimate performance in between the V8s in class A2, which is extreme performance normally aspirated. And he's dicing with the class leader there with Ryland Gray, who we mentioned earlier at 16, starting this year's race. It's a good little combination. That's a new car that Chris Delsma has had on the build for some time. Century 21, he's a realtor. He's been racing production cars for, here we go, the longest production cars have been racing in modern era. And this is that traffic stuff we've been talking about and the little Toyota 86 getting out of the way and then the Class E car, Shane Fowler will start that race. They've wrapped the bonnet with the Easter Bunny for the celebrations this morning. Broke his record too, 20 minutes it took to wrap that car <laughs> just last night. I'd be able to do that in 20, it'd just be look terrible. <laughs> Over windscreen, mirrors. And that's a nice job by those lap, lapped cars. The, the exactly. trickiest part of the racetrack to get out of the way of, of a car that's 30 seconds a lap faster. They did the right thing. <laughs> we'll have sore necks by the end of today looking in their rearview mirrors, though. So, Ryland Gray doing a nice job. Ryan Casher qualified that car. He's been doing double duties in Canada Excel Racing, so getting plenty of laps this weekend. And then Chris Delsman is a dab hand at production car racing. So, they're a really good combination in what is a class. I reckon A2 is the hardest class to pick for mine this weekend. It's, it's the Ford Mustang fight, mm -hmm. but um, there's a couple of other little wild cards in there, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that one plays out. Jason Domisall and Aaron Seaton, another strong combination in Class A2 as well. Big shout out to Ryan Casher. He won the XL race this morning of a grid of no less than 60 cars that have been racing here in the last three days at the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. As we stay with the battle for 10th and 11th, the Mustangs taking us down towards Murray's Corner. As we're chalking up almost 30 minutes of racing with the aborted first start. If you just joined our coverage here today from Mount Panorama, a new one for the race. We've never seen that before in six hour competition. But at the moment, Jaden Ojeda leads by seven seconds back to Anton Di Pasquale. It's Class X cars, as many as you like, inside the top 10. But very early days, the sun continues to shine here at Mount Panorama. So there'd be a little bit of bragging rights here. You've obviously got uh, TD, Dalberto in the Holden. You've got Daniel in the Ford. There are also teammates in uh, Lamborghini for the Bathurst 12 hour GT3 action. So maybe a bit of bragging rights as to, oh, mate, I'll qualify the car next year yeah. if I uh, take out the six hours. So it'd be interesting to keep an eye on those two, even though they're not in the same class. I'm sure they're. Uh, thinking about that in the back of their mind as well. Stay with the field, cresting the mountain here. So everybody is still on the track and that's a big tip of the hat to the field of 59. We're working our way through the lap traffic already. It took five laps to get to that point. Here's Aaron McGill and John Bow out in there. A couple of veterans of Australian motorsport teaming up once again here at Mount Panorama. And it is JB behind the wheel of the Ranger lifting Ford Falcon GTF, and this is a genuine GT Falcon. It's not just a Falcon that's been souped up and GT badges on. I was chatting to Aaron McGill, McGill about it last night. He's been racing this car for a, a couple of years. He said it is a genuine off-the-factory showroom for it was built, bought brand new to be turned into a race car before we knew that they'd stop making them. And uh, it is a really trick bit of kit. John Bow loves driving it. 
They've battled in the past with overheating on that car because they never ran an intercooler from the factory. So it's a supercharged V8, 5.4 litre V8. So they had engine temperature issues. So today is purpose built for that car because it is so cold outside. It's only gonna help the durability and the performance of this car over the duration. So watch out for these two. John Bauer, of course, a two-time winner of the great race. He's a Bathurst 12-hour winner, looking to join an elite club of winning the 12, the 1,000, and the six. And he's thoroughly enjoying this. And so too, Aaron McGill, who loves this pl place so much, he proposed to his now wife he did. on the grid before a Super 2 race here <laughs> several years ago. And of course, they went door handle to door handle and touring car masters for a bit. Of course, McGill ran that beautiful XY GDH Hove. Memory serves you right, he had that big spin at Adelaide years ago, oh, turn, turn eight. eight. That yeah. went from turn eight to turn nine. He'll be back in that car later this Fantastic. season in Golf West and all touring car masters. We'll catch that on the Shannon Speed Series later on in the year. I'm surrounded by motorsport clips and knowledge pieces <laughs> I never thought I'd be surrounded by. <laughs> you know the cars, we know the, yeah, we know the right. racing you know the moments. <laughs> you can drive them. That's yeah. all, this is all we've got. We just want to be. Speaking of, uh, speaking of driving, I'll tell you what, Bowie um, is probably, uh, I don't think anyone knows his real age. He's a bit of an enigma like that, isn't he? But uh, well, we've been to four of his 21st birthdays, so correct. it's going yeah, to yeah. be coming up. Yeah, so, uh, but in all fairness, still a very, very good operator in these sorts of cars. You know, V8, H pattern, uh, just getting around it. Uh, even in TCM now, he's still an extremely, extremely competitive driver. I remember seeing him at a test day at Winton once uh, for the first time when I was starting out driving, and uh, I thought, who's this old bloke driving? And it's just Bowie, and uh, hit every apex, got every gear shift perfect. Uh, safe to say, I did not do the same. So, uh, still a very good driver. Um, still likes the fact that to this day that he was part of the making of the legend that is Craig Lowndes here in yes. 1994 and he just reminds people that he actually won that race. Yeah. I was in the yellow Ford, you might remember. Correct, <laughs> he still won with Dick Johnson there in the EB Falcon. And uh, it's a cool story, this is uh, Marcus. So they've got the 95 car up to 11th place actually, which is exactly where they started and he's following Grant Denier around. As, so this car was the BMW that started from the very back of the field and it was Carl Beck behind the wheel. So they've decided to get themselves off sequence and hit early for fuel. And that's because the... They've been waiting oh, for the crew to get back behind the red line and that's one of the key points here. The car can't leave. Oh, one for the 90 seconds, but the whole crew has to be back behind that line. They got to nearly 30th position. Yep. Remember the Class X cars have got to compete, complete at least six pit stops in here. So nice to get him out of that traffic, at least tick one of those boxes off. Yeah, I don't mind that because they're so far down the field, it doesn't really matter anyway. Get your pit stops out of the way as early as you can, and then you can run the race to your own fuel strategy, and your own driver time strategy. The, the rules for pit lane here are very, very tight and they're very, very well policed. We'll go into them in more detail later when everyone gets into the lane, but the reason they've pitted now is because the compulsory pit stop window is open. And it's the same story for Tom Randall, who peels off from fourth position in the search for a cure yellow entry, the BMW M2. So they're pitted early. The pit window opens 30 minutes into the race. It closes 30 minutes to the end of the race. And no tyre changing while refuelling is happening. I ain't going to bother changing tyres. He just bleeds some of the air off. How critical is that here in a race like this? Yeah, absolutely. It can be. Is a bit of smoke on the left hand screen? No. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Tyre pressures are very important in a race like this. The track's heating up. Uh, the tyres are heating up. The brakes and all the components around the car that surround the wheel well start to heat up. So tyre pressure can be... Um, adversely increased through factors other than just driving. So you need to constantly be managing that. Uh, Ambrose told us a funny story earlier about how NASCAR managed <laughs> some uh, some tyre pressure back in the day. But... Um, I don't think that would work here somehow. Uh, I don't think so. I think the answer was dodgily. Yeah. But <laughs> yes, very. Don't tell uh, race uh, control. Allegedly. Yeah. Uh, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. Yeah. So that's the first compulsory pit stop done. 90 seconds, and it's from the control line at the start of pit lane to the control line at the exit, is where young Thomas has left. The other thing to, to note is driver time, and it's not an issue for those with three drivers because you basically just split the race into thirds, and generally the driver that starts will do the opening stint. 
barrel through to about two hours, and then it'll be left to the last two drivers to go in. They may do something different with this car with the potential of putting Thomas in at the end of the day. But if you've only got two drivers in your car, you need to be a little bit more judicious about how you manage when your drivers are in the race car because a driver can only do three and a half hours of a six hour race. So it's not quite dividing it in two, but it's very close to it. And there are huge penalties for extending your driver time for going over the amount of time you could be in the car at any one go. And then there's an hour break between driving too. You've got to have that rest period. So it's very important to manage all that stuff. And some of the stuff we saw down there in pit lane, the little one percenters, so you can't leave until everyone's back inside the garage over that red line. That's why there was that agitation, that shouting. And nine times out of 10, Josh, the teams that win endurance races at Mount Panorama are the ones that don't have those dramas. Yeah, correct. And we often take for granted how polished professional teams are with that sort of stuff. You watch any endurance race, uh, 12 hour for example that we just had and you can see all the teams they chat very calmly over the radio all things are practiced drilled and it's all well and good and when it times comes time to actually execute usually it's it's done quite well whereas a lot of teams here this may be the first time they've ever done something like this as a collective unit yeah. they might all be experienced on their own but as a unit you know sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get the polish into driver changes and that's where you hear that agitation, yelling and get out the way, do this, do that. So massive, massive factor. And uh, sometimes you can't, well, you certainly can, can't uh, plan for pit stop errors. You don't put that into your strategy meetings. It's one thing I noticed last night here, we were here till early evening. There wasn't much pit stop practice like there was 12 months ago. And you're right, a lot of these teams don't do that. And you can rehearse this as much as you like. And, I used to call the term stage fright in the days because you can practice it with no cars around. But when you can do it in real time, you've got other cars in the pit lane, you've got the noise, you don't know what's been going on the racetrack there. Sometimes mistakes happen like that. You don't have much of a chance. The professional series would practice this daily at the workshop. Through the week, yeah. And twice a day at a race event to keep yeah. that sharpness. Exactly. And like I say, we take that for granted when we watch, uh, you know, more professional outfits do the job uh, you see some of the teams here who i mentioned on the grid this is their one race of the year mm -hmm. they work all year for this one race and fair enough to them uh, but they are the things that can bring you unstuck and uh, even though it's a very small issue i know we're going on about it quite a bit but stuff okay. like that five or ten seconds um yeah that can come back to bite you particularly if you lose a podium spot by maybe a second the maybe last two pit seconds. stop the yeah, last pit exactly. stop's where it counts exactly so all factors to consider the uh, strategists in the team will be pulling their hair out to try and recover that time and figure out how they can best utilize um, the car and fuel window and tires and, and driver combinations to bring the bring the odds back in their favor. That compulsory pit stop window opened at the 30 minute mark and will shut with 30 minutes to go here this afternoon at the high tech oils bath of six hour. We stay with Beric Linton. Running back in fourth position, 37 seconds behind our leader. The Juice out there in front in car 21. There's a 10 second margin back to Deep Pasquale and Tyler Everingham. Order unchanged at the top there with Tom Randall who pitted early in this race to work our way towards the end of the first hour of competition here. A very clean affair so far here at Mount Panorama. You're brave for saying that this uh, I, like, I like to tease and taunt maybe. <laughs> Here's the Sharon boys, Grant and Ian, in that red and yellow BMW M4. Winners of this race in 2018. It was a cracking race with a couple of Americans in Darren Jorgensen and Brent Strom, who came out in a BMW 1M and a Mercedes AMG A45, which was driven by Rob Woods, Marcel Zalura and Stephen Johnson. And this car was third with 12 minutes to go in the race and passed two cars and was able to grab a race win and the brothers succeeding at Mount Panorama, which was a huge thing for these Queenslanders who are so passionate about their racing. They've been involved a long, long time, going back to mini challenge days, the Carrera Cup for a while. Hugely experienced and since taking over in production car racing, they've been extremely successful. Let's go down to pit lane and say hello to Molly Taylor. Hello guys, Ben, Michael Cavage, we saw that Tom Randall was the first one to blink really of those front runners, so what's the strategy, what's the thinking behind that? Oh look, it, it helps us get a compulsory out of the way to start with. Um, the other side of that is we, we've, we've worked really hard to put this car on the grid, but we haven't had a lot of time to develop it, so we've been making changes on the run and with the limited track time, so a little bit of an adjustment at the same time and out he goes again. 
And uh, Michael, we see you got your helmet ready to go. It looked, looked like it was all on there for a second. So we're not going to see Tom do a, a double stint. It's likely you're going to be the next one in the car I'd, soon. I'd say so, yeah. That's that's the plan. Uh, obviously, keep Tom out until the next window or the next obviously stop, and then I'll jump in and then we'll go from there, and then probably Dan, and then myself, and then Tom to the end. All right, well, best of luck, guys. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you. So that backs up what we were talking about before, that they'll keep Tom Randall fresh for the final stint. The other thing stopping early does in this race is keep a safety car up your sleeve. And the reason that's important is because in this race, you can only complete one CPS per safety car. So if there's a long safety car, you can't just keep rolling in, ticket pit stop on yep. ticket. You can only do one. Another flags, we've got a car oh. stop. The C63 AMG has parked it. And as you were saying that, Krause, the car in second place of Anton Di Pasquale Pits. has just peeled into the lane. So Tony Levitt was behind the wheel of the C63, and that car was going along really well. They're inside the top 15. Big Merck sharing with Mark Griffith this weekend. Anthony Sewell getting into the car, and is that a safety car? Wow, they it couldn't is. have timed oh. that any better, could they? Well, I wonder if this counts as a safety car pit stop, though, because they were in when it was green. It was fine. That's interesting. In theory, they could now circulate, get behind the safety car okay, train, stop. do another stop and have two of their CPS stops out. Now, if this was a 12-hour race, it wouldn't be so important, but these cars don't have to do six pit stops in this race. They have to, they're mandatory. They need to tick six CPSs off if you're in the outright class, but they can go further on fuel. So it's not critical on fuel numbers that they uh, get pit stops out the way early. Just trying to have a look there. I wonder what's happened. I'm not sure if the right front is uh, buckled in. I can see it the driver. It's sad, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Like it looks like it's facing in. I can see the driver just uh, rearing his head every now and then, sitting against the Pertec wall. I wonder, and he's got out the passenger side. So I'm, I'm assuming I'm, I'm throw a guess out here, but contact maybe, driver's right. Yeah, possibly contact driver's right. You can just see he's getting attended to. So. Say so he's knocked the wind out of him a touch and he's gotten out the passenger door, which is actually a test you have to pass uh, getting out of the passenger door in under five seconds, uh, ironically. Yeah, not easy so, to do. You've got to climb across no, bars. Certainly not. That's unfortunate. I hope he's okay there. They were struggling with gearbox issues overnight in that C63. Rather complex gear, gearbox setup. This might tell us in the High Tech Oils replay. So, Tom, oh, it's got oh, some airtime as well. So, did it start on the opposite side or did yeah. it go in on the John Hanks with Vista side? It's gone in at the crate, I would assume. That's quite a significant impact. I mean, in any racing car up there, that's a big crash. And pit lane's about to get really busy because a lot of people are going to take advantage. In fact, Jade, no, Jade appeals off into pit lane, our race leader in car 21, the BMW. And I would expect that Everingham would follow and Berwick Linton as well. So based off what you just said as well, Rich, you should probably see the Anton Di Pasquale car uh, with Anthony Sewell at the wheel now come into the pits again, and now they're two stops up the road. Well, in theory, yes, but we need to just double-check whether they can actually do that, whether it counts. So this is another look. It has started on drivers right up yeah. there, and it, and it would have been at the metal grate, and it's come across the road and ended up down there at the John Hinksman Vista, which is that point of the racetrack just by McPhillamy Park. Stop Randall going through the shot there at the same time. So the first safety car comes out 40 minutes into the race. Hyundai safety car leading the field. Car you're quite familiar with, JB? Yep, my current road car is uh, that exact, well, not that exact one. I don't have lights. I was going to say, you can take the lights off yeah, your yeah, yeah. He wants them, though. <laughs> but uh, if any of you keen viewers are looking at home and are after an i30N sedan like that, take the number plate down, and that'll be at the dealer auction <laughs> soon enough, I'm sure. And you can say you got a piece of Bathurst six hour history. So, uh, yeah, fantastic cars. Uh, if you gave me five hours and 15 minutes remaining, I could probably talk about them the entire time. But uh, yeah, the team at Hyundai. Sponsoring the event with safety cars. They do, they love their motorsport. Clearly, they've decided to throw me in a car. And uh, yeah, great car. I can guarantee that's going to last the six yeah. hours out there. While you're giving Hyundai all these plugs out there, I'm going to make the cash register sound in the background. <laughs> Top 10 have come into the pits. Why aren't you out there? I mean, we love having you up here, but this is, this is such a Josh Bucken kind of race. 
I'd love to be out there, mate. Uh, nothing against you blokes, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 would, I would certainly love to be out there. If anyone's listening and one of their drivers is ill, I'm free. I do have my gear here. So. <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> like any good driver, you always bring your, uh, bring your race seat to the track. As so, you can see, Will Davison getting into the... Uh, I actually feel for the driver of the safety car because it's going to be a challenge to actually pick up the race leader here, which I think will be Ryland Gray in the 2214 Mustang because they've not stopped. But seven of the top ten cars have all peeled yeah. off into pit lane. And having taken that early stop, Jaden O'Jada in car 21, uh, actually, no, they peeled off too. So they've, they've just left the lane. So I'm looking to see where car 40 is. Remember, they stopped early. Here's Garth Lawton racing at work in the Ram Motorsport number 45 car. There was a driver trains going on at 23, which is the Berwick Linton car. So Berwick was jumping out, and I saw the familiar helmet of Will Davison sliding into that car. So he's going to get the job the second stint of the day, 44 minutes into this race. So this, sorry, this will mean that they can't do another stop under no, safety car today. So they're waiting for the safety car to go past these guys. Uh, there's a red and green light at the end of pit lane. They've now been given the wave out there onto the track, so they force another lap down. I mean, nothing more frustrating than having a wait at the end of pit lane. So these cars making their way up the mountain right now to catch the train of cars behind the Hyundai safety car. We're going to say a big shout out to all our crew here this weekend. There's over 280 officials helping out recover cars and man the grounds here at Mount Panorama. The Ford Recovery crew, of course, they'll be busy. This is always that great fear. We've had great momentum for the first 40 minutes, but we know that old cliche, safety cars often breed safety cars as we cycle our way through the first round of pit stops. There is the Ford Recovery truck on its way up. Six safety car interruptions in last year's race for a total of 13 laps. And that is the Ford Ranger Wild Track. V6. I reckon we could have It's got a, enough pace for it to be in the field. Well, I was just about to say that. I reckon it could be a class moving forward. Class T. They, the class truck. Truck. Yep. They are the, the biggest selling sector in the new car market these days. So that would reflect the current automotive trends, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, new engine in the Ranger 2, 3 litre V6. Recently won the Wheels Good Car motor. of the Year Award, I think the Ford Ranger. Did it? Did it not? There yeah. you go. Always uh, either one or two in the top sellers for every month and every year in Australia. We'll have our dual cabs, don't we? More and more now. This is going to be a challenge for race control to pick up the race leader here. So there's going to be some smoke pouring off laptops down in the timing. Stubbsy? Anton Di Pasquale alongside me. He's just had the first stint in the car. How was it out there? Uh, yeah, it was good. Um, just getting in the groove of things. Car feels all right. Um, we're in a good position for the six hours. Yeah, it's it's all good. Ants in the car now, so we'll see how he goes. Um, first safety car, it's all getting pretty hectic. What was the feedback to him in terms of the car and the pressures? I heard a little bit of discussion there when you hopped out. Um, yeah, there's so much. This I'm very limited in what you can do because you're not changing tyres and stuff. So um, yeah, just give a bit of feedback what I felt. We'll try and tune it up as we go throughout the day. But um, there's not how a lot you can do. There's not much. Uh, the flexibility of that stuff. So the, uh, the car feels good. Um, Jaden was pretty quick out in front. He was pushing pretty hard. So we'll uh, we'll see how it goes at the end of the day. All right, all the best, mate. Yeah, cheers. Thanks. And just on that note, guys, I mentioned to one of the team members, uh, are you going to take a second stop here and get one of those CPSs away with this safety car? And the eyes lit up and they had a few discussions, but they've decided that they'd better play it safe because they weren't totally sure whether they got in under green flag racing or not. So they're going to play it safe. Long race to go. Yeah, thanks, Stubbsy. That's well spotted. And I think it is worth being cautious with that early in the race. And you don't want to run afoul of Motorsport Australia race control because you, you don't just get wrapped over the knuckles on that. It's a bit more. So they are, take the conservative approach. But the one car that has got two stops out of the way is the 92 BMW. So remember, they stopped 32 minutes into the race and they've ticked another one off by the looks of it. So they will have one pit stop to the better of everybody else. And it might not look good now because they're buried down in what at the moment is 32nd position, but track position later in the day, it could come Massive. back to them. So and it's also determines too when that yellow comes out, if the car's already in that lane, would it start before the line? Well, it'd be at the timing line, which is yeah, the entry to exactly. pit lane. Yeah. So the joys of endurance racing and working out strategy and how it all plays out. We love it. That's it's why such you're a, here. <laughs> it's such a big factor of this race and that's why we love it so much as we build towards 
the end of hour one of six of the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. We are under the first safety car of the day and the field slowly being regrouped and the order settled. Some drivers have stopped, some have not. And there's plenty to play out in this one. And this is going to really jumble the order. Some of the fast cars are going to be buried in the field, having elected to take an early pit stop 14 laps into this race. Six compulsory pit stops, Matt, for the Class X cars. Four compulsory pit stops for A1, A2 and B1. Everyone else in the field has only three compulsory pit stops. So if you're Jake Camilleri and Scott Nicholas in the Class C leading Mazda 3 MPS, you do this race on three stops. And even then, that car could probably do it on two. I heard Anton Di Pasquale hinting at the fact they're not going to change tyres during the course of the race here today, the MRF control tyre, which they're allowed up to six sets of new tyres. You couldn't bring any old tyres to the event this weekend, but certainly no issues with the durability of the tyre. No, that would probably uh, lean to the theory that we sort of came up with that Anton wasn't pushing the limits of that uh, that tyre too much because evidently now there's a safety car and things are brought back together. So smart driving. That's an interesting call though to make and, and maybe it's a furphy for everyone else into pit lane to go, oh, we won't either. Yeah. But I, I still hearken back to last year's race where it's a Bathurst Enduro. Traditionally, it's going to come down to an arm wrestle in the final hour. At some point, it will be worth putting tyres, even right side tyres on the working side of the car that cops all the stress. Now, the MRF tyre can do the full race, sure, without doing it, but there's still going to be a difference between a new tyre and an old. And if it comes down to a shootout at the end, I want to be on a new tyre. No, you certainly want to be on a better tyre. Any, uh, any advantage you can get with tyres, you'll certainly take. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what the teams decide to do with that, whether they run the gauntlet and try and make yeah. all four last to the end, which is impressive that a tyre can do that, to be honest. Just to explain, we talk about the working side of the car there. Here, it's the right-hand side. Uh, where do you determine that and how much load does the car get on the right side here? Uh, phenomenal amounts, particularly at uh, Middle Grape and at the Dipper. Mainly not so much the speed at the Dipper, but the compression yeah. in the tyre and the sidewall. That creates so much load through the tyre itself. Ah, there you can see right-hand side is uh, a little bit busted up on that AMG. But, uh, yeah, the tyres cop an absolute beating uh, around this track over a distance. The surface, however, at Bathurst, the actual tarmac itself, is a very, very smooth surface and it actually doesn't really lean too much to tyre wear. So you don't actually wear through your tyres a huge amount at Bathurst. I remember a number of years ago when the surface got redone, you'd finish your race meeting and the tyre would look like it was better than when it <laughs> went on the car. So uh, which The release mould was still on there. Yeah, it looked like it. So uh, does play a role. Molly? Tony Quinn, you've been you've been busy. You're, you're on the tools as well. You've been driving the GT4 and getting ready for your stint. What's what's this all about? You're getting ready for some fuel stops too. Well, I don't really know what it's about. I think it's for opening the fuel drum, but I don't know. <laughs> and, or it's a medical tool. <laughs> Maybe it could be both. Speaking of, uh, I mean, your weekend so far is great. Great run out in the GT4. Must feel good to be back. How's the the body uh, holding up? The body's fine, honestly. I'm. Uh, if it's not feeling fine, I'm coming in. I'm not doing it. But it feels fine. Um, the Mustang's got a clutch, which I don't really like because my left foot's a bit numb. But, um, no, I'll just do my best if I have to. Um, I'm happy not to. But if I have to, I will. And I don't want to let the young fellas down. So, But he, he's, he's chomping at the bit to get in. I've had to rein him back and say, just wait, just wait. Your time will come. So is that the plan, Ryder? You're going to finish up? I mean, so far, so good. Are we also going to see, we've been talking about the strategy of the Mustang and, and maybe that's where you guys can really give a, the BMWs a run for the money. So, so far, it's looking good and, and you're all set to do the last stint, right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, in terms of the beamers and stuff like that, they got different um, number of pit stops and whatnot. So, I mean, all we can really focus on is uh, in our class and then, well, who knows, maybe go for outright. But um, no, look, it's, it's good. <laughs> and at the start of the weekend, we had an interview and Popeye was like, oh, about results, oh, whatever. And then goes out and polls it, wins it, and then second and wins it, whatever. So look, come on, we're, we're here to win. He was, he was sandbagging that interview, I reckon. To totally sandbagging, but best like grad student, awesome job. Has there been any feedback from him? Is he a bit warmer now that he's got two doors on after we saw one fly off yesterday? <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, he's, he's more comfortable. <laughs> but I think everybody's having the same problem. The rear tires are going up in pressure and we're just going to drive around it until we can adjust it. But I think the other guys came in and, and addressed it. So um, we'll see the luck of the devil, eh? Oh, who knows? And is that just a temperature thing? We're getting a bit warmer temperatures sooner than we thought? Yeah, not too sure. I mean, in quality, when I qualified yesterday, we sort of had the same issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, now it's all started, right? Like everyone's sort of out of position. Some people stopped and, and bled their pressures. We didn't, so we're still out there. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it all starts now. Oh, have a good one. Best of luck. Thanks, guys. Thank you. The local Legends car running back in second position. And Tony Quinn did such a great job, didn't he, boys, in GT4 this weekend. As he got back on the horse after that big crash at Townsville last year. Great to see him back behind the wheel. Yeah, he was in a really bad yeah. way after the cr crash in the Carrera Cup car up there at the, the straight circuit. And it's cool to see him back. So just a little bit of Bathurst six-hour genealogy for you. Tony Quinn is the grandfather. Clark Quinn, his son is Ryder Quinn's dad. Now, Clark's not driving, but he is here watching on, which is cool. But um, I'd love to see the three of them in the car at some point. That would be a cool family very moment. Cool. But Ryder's a super young driver. He's been very impressive. He uh, is racing Carrera Cup this year in a local Legends Porsche, but spent summer in New Zealand running in what is now Toyota Formula Regional Oceana Championship, Formula Toyota, Toyota Racing Series as we know it. Did a nice job over there against some really talented young open wheel stars. And he's a bit of a star of the future, and he's got a big personality too which we love so the Quinn name in motorsport in this part of the world is hugely significant and it continues on behind the wheel as well. Who knows three Quinns will bring a win right? Oh, so oh, oh, stop it. Go. I'm a commentator already. Not even one o'clock and he's cracking <laughs> gags. When they lead the race and we understand the lights on the Hyundai safety car will be going out so there are a lot of cars well out of position here, not just in terms of lapped vehicles, and there's no wave by in this race. It is a pure motor race in that respect that you don't get that free kick to go past the safety car. So the lights will go out down at, it's 19.2, I think, is the official point, which is just before they get to the chase. Then all the weaving has to stop. Or Kenny, Kenny Habul's house, we call no, it. At, a Kenny's, at yeah. Kenny's place, correct. Kenny's is that though, Jay, the nine cars deep? Are we about to see that? Is that? Uh, yes. He, nine cars, third on the road. Yep. Nine cars back in that BMW with the bright livery. So they're to pick it away. So the lap cars is for that charter. Leaving the lane. B1 contender and pole sitter, but that's a late pit stop. He's a long way behind the field, and even though it still stretches up to the elbow as we speak, he's going to have a big job catching this as they go back to green. Mini and the Mustang uh, off one and two, harping back to the uh, 60s of touring car racing. Yeah. <laughs> well, and if I'm Ryland Gray, as soon as I see a green now, you go, because the local Legends car cannot go past that Mini until it gets to the control ah, line. Exactly. Oh, very good. So very free good. kick here for car 221, that Mustang can blaze away now and just get a little bit of a margin and now the Mustang can go past. Grant Denya will do his job. So the one to watch will be Jaden Ojeda who's further back in the field. He's the first of the Class X cars, the outright contending cars in the leaderboard but it's a mixed up, muddled up world we're living in because all of the key contenders from early in this race are buried in the field, having elected to take a, a safety car compulsory pit stop. One and a half seconds already at the line. That will advantage. He worked so hard to get that in a class battle. So that's a free kick for him as he leads us up the mountain with Denya running second. First car to pit is running third. Jaden Ojeda behind the wheel. He'll hand the keys over. We'll start a button later today to Simon Hodges in the 21. John Bow runs back in fourth, but yet to pit. So they've kept Ojeda in the 21 car, which is interesting, but they've only got two drivers in that car. So they have to be much more diligent about how they split their driver time up. Anthony Sewell's behind the wheel of car four. That's the car that Anton Di Pasquale started the race on. We heard from Anton during that safety car. 43 leaves pit lane. Steve McHugh, Daniel Natoli and Amar Sharma in that car. So it's been pushed back out into the apron as the field make their way up to the worth cutting this restart lap. About to tick over the first hour of competition here today at the high-tech oils bath, a six-hour. We had some incredibly wet conditions here during practice on Friday. There was limited track running, wasn't there, guys? And yesterday's shorter session was the most amount of laps they had before qualifying. That's his peak hour already. 
I don't even know where to chime in. There's so much going on at the moment after this safety car restart. Cars out of position, cars trying to tussle and get their way back through to where they think they should be. This is a very agitated time of the race after a safety car restart like this. You've got cars trying to find their way back into some clear air. So uh, oftentimes you can find yourself unstuck in scenarios like this and you have to be very careful making sure you that you just make sure you get through cars so you can fight them. But easy to get frustrated too, isn't it? Because oh. you know there's slower cars around you. You've got faster cars that are getting these massive advantages on a restart. Yeah, and then you'll see a car in front of you, get a good run through the traffic, and you'll get a rubbish run, and, ah, oh, why is he better than me? And yeah, it can really get to you as a driver, so you have to be very, very in touch with uh, just cooling the jets off with your emotions in a race like this. Sound like the road trip back home with you last night from here. <laughs> cool the emotions. Why is he better than me? <laughs> Was he talking about Tony D'Alberto or...? Oh, nice. oh, right, OK. <laughs> Jade No Jade has just passed John Bow. That's one for his little record books. And now he works his way past the 171 BMW that is further down the field. That's the Paul Pacini, Michael Von Rappard and Brock Payne entry. Class uh, A1 contender. So Ojeda now will go out after Grant Denya. And the field will start to slowly cleanse itself, but there's still a lot of cars really out of position. Michael Alt's behind the wheel of the 24 Garth Walton Racing BMW M3. That's the car that finished runner-up here last year that Tyler Everingham started. So he's sixth. Drew Russell behind the wheel of the Go-Karts Go-Car that started on the front row, that Wayne started the race. He's just cracked the top ten, and he's ninth. Of a car going back into the garage. So they might be, be able to get this car back out later today. So that's great for the recovery crew to get that back in the garage. At least get it back onto the circuit. Although that little bits and pieces we yeah, saw on the grass might have been a bit sinister. We saw a rear arm, didn't we? Or a, a, an arm of some description uh, on, the, on the ground. So don't know if it's let go before or after contact. It's, it's hard to tell, but hopefully they can get that patched up and, uh, and out. And hopefully the driver is okay as well. This is just a dream at the front for these front three uh, three guys at the moment. Just being able to run their own show for a good few laps. This is where a massive gap can start to open up between different cars. You've got Will Davison and uh, Drew Russell back in ninth and 10th in traffic while these guys are out on their own in clear air. Car triple nine in the pits. The all-girl combination. Carly Puccini started this car today. Looks like Alexandra Best is going to jump in now for this stint. Courtney Prince qualified that car yesterday and did an awesome job oh, too great yeah, fantastic very very job. rapid racing in career cup this year is courtney having graduated from sprint challenge and this is just another opportunity to get back as laps not a cup car it doesn't matter it's all valuable seat time at mount panorama for when she does racing in career cup in october this year she's been doing very well in uh, porsches over yeah. the last 18 months uh going back to sprint challenge last year basically was uh you know, there or thereabouts next to Tom Sargent, winner of this race last year, and Ryan Wood now in Super 2. One of the toughest fields of Sprint Challenge, I reckon Not, No shame in running third yeah. to those two <laughs> gents. They are super, super fast uh, drivers, so for her to be right up amongst them is a fantastic job, so clearly a talent. They're in Class B1, so that race within a race will keep you up to speed with all those, and you can see the little colours on the timing totem left of screen. That indicates where your class drivers is. I tell you what, just over an hour into the race, I did not expect two Ford Mustangs to be leading this one. I expected BMWs to be gallivanting off into the distance, but at the same time, those that safety car and that rush of pit stops has changed the game a little bit here at Mount Panorama. So we're now into the second hour of the High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour, live on Stan Sport at Break Free, all the way through to the chequered flag and beyond. And thanks to Super Cheap Auto, we're going to take a look at the race highlights for hour one. Had an aborted start. The second time was the charm, and BMW's led us away. The field of 59 here at Bathurst today, even as our pole sitter, headed by Berwick Linton, that took us through turn number one. As everybody played so nicely through Hell Corner, and we were lucky to get a fairly clean affair for at least the first 40 minutes of racing, but it didn't take long for the battles up front to begin. Certainly didn't, and uh, was quite uh, quite frantic at the start. As you can see, Pasquale making a move very early on in the piece to get to the lead, hurry away, 
closely followed by Jade No Jada, and it wouldn't be long before a Jada took the lead of the race and sailed off into the distance. It's Tyler Everingham making his moves early. This was Ojada on Berwick Linton who started the pole sitting number 23 BMW and the juice out of Sydney is absolutely flying in these early stages and this was the pass for the race lead. So within the first couple of racing laps, we'd had three different leaders of the race. We're up to four now in the first hour. This was a wild moment. Jude Barguana around the outside at McPhillamy Park trying to gobble up some slower cars, but uh, gobbled a little bit too hard there. And this was a moment for one of our Class B2 contending Holden SSV Commodore, the mighty red line, Gas tipped around up. at DBA Chase. And this, Matt Nolte, was a huge moment at the top four the number 14 Mercedes. Yeah, saw that go back on the tilt tray into the pits. The team working on that car right now. So that's how it looks one hour into this race. So we take a look at the top 10 on your high tech horse leaderboard. At the moment, these two guys at the top yet to pit. But our class leaders on the screen as well there too. Third place, Jaden Ojeda is the first car to have pitted on the screen. Nice to bow and McGill also in that mix as well. So a lot to play as we cleanse the field through in the opening stages of the high-tech oils back for six out. The view from the ridges looking at the famous mountain, and here's your leaderboard. Yeah, so Bowen McGill on top in A1 in the supercharged Ford Falcon, the normally aspirated Mustang, car 221 leading the way, and also leading the race outright. Turner Cox and former winner Rubus leading B1. That car started last after being disqualified from qualifying, so they're going well. In B2, it's the SSV Commodore, car number 73. And it's a great field with the class leaders in C, D and E as well, all fighting out through this year's field. So Ryland Gray, at 16 years of age, leads in the Century 21 Ford Mustang. Grant Denyer is second. They're first and second in the A2 class. Jaden Ojeda runs third. And there's two cars off at He's turn beached. one. It's always the simplest corners on the racetrack, isn't it? He is beached as. I was just about to mention, Ryland Gray is dropping both Denya and Jaden Ojeda. So Jaden actually losing a bit of time now uh, relative to what he had before. Ryland Gray doing an, an amazing job streaking off into the distance. So about the six hour, here we are. It's the Wilkinson O'Brien car that's stuck in the gravel. So more happening. This is at the top and whoa, oh. moment here for TD. Is that TD uh, driving? West behind the wheel now. And oh, oh my goodness, a really tricky part of the circuit in the field. How did they miss that? It's such a narrow part of Mount Panorama. And completely blind Ooh. at that point too, as you're coming out of the dipper. That was huge. And this is the reason why we're going to be under safety oh, car for the oh, second time. Massive. Big crunch with the Evo going down the inside. They, these cars are in the same class. So that was four position. That's a decent get square, isn't it? Adrian Morale behind the wheel of car nine. So two cars coming together. Morale That's drives away. Strange for Hadrian. He's hugely experienced in these races. I think what, what's happened is they've gone three wide. Ah, oh, front of that's busted too. Clearly, that's it was a long lap. six foot in the air, wasn't it? Would but it be better to pull in here and go back into the garage that way? Are you allowed to do that? Well, it's been blocked by the kind of safety yeah, car at that's the moment. That's why he's parked oh, there, I'd yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. I got my mate in the Hyundai uh, stopping anything like that. But I'd say what's happened, they've gone in three wide and the, the car on the inside is only looking at the car that's on his right-hand side, couldn't actually see the car far right on the traditional racing line, and it's pretty easy done. Oh, that's massive. Look at the crab walking. That is, that's it's a long a, lap. That's a huge hit, isn't it? Yeah, good and that luck. could cause more damage. Yeah. So two leaders in the lane, Ryland Gray and Grant Denyer in the Mustangs pit. Jade Nojada stays out. Interesting. But I think everyone else should pit now and get another compulsory pit stop out of their way, especially if you're in Class X. Remember, you've got six compulsory stops to make in the race today. Ten so years unbuckling there. Saul in the pit lane as well in car number four. This is he. I noticed they've got the window down, windows down slightly on that car, so obviously they're not going to be running air con. Uh, it'll get very, very hot and humid in the cabin. Having the windows just cracked like that makes a big difference. There's the dry brake fueling system that they can use to refill the cars, makes it much faster and more efficient than your traditional hand pump. Michael Ald in the pit lane in the Class X number 24 BMW. The Falcon that was leading its class in as well. So John Bow will jump out of that car and Aaron McGill will jump in. And it's a busy, busy pit lane. The Russells in the lane as well. And very, very sensible to tick another stop off. I'm interested to see if the 23 car rolls down, whether they pit 
Will Davison. Looks like Drew Russell in that go kart go car now, which makes sense because he was starting to light up the timing screens just before we went under safety car just then. But going back to your point about pitting under safety car, do you want to use it this early in the race? Do you want to save it maybe? Because there's going to be more today. Yeah, there will, but I, I think but you never know at Mount Panorama, do you? So you, you oh, take it when take you can them, get yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you've got the opportunity to get what is essentially a free pit stop yeah. under yellow, you're going to take that. Surprising the, the lead, number 21, Jade No Jada. they surprised they didn't pit. Meantime, Morales still crabbing his way across the mountain here, trying to get back at pace. Oh, it's such a long lap. It's the trickier part's coming now, through Skyline, through the dipper. I don't think he's going to take the racing line no. in this instance. I think uh, our favourite former gravel trap will be used, yeah, straight through. Oh, no. Oh, no. Fair play. Of course, that runoff area put in several years ago it used to be a gravel trap there, and I guess it now opens up a bit more commitment to that corner. You know, if you make a mistake, you can go down there, but man, you carry speed into I the dipper. I thought it was scary enough when it was. Well, now that it is what it is, I never drove it when it was gravel, but that would have been, uh, yeah, really separated the uh, brave from the fearless. He's doing a good job here to get this car back while the safety car is catching the leader at the moment. Should put Jade No Jada back into the lead. It does. Brings Will Davison up into second. He is. And what the crew would be looking at this entire inlap is parts back in the trailer to try and patch that thing up and get it back out. So don't think that they'd just all be waiting in the garage to look at the car and, oh, no, I wonder what's gone on. You've got a pretty good idea of what's yeah. busted underneath that car. I guarantee members out the back would be there now, scraping parts, getting tools ready, clearing a space so that the car can drive straight into the garage and get to work so they can get back out. And if you've got an Evo 10 in the car park, now might be the time <laughs> hide to it. either hide it or, alternatively, offer, it, offer it up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I counted nine donor cars in the paddock, but I think there's more than that. Already, wow. like, pre-prepared, ready to go, in fact... Garth Warden Racing had an entire one M, uh, M2, sorry, parked out the back that had already been pre-crushed. Yes, I have seen that. Just to pull yep. other bits and pieces off in case they need it for the cabbage it's car. It's the beauty about this class, isn't it, is that 95% of components on the car are exactly as you see in your road car. Let's go to the lane. Here's Chris Stubbs. Well, Richard, one great thing that we're doing this year, an initiative where thanks to our friends at Shannon's, is the Shannon Speed Series Volunteer of the Week. And here at Mount Panorama for the High Tech Oil Bathurst Six Hour, it's Tracy King. Tracy, congratulations. You are our Volunteer of the Week. What does that mean to you? Oh, it's great. We all do this because we love it, and I'd like to think it'll take it on behalf of everybody that's out there this weekend. We've got more than 300 officials taking part in the event this weekend. Our thanks to them all. But for Shannon's to pick you, you're cool, calm and collected. Tell us about the role. You're on Mountain Straight Gate, is that correct? Yes, I'm on Mountain Straight Gate. I've got to collect the cars um, when they're coming off the circuit. And it's not always easy to get them. We couldn't do it without you and the rest of the team, Tracy. Congratulations and thanks to Shannon. Thank you. Thanks to Shannon. Yeah, they do a mega job, don't they, Stubbs? He is the nine, makes its way back into the pit. So, Hadrian Morrell. And Tyler Mecklem teaming up here this year at Mount Panorama. Make the car back into, or make the lane, I should say. I retrieve the other car out of the gravel trap down at turn number one. Four hours and 46 remaining in the high-tech oils bath. A six-hour second safety car period of the day. As more cars make their way into the pits. Hodges now behind the wheel of car 21. He's Ben Wilkinson, who was the recipient of being deposited into that sand trap. So he's been recovered nicely. So this shouldn't be a particularly long safety car now that that's all cleaned up. They'll get the field up. More cars pulling into pit lane. The Russell's back in the lane, interestingly. Now, you can only do the one compulsory pit stop under safety car, but... Interesting. Yeah, I wonder if you can... Interesting. You should be able to top off, though, if you want to put more fuel in the car, but we'll... We'll follow that up for you because that is... I wonder if it's having... Even if... It, would this be a good opportunity to... Yeah, you might lose 10 or 15 spots, but in a car such as that where you can make 10 or 15 in a lap or two, mm. would it be worth doing a bit of tyre pressure? Molly? Well, I'm with Grant and Harrison Inwood. We're looking on as the Russell's coming to pit, but you guys are driving the Subaru WRX STI, sponsored by A1 Towing, so a car that's close to my heart as well. Uh, but 
we're here to present you the best presented of the B1 Plus. So uh, to recognize that, our good friends at Super Stew Auto have given you a $500 gift voucher to use as you please to, to make it super. Um, congratulations for that. But talking about the race, how's it going so far? Yeah, it's going pretty good. Um, we had a very busy Friday night uh, doing a motor and getting it in there early Saturday morning. Uh, so, yeah, it's good to be able to circulate, do laps and yeah, bring on the six hours. It's incredible effort from your team to rebuild that engine overnight, keep you guys going back out there. So it's just, that really says a lot to the spirit of what this event is all about. Without our, without our team, uh, the guys that come together, we're a new team, it's all new to us. That's just fantastic. And most of them are staying at home, they're from Sydney. Uh, it's just great for them to get together and this is going to help and uh, hopefully we're there at the end of the day today. Well, well, here's the actual voucher itself. Very well deserved and um, good luck for the rest of the race. Well deserved too. That car looks awesome and if there was a spirit of the event award they'd probably get that too <laughs> because they took that car out of the circuit to the local workshop on Friday night. The spare engine needed to be rebuilt so they rebuilt the spare dropped it in the car and they were back here by seven o'clock on Saturday morning and got the car into the show. But it's a terrific livery. There's a lot of Ken Block about the livery of that, which is Massive. really appropriate given that we lost the great man who was famous for hustling Subarus around Jim Carnerfields for a long time. So well done to the Inwoods, a great Bathurst family, and they've done a great job. Uh, Tim Colin Brita is behind the wheel of that car at the moment, their third driver. But uh, thanks to Super Cheap Auto for tipping into the best presented team award and we'll run through all of the classes the a1 uh, sorry the class x went the way of the cabbage bmw which is extremely well presented as well in fact their engine builder was actually celebrating good friday and was pulled away to go back and help build that engine so big tip of the hat to you sir for getting this car on the track there one of the many stories that are created here over the weekend at the High Tech Oils about the six hours. Did you notice that it was Molly doing the Subaru? Oh, yeah. Oh, there? yeah. I was, I was going to... You mentioned the engine. Yeah. <laughs> and super cheap, of course. She's the star of their unbelievable ad that they rolled out earlier this year. Although I noticed she didn't get to do any skids. Just acted. New career. Oh, well, look. Mm. If, if the whole champion. driving thing never doesn't well, work out, you never know. Thank you to super cheap. Happy sponsors. Speaking of, Molly. Well, thank you for uh, recognising my acting skills. I think I've got a bit of work to do, but I found someone who might be able to give me a few tips on, on how to act. <laughs> Grant, Daniel. Uh, you just come in after, I mean, a, a mech stint, firstly, uh, from that you out there. Um, I'm not sure what you're in now, but it was right up the front. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, not about acting, but dancing, I can do. I can do dancing. I can give you those skills. You're going to need, like, a lot of time for that. <laughs> Oh, that was so much fun. Um, having Ambrose on your tail there for a good half an hour was actually all my boyhood dreams came true. You know, I just remember those years of him coming together uh, with Murphy at the top and then having that fisty cuff. I was like, oh, my God, it's Ambrose, and this is where the punch-up happens. And <laughs> going into the cutting, it was cool. And what are these Mustangs? They look like fun to drive, are they? Yeah, they're big girls, but they're, they're really, really good fun. They, they move around a lot. You've got to sort of look after the rears a little bit. That's what he was doing. He was, he was pressuring me, and I was holding him at bay until I... I was starting to slide the car a little bit too much and over-temping the rears. But, you know, it's a strategy game to play. And, you know, just being here with Quinny, like Quinny could have anyone in this team. He could have Wing Cup, he could have Van Gisbergen, but he invites me to come along and that's not lost on me. So it's a bit special. Well, all the best for the rest of the race. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, mate. He lives and breathes this place, doesn't he, Grant? Oh, Daniel lives just behind the Forest Elbow here. And he's telling me a story on Friday that he loves this track so much so we've got a challenge for the lead here going up towards Griffins. And nicely done up there. Will Davison behind the wheel takes the lead of the race here with four hours and 41 minutes to go. Just tell me he still takes the kids to school via a lap of the track. Does he? Yes. Doesn't get sick of it. He's nope. certainly a male who has figured out how to unlock the hips, so to say, hasn't he? He's, uh, is he a two-time winner now of Dancing with the Stars? Yeah, I think so. Is he? Yeah, yep. God, but then, uh, what very, a weapon. Very good. Unlock the hips. We need to get him on stand at some point, I think. Uh, he's a great character and he's a very, very good racing car driver Absolutely. too. And for a yeah, time, super underrated. He won't tell you that either. For a time, no, correct. For a time, there couldn't have raced supercars, and that option was presented to him to commit fully to a full-time driving career. But ultimately, paying the bills came first and, and went down the, the TV celebrity route, and it's paid off, of course. And now he gets to do this for fun, and we jump on board the local legends car. So there was a change for the lead. So Will Davison got up the inside of Simon Hodges 
who's taken over the 21 BMW from Jaden Ojeda. You think that's rider behind the wheel? Rider Quinn of the local Based Legends car? his mm. uh, enthusiasm, I would suggest. <laughs> Carving them up. Carving them up, the yeah. Made a pass before Metal Great. Gets another one done here on the drop through Skyline. Oh, nice and casual one-handed through. The S is down to the dipper. There was some good social media commentary earlier today. Uh, hashtag Speed Series AU. We'd love you to join the conversation. Uh, someone did post a screenshot of the inside of this car. What's that strange white stick in the middle? Uh, and the response was, I think it's an anti-theft device for millennials. But <laughs> that is a manual gearbox, folks, at Mount Panorama. They do survive. They do exist. <laughs> There's Biff. These Mustangs really haul the mail. Just want to put a little full stop on another story that we touched on, and that was about the Russells. We saw them come into pit lane twice. Now, it's been pointed out to me by a friend of the show, Brian Vanderwacker, who's an absolute guru race strategist, that the Russell boys' first stop under that safety car was 1 minute 29.6. So... 0.4 seconds beneath the oh, mandatory pit stop time. No. So the reason they came back into the lane was to serve the mandatory oh. pit stop. So they've just blown a minute Brutal. and a half and then another one to finally tick that box. Fortunately, it was under safety car, but it absolutely kills them in terms of track position. Fortunately, the car is quick and Drew Russell will carve some people up working his way through the field. But That's that is our understanding of why they went into pit lane twice under that safety car. Just how often do we hear those stories? It's never by a big margin. It's always by no, half, no. A, well, half a second. Well, why would it be by a big margin? Oh, man. <laughs> you so just can't do that. They've used up now their safety car pit stop. Well, you can have a discretionary stop. You're allowed a discretionary stop that doesn't count towards your CPS, but... Uh, how do you judge that? Well... Basically, if you don't do it, you have to do it again. It's as simple as that. So it just doesn't count towards your number. So they've now done two stops, but they've wasted another one, basically. So they've still got four to go. Stubbsy? Speaking of, just chatting with Aaron Russell at the moment. Aaron, Brian Vanderwacker, who's watching and tuning in, reckons that you guys were just short of your compulsory pit stop time. Can you fill us in? Is that the fact? Look, we're not actually sure, like... We were close, so we just thought we'd come in and do another one just to bank some stops. So we're not sure. We're just playing the safe game right now and just making sure we're still in it and um, not going to get any penalties or anything like that just in case we were. So, yeah, just played it safe, come in again, did another one and, and go from there. So I guess the only penalty really is track position, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we'd already sacrificed it doing that stop. So another one, hopefully it doesn't hurt us too much. The car in general? It's good. It's good. Uh, Drew's in it. He's having a crack, and we'll see where we end up in the next hour or so. Good job. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Now, on this note, we know, guys, you know as well as anyone, that motorsport is a very political sort of environment. We don't often have politicians, though, taking part. A Grice here, obviously. Alan Grice was one. Uh, Senator Ross Cadell. I don't know what they call you, Honourable Sir. Ross Roscoe. God. <laughs> Roscoe works. There you go. Uh, how did you come to be part of this and what's your role with the team? I uh, love motorsport. Been around it for a long time. Sun races carts. No Drew Aaron and Wayne from Newcastle, my hometown, uh, grew up in Sistock. Chance to come here, had to be here, be part of a team, really good thing. Motorsport's a big industry, we have to support it. Federal Parliament, Nationals member, there's been a lot of talk about tax cuts at the moment for the middle income owners. Can you do something for us here in motorsport? <laughs> love to do some more more in motorsport, love to do more mum and dads are getting it tough, but you know, this is a lot of people coming here, having a good time, a lot of money goes in, I think it's a $9 billion industry. So if the economy suffers, motorsport suffers, we have to do more. Roscoe, well said. Best politician in the land in last night of sport. Can he raise the speed limit by 20, 30, 40s, 80 k's an hour maybe while he's at it? Oh, Get some real work done. That's a great story. Well done, Stubbsy. Well spotted. And not the first time I've had politicians up here working on crews. Remember, John Hewson was part of a team many years ago at the 1000. It's... Russell picks off another one. He was up to 28th, and that'll now put him up into 26th position. I tell you what, though, if you've got the Russells on your side in Newcastle, you get half the town because yes, half the town know the Russells. So they are the ambassadors for Newcastle and have been so for a long, long time since Wayne was a, a touring car privateer. was so proud of being an overcastrian. It's a great city, too. Wayne, a very handy commentator as well, one of the most excitable guys you'll ever get <laughs> on a microphone. He called the great race here for the track for many, many years back in the 90s. Well, Molly and I talked to him this morning doing some Facebook Live for the Speed Series social media channels, and I asked him about what's it like racing with your boys. 
was very emotional. He teared up straight yeah, really. away. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. It's hugely special for these guys. Great, great team, though. And he, he operates, does a, does a very, very good job himself. So, uh, can't look past that. Molly? Amar Sharma, you're driving the number 43, Holden Astra. But in the pits, looks like it's game over. What's happened out there? Um, I don't know. We had a, a vibration come on um, on the straights and a bit of clunking through the dipper. So I didn't really want to be a whinging race car driver and complain. So I waited until I could barely see down the straight and the vibration was that bad and I thought we had to come in. So it looks like it could be a dip or a gearbox. And so that's something that you, you're not going to be able to change or anything like that? that that's game over? Yeah, well, these things, um, the gearboxes do go sometimes. So um, I'm not sure if we have a spare one or not, but it's a pretty good. If they can fix it, they will, and we'll get back out. But if not, then, you know, we tried. And when it was was going well, what, what's it like driving this car around the mountain? Oh, it's pretty cool. I mean, a HSV around the mountain's always good. But um, competing with the other Astras that have been here year on, year on out, but it's a brand new car, so a new build. So it's never run before, so we weren't really expecting to be there. But we were pretty quick up, the, up across the top. Um, but, yeah, we're just a bit lacking in the straight line. Well, thanks, Amar. Hope you get it sorted. Thanks. Cheers. I think that was Steve McHugh and Daniel Natoli, the Astra back in the pits, a new combination for this year's High Tech Oils Bath the six hours, so a bit of work to do for those guys. As we work our way through another lap here of the race. Time's flying while you're having fun, Josh Bucken. We're looking at a mixture of Class X cars here. Yeah, and we've got uh, one of the cars that had to start right at the back with... Kyle Begg and Dave Russell. Looks like they're starting to make some ground into the race. They've got the Anthony Sulek 4 behind them. Robert Gawley behind the wheel of the 40 now as well. They pitted oh, early, yeah. like literally when the window opened earlier, after starting in 58th position. Yeah, a couple of cars to pass, but don't count them out because as we know, our winner from last year started from the rear. However, this is not how you set a race win up by being parked halfway up Mountain Straight. That's not ideal. 171. Paul Pacini behind the wheel. Now, race control will give cars that are just stopped and parked every opportunity to self-recover. Yeah. If Certainly if there's been no contact, and that's what's been allowed to happen here. Because quite often with these cars, it is quite honestly, have you tried turning it on and yeah, off again? control on delete goes a long way in a production car, particularly the BMWs. So could have been a classic case just then the way it took off. Yeah, yeah, it, it seems like a weird one. Maybe there was something that wasn't flicked after a stop, come out of uh, pit lane and park it and try again. So did well to get it out of harm's way and not cost any time. Molly Taylor. Just an update on Tony Levitt, the C63 AMG that we saw have a, a big one earlier on. Uh, Tony is okay, but he has been taken to hospital for just for some precautionary checks. So wishing him um, all the best uh, and hopefully he, he's, uh, yeah, out of there quickly. Thanks, Molly. Down in the pits. Let's go back to our race leader, Will Davison, behind the wheel of the genuine BMW parts. Number 23, pole position. Very Linton started this car earlier today. I heard some MRF tyres squealing, Prelzy going down into turn number one on that previous shot. It won't be the first time we hear that here today as he starts another lap. Gaps out to nearly 13 seconds to Marcus Ambrose now behind the wheel of the Vidicky Ford. Yeah, they're going along really well, aren't they? That's nice stuff. One compulsory pit stop ticked off. I like that the Cabbage car, the 92 BMW, has got two stops complete, which is awesome. So they've been quite smart with their pit stop strategy. They went out of sequence really early and uh, we're able to take a second stop under that safety car. So really cool stuff as the race continues to play itself out. Speaking of playing itself out, what an opening <laughs> stint it was for a man that has replaced Josh Bucken in the commentary box with myself and Matt Nolte. Grant Denya is with us. Congratulations, awesome stint this morning, my friend. How'd you go? Oh man, I love this place. Are you <laughs> no, kidding me? Really? Oh, God damn, it's so much fun. <laughs> Genuine fun. You know what I mean? Like that when you're sitting on the grid and it's all happening and the hair's standing up on the back of your neck and you know you've got a, a big six hours ahead and it all rests on your shoulders the first stint at least. It's a lot of pressure, but you know that's what we that's what we get out of bed for, isn't it? Exactly. First stint's out the way. You happy? Yeah, yeah, really good. Um, the car's in a pretty good place. It's a little little taily, so it's um it's 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 a little bit of a handful through the hairy stuff over the top of the mountain. <laughs> the hairy stuff. Um, but it, it'll last a day. The local legends Mustang. It's, it's, it's done a few laps around here over the years, and uh, we finished first in class last year. So 
it's it's pretty pretty in its window when we arrive. Did you enjoy that stint just before that last safety car where you were running legitimate second position, yeah. chasing down the leader, clean air around you, which is rare in this race yeah, as well. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like Star Wars sometimes out there. Just, everything's coming at you at speed. Uh, it's a Focus. I don't, it's a Hyundai. I don't know what it is. BMW, BMW, BMW. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But that's what makes this race so good, you know. You're just such a different length and breadth of cars and manufacturers and things that you can see on the road every single day so you can relate to them and it's different speeds and strengths and weaknesses that's what makes this race so interesting you, you love this place so much that you moved here several years ago and you don't miss an opportunity to do a lap whether it's on foot car or horse yeah <laughs> or cow for that or matter cow. <laughs> if you listen quietly you'll hear mine mooing in the distance and they're not too far away yeah. so if you had a stake in town last night it might have been mine <laughs> might have been bertha it was tasty. It nah. was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, nah, we don't name them. <laughs> no, that would be hard on the kids. Yeah. Kids struggle with that concept. We, we saw you out yesterday in the Janetta. The door peeled off. Uh, we didn't ever saw the actual incident. We just saw you parked down there. that catch you by surprise? Yeah. <laughs> the door blew off down the front straight and frightened the life out of me. Yeah. Uh, so we just it jettisoned the vehicle <laughs> and went sky high and then uh, went over the pit pit wall fence and landed in pit lane so uh, it was it sort of distracted me a little bit as I was looking where the door went I tagged another car that was in front of me so yeah that GT4 category has a really strong future in this country it's something you believe in really strongly don't you yeah I, you know I've, I've spent uh, eight years or so in GT3s having won a championship in in 2016 with Tony D'Alberto. So I, I love those cars. The commitment in those cars these days is pretty outrageous. Um, they are, <laughs> is he waving? Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is our A1 leader, car 45. It's Brett Hobson behind the wheel. Uh, the Garth Walden Racing Ram Motorsport car, uh, Mike Sheargold and Dylan O'Keefe sharing the driving duties. It's a good combo. And actually they're shooting for three in a row in class. So wow. you're going for back to back. They're going for three in a row, which has never been done in any class in the six hour. That's impressive. You know, when he was waving just then, when Ambrose went past me, I asked him for an autograph, <laughs> but he wasn't very... He shot, shot you down. <laughs> yeah, he oh, did no. it. No. He's, he's been so friendly this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> he's loving it, isn't it? Isn't oh. it great to see a legend of that calibre in yeah. this category and just drinking in every single lap, every single corner, helping out other young blokes and loving life? It's just unfinished business here too, man. It's a, a race that got away from him back in the supercar's career, and I think that little combination with him and Tim Brooker, I think is really underrated. Yep. I, and you know what? When you're out there with him on track, you can feel that angst. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you can feel that he really wants it. You know, I was just all I wanted was 10 seconds of breathing space and he wouldn't give it to me. What um, I loved was the morning warm-up this morning. And Marcus, before the warm-up, had had about five laps of that, that rag. He's not going to catch the fuel that is pouring out of that BMW. Is that someone's handkerchief? <laughs> yeah. Pocket square. More, yeah. Marcus has done five laps all weekend. Rolls out. He's like, oh, no, I'm not that fast. You know, Tim and George are quicker than I am. And goes out and does like a 28.5 on his second flying lap. Job done, parks it. He's still got it. Of course he does. It's so cool. And he's calculating. I was watching him work on me. And he would he'd pressure and then he would back off and cool his tyres. He would pressure and then when I was under pressure, I'd be burning my tyres. So yeah. he was just picking his tyres. He's like a sniper. Just sitting back, <laughs> waiting for me to pop my head above, above a bush and then bang. Well, that's the Team Buccini Motorsport car that we saw stopped on the exit of Turn 1. I'm going to assume they stopped with fuel pressure issues because most of it's now leaking out the back, and they're going to have to do quite a lot of work to stop that from pouring out. That's and that started instantly when they put the, the fuel into the dry brake yeah. system just before, so that's an issue for this car, that they won't let that back on the track in its current state. You need more than one rag out there to mop up the mess. And these are those dramas, aren't they, Grant, that you come across during the day. You can plan for anything to happen, but ultimately the car has the final say. It does, and you really do have to look after it. You know what I mean? This is a manual gearbox as it's built for, you know, for the road. So if you thrash the thing lap in, lap out, you're just going to have a big box of soup that you'll be sort of just stirring around with a big wooden spoon, if it makes it at all. So that's probably the most fragile thing on the, um, on the Mustang. And you look after your brakes. You just, you, it's, it's like a game of chess. Rather than a flat out sprint every single lap, you have to be intelligent, calculating about it. And you really got to think about what you're doing. This is the class A2 leader. It is the car that's second on the road outright at the moment. We've just been talking about it with Marcus still behind the wheel of this car. George Medici, who just married the lovely Jessica and spent two weeks in Thailand on the honeymoon. So he is as fresh and relaxed and re prepared as any race car driver has ever been coming into this yeah. race. 
and Tim Brook, who, as Nolts mentioned, is super, super quick. What are you watching here? Because similar cars, they've got a different gearbox to yours, but taking some notes. Different steering wheel anyway. Yeah, well, they've got both their hands on the wheel at all times, which sounds <laughs> way too sensible for me. Um, have a look at them. Look at them. Look at them. They're not even working. Look, what a, I'm going to take them down a vanilla latte afterwards. <laughs> look at that. Just a sequential gearbox in a Mustang. Ten speed. That's what. you got to do it old school style. Stick with this down Conrod, but just keep an eye on the digital speedo there. These things move. And Marcus was saying earlier in the weekend that they run the stock steering wheel because they still need to access the car's computer. That's top down on the speedo, it 260k, has, it doesn't go any quicker than that. I think it's going quicker than that, but maybe that's yes. the, the highest reading that yeah. the speedo will actually do. I'm not sure Ford ever intended that it should go quicker than that when they rolled them off the factory floor. Maybe if we showed them how fast they were actually going, they'd all be too scared. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they wouldn't factory let us recall. do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, you know, when you, when you tip it in sort of through that kink in the chase, these things, they move around on the rubber a fair mm. bit. It's actually quite hairy, but really fun. Really fun. I loved what Will Davison said yesterday, having got pole. He said, you know, I've been on pole here for the great race in a supercar, but these things, you have to drive them so hard. Yeah. And even someone like Will, he's had a million laps at this place. It was like, these are a proper challenge to extract a lap time out of. Yeah, because it's just walking underneath you the whole time. Oh, that's someone spouting sixes. The exit of Forest Elbow. And again, driving away, so maybe been contact down there, just trying to find a spot to get back onto the track. Yeah, it's usually a good place to sort of nip up the inside with some slower traffic. Well, that, that's found some it's damage. Hit the wall. That's just stopped outside the Bathurst Light Car Club up there at the top of Conrad Straight. A little bit wide and a glancing blow of the BMW M signage at the elbow. You could tell he was under pressure knowing some faster cars were coming behind. He's gone, obviously gone very deep, washed wide, clouded the wall. and Oh, no. Wow. That car had just been given a black flag as well for a restart infringement. So uh, it's gone from bad to worse for this know. crew. That's a shame. They, we share a garage with these guys. And, you know, some, for some of them, it's their first ever time around the mountain. They were so looking forward to this. They were so thorough in every aspect of the preparation of the car and how they managed the crew in the garage and their pit stops. So that's, re that's really heartbreaking. And this place brings out that emotion, doesn't it? Because People watching today on stand or here at the track just get to see the race. The crews, the drivers, the families go through this all year to get to this point. There's so much sacrifice to get to this, so you can understand why the emotions run high. Mate, there'll be tears in that garage, there's no doubt about it. You know, um, Yes, you're tired and everyone's worked really hard. Yeah. Um, but you've been working on this solidly for six months. You know, they've been testing, putting the car together, buying the spares, make sure they've got everything that they need just in case, assembling the crew, finding skilled people, bringing in friends who could do various jobs within the garage throughout the race. And then to have something like that happen, it really, it rocks you to the core. But that's kind of also what makes this place magic. When it does click, when it does work, when you, when you get to stand on top of that podium, there's no greater feeling in the world. This is a Gary Beggs Commodore that had gone an hour and 35 minutes without making a pit stop. So that was their first stop of the race. They elected to stay out and run for as long as they can, so they've resumed in 33rd position. That's good on juice. It's not bad, is it, mate? That's Hulk really Commodores. Of course, they're going to make four stops as well today yeah. as well, so it's uh, long into the race to get your first one in the books. Well, see, Ambrose hasn't stopped. He hasn't done a splash and dash, has he? No, they've just made the one CPS under yeah. that safety car, but he stayed in the car. And I think the plan for them is that they're just breaking this race into third. So Marcus does two, Tim Brook does two, George does two. They're quite straightforward. Are you back in your car later in the day? Because your first stint was a lot shorter. Yeah, so I, I started in the local Legends car and, and then Ryder's in. Tony will jump in next, probably then me and Ryder to finish. So Tony, Tony was, you know... When you're the ring in, you sort of, you know, <laughs> I'll do whatever you want, Tony, um, however you want it to play out. And, and Ryder's, Ryder's a great young talent. Of course, it's Tony's Massive. grandson. Um, you know, I've been driving with the Quinns now. For, well, they sponsored me 22 years ago in the first Ute race. Adelaide. Yeah. <laughs> Adelaide race? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's been a, a really lovely, long relationship. Um, and to see Ryder come along now and, and be super quick, he did a great job in qualifying. We wanted to put him in the car to build his confidence, put him through that sort of pressure test, you know, build him as a better driver. Um, of course, this is his first ever endurance race. He's only done a, he's only done a couple of years of racing, and that's all been sprints. But Tony didn't want to put Ryder in first, just, you know, because it's, uh, he is so, he's a young, brash, you know, fiery sprint racer. Exactly. And, and sometimes you just need to settle in the race and find the groove first. And, 
and then learn how to attack it. But he's uh, he's a star of the future. You've done a few of these now. Have you, have you sort of coached that into him to say, listen, we don't win this in the first corner. We win this at 5.45 today. Yeah, I think tempering their enthusiasm is sort of <laughs> part of your role as an elder statesman in the team. <laughs> you know, he's, 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 he's a great young kid. He's smart. He listens extremely well. He's so polite. Lost he sticks very well. That was slowed on the uh, hit straight here. I pointed out the window just a few moments ago. It's down at Hell Corner. It's and oh, no. Jason Gomesell behind the wheel. And now we're running quite well too, Krause. Yeah, they, they've had a really good weekend. Jason only recently bought this car. He's running with Aaron Seaton. They've set up their own Super 2 team this year. So we're watching the red Mustang, white GT stripes. It's got something coming out the back there. Yeah. That's what we're Yeah, yeah trying absolutely. To get in. It's like photographer Nathan Wong on the spot to get the photo, as he always is. But I, I spoke to Jason at length yesterday and he was really enjoying this process. His young boy, as we go back to safety car for the third time today, his young boy uh, is racing as well. So, uh, Junior Gomesell and the Hyundai Excels. Yeah, it looks like he's lunched that engine and it's a shame. He did it right after passing pit yeah. entry. So no chance of driving that all the way around or bringing it into pit lane to maybe have a quick look and, and salvage something. That's job done. The other cool thing, and you've just been talking about family, so I'll unpick all of this as we go back on the Hyundai safety car for the third time today. We just saw the Ray White Volkswagen Golf in pit lane, and that's Daryl and Henderson Leslie. Henderson's 16 years of age, Daryl 61, <laughs> father and son. And this has been their lifelong dream to race together at Bathurst. So I know you appreciate this. And uh, they've now both driven that car today, which is a really cool little story. Uh, we'll talk more about family values at Mount Panorama after we hear from Molly Taylor. He's got no steering, someone. Daniel Flanagan, we just saw the, the footage there of your 86 with, with Christoph having that incident. Can you tell us, you've spoken to him, can you tell us what happened, how bad the damage is? Uh, yeah, so we've lost the steering at this point. Um, just ran a little bit bit wide onto the marbles and just, just caught him out there. Um, we've got the spares here, so biggest biggest issue now is just getting it back here to fix it. So you've got this Donor 86 yeah. out the back, so you're just pulling the bits off the road car and, and then they can bolt straight back on? Yeah, that's right. Look, we, um, we, we, we came here with a complete car. We really wanted to finish the race. Um, Chris was doing an amazing job. It's his first time here at Bathurst. Um, and, you know, he, he did himself really, really proud, so. <laughs> you're getting a wind up from your crew. Yeah. <laughs> but how tricky is it? In, in these 86s, you've got these BMW M3s, M4s bearing down. The speed differential yeah. is huge. How tricky? I mean, you're trying to run your own race as well. So how tricky is that? Yeah, look, and I, I've been here in an Evo before and a HSV. So it has been hard. Um, the speed difference, look, there's 60 k's an hour difference at the end of Conrod. So it is really quick. Um, Chris was doing a mega job and... You know, he's beating himself up, but uh, we'll we'll give him a good pep talk when he gets back. And I think he did himself really well today. You know, did a good job. So Awesome. Well, we look forward to seeing you get back out there. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Molly. It's a great story. And the beauty of this safety car is that they'll be able to recover that car under this caution. So uh, hopefully they can get that car back. And this will be a flat toe. We got some reports through from the team in the media centre here at Mount Panorama that the Gomesell car sounded awful a lap ago. Right. So I think that may have been on the way out for a little while. Just unlucky that it should happen just before or just after pit entry. With, with the guys in the Toyota 86, I know that they actually went and um, purchased a, uh, a very, very ordinary second-hand Toyota 86 for $5,000 rather than buy individual parts. They bought a whole car just so they could push Cheap. the parts around. And how many times have we seen that over the years where we get cars brought up here as a spare just in case they need the parts. Yeah, you don't know what you're going to need to. You yeah. might as well bring a whole car, <laughs> really. <laughs> if you try and get smart about it and go, maybe we need an upper control arm or maybe we need a front bar, you'll... The thing you don't bring is the thing that you need. Yeah. So why not just bring an entire vehicle? that's vehicles? how it was, wasn't it, in yeah. the day? That was classic Bathurst back in the 60s yep. and 70s. The Ford Ranger recovery crew headed back out there. Beautiful wild track V6 that's out on the track for the second time today. It's our third safety car period as we approach four hours and 15 minutes remaining of this race. What caught my attention was car number four almost got caught up with that Toyota 86 at the exit of the elbow. Well spotted. So Anthony Sewell, who took over that car after a really good early short stint from Anton Di Pasquale at the start. Do you still get a buzz out of racing guys like Anton and Will? Actually, I'll ask you that in a minute because we're going to go to Chris Stubbs first. Yeah, thank you. This place just really hurts sometimes, doesn't it? Glenn Seaton, Aaron Seaton alongside me. Glenn, what just happened there, the new car? Well, it seems to be in the clutch area. It's got no drive through the clutch, and all of a sudden just happened. So 
We're not really sure until we get the car back exactly what's going on, but it's, it's definitely in the, uh, the in the clutch area. Aaron, for you, the reaction? Yeah, just disappointed. Um, obviously, can't thank the team enough for all the efforts gone into getting ready for this weekend. So it's a shame not to finish the race. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to come back sometime soon. You had a few issues, I think, earlier on the, in the weekend, but it seemed like things had, had come good, had they? Yeah, we had some uh, clutch issues yesterday. Um, so just in qualifying, it was, it was tough to, to get it in, into gear going down gears. But um, we worked on that last night. And, um, yeah, so we'll have to check the car out now and, and see what's going on. All right, next year, Glenn, you'll be in. You'll do the Father and Something, right? <laughs> no, I'm too old for it now. I just, I just enjoy being a part of it and being around and, and watching him race. You're not too old. There's guys in their 60s still. You're too old in your 50s. Guys, great to see you both still smiling and copping it on the chin. That's motorsport, right? Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that would be a cool combination. Yeah. We're going to make this happen. I agree. It's got to happen. I agree. I saw him race a TCM car about oh, three, four years ago, and uh, he was awesome. <laughs> He's so good. Oh, it, it, I raced, raced against him in the Mini Challenge Championship and uh, he was as tenacious then as he was <laughs> yeah. in 1987. You know what I mean? Like, you, you just don't lose that kind of fire. Race leader is in the pits while this has been going on as well. Under our third safety car period for the Jason Gomesall car. Of course, Jason is starting the new team this year after being a former co-owner with Matt Stone Racing. He was competing in the Super 3 Series this year while Aaron's in his third stint in Super 2. So Davison in. I like this. I don't mind burning a bit of track position at this point in the race to tick off another compulsory stop under yellow. So Will Davison will stay behind the wheel. They'll bring the tank on the big M3 and tick another box for this squad who have become very good at winning endurance races at this place. They 2019 victory here was a destruction of everyone, basically. They started from pole. They led every lap. They won by a lap. They set the fastest lap and the run record. And that was just Berwick Linton and Tim Lay. So they've added Will Davison to the mix just to add strength to this squad. And it's nice to have a bit of star power in the field as well, you know. I think if you're just an occasional racer, to know that you're sharing the same bit of tar as an Ambrose or a Will Davison or two generations of Seatons, <laughs> just knowing that that kind of calibre is around, you know, just sort of elevates you and you feel, you know, you feel like you're amongst great company and it just adds to the, the, the how special this event actually is. Is this not the best paddock in the sport? It's so relaxed, laid back, everyone's in a good mood, even if they've had a bad day. The, the pit lane at the six hour is something so unique. Yeah, it's a beautiful feeling out there, to be honest. You know, normally on a, on, on a maybe a sprint round, the intensity is dialed up to a thousand. Every, you know, there's sheep stations at every corner. You go about your weekend very differently. It's far more aggressive. Yeah. You're not as friendly with your neighbour because you're your fierce, fiercest competitor. But here the camaraderie is, is, is very special. You got once a year races, you've got people doing it for the first time ever in their life, you've got the likes of Will Davison, so it's such a, a mix of personality and experience and those those brains, you can, you can go up and pick them and they'll share them, you know, Will Davison will talk you around the lap if you've never been here before yeah. and that's that's so cool, you know you're blooding new people into the sport you know, you're, 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 you're lifting people up is, is what this event is about This, this place never ceases to amaze us you, you bring someone here for the first time and I don't think anybody's come away going Oh, yes, it's a racetrack. Yeah. <laughs> they come away with this going, you really drive around this racetrack. I mean, this is, this, it's meant to be a tourist drive, not a racetrack. It's such an incredible piece of tarmac. You, I walk around it now for fitness, you know, three times a week. It is so steep. It's a thigh burner, you know, and a, and a yeah. lung buster <laughs> of a place to walk around. But the fact, it's, it's much narrower than you imagine and you take anyone around here, a relative or someone who comes to visit you here when they come to, to visit you know, our place and stay at our joint, you go, come around and have a look at Mount, Mount Panorama mm. and they can't believe that across the top, say in a supercar or something like that, you're doing 200 and nearly 30 kilometres an hour as you approach Skyline. You can't see where the road goes. Yeah, exactly. It's blind, it's cresty, it's crowny. It's got all the corners that make... Every hard corner that you could imagine in Australia is pretty much it. <laughs> so maybe you, the bottom two. Do you leave 10 minutes early to take the kids to school and just cut a sneaky lap on the way through? Or? Well, funny you should say that. This is actually the road between my house and the in-laws uses the front straight. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So I can never just use, you know, <laughs> you maybe that, 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 that kilometre of front straight here. I always add Dad, the rest of the lap. <laughs> <laughs> Molly? 
Well, I'm with Colin Osborne of Osborne Motorsport. You're running two beautifully presented Renault Megans. So much so that we would like to present you with the best presented award for your class. Uh, and from our great friends at Super Cheap Auto, they would like to give you guys a $500 gift voucher to reward you for, for all the work that goes in. Prepping the cars mechanically is a big job, but also coming here and making everything look so sharp. Yeah, look, it, it, our guys really treat that as being important. Um, not you know, just that the cars are good, but that they actually look good. And, and, you know, we've always taken pride in the way in which we've presented our team for, for 30 years. So this is really good. <laughs> really good. Well, congratulations. And just quickly, you've given some, some junior drivers uh, great opportunities to be out here competing as well with your team. Hugely experienced this weekend. How important is that for you? Yeah, it's really good, except they're showing me up terribly. I mean, to put it in perspective, <laughs> those guys' ages all added up don't equal mine. <laughs> and um, that's why I sort of hinted this morning that you know, it's, you need to know when to call time, and that time's getting awfully close on my fear, so uh, we'll have a big think about it during the course of next week and see what we do. Well, thanks, Colin. We appreciate everything you do for the sport. Yeah, well said, Molly. Amen to that. It's a great little team and beautifully presented. Thanks to Super Cheap for their support. Uh, we haven't presented A2 yet, so I don't know if you guys will be in the mix with that or not, but you might find yourself, or Tony you might find himself with, a $500 super cheap auto voucher. We're back under green. Marcus Ambrose leads at Mount Panorama. I wanted to say <laughs> that for a while. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it sounds in, good. In second place is Chris Lillis in that HSV. That's a good result for those guys too. Uh, they struggled to make the top half of the field in qualifying, but that car's better than it's indicated so far throughout practice and qualifying. So Chris Lillis next. And the Russells, remarkably, despite all their dramas and the pit stop shuffles going on, a third on the road. So... Drew Russell made some ground up behind that safety car. Everyone else then pitting has got them back up towards the front of the field. So damage mitigation for them has been quite effective. Your car, Ryder Quinn, fourth outright on the road at the moment and third in class. So young Ryder Quinn doing a nice job. It'd be nice if he could chase down Ambrose. That'd be great to see. I, I, can, I noticed that Marcus no is he's using every little <laughs> bit of territory on the exit of those turns up through McPhillamy. He's, uh, he's really, he's pushing it. He's 205 k's an hour on the tip into McPhillamy Park. I saw on the digital dash in that time by. a production car. That's amazing. amazing. And you're not, you remember, you're not on a slick, you know. No. You're, this, this is unbelievable. It's just so smooth with a car, whether it be the supercar in a day or NASCAR in North America. Hasn't lost any of it, that's for sure. No, he's not, and he's smart, and he knows how hard to push the car and when you're pushing it too hard. He doesn't want the, t the tyre to fail underneath him. You don't want to overheat those tyres. You've got to remember, there's a fair bit of weight in this Mustang, so as you're tossing it across the top of the mountain, there's a lot of load transfer, and it's very easy to overheat these tyres and start sliding the rear end. But he's beautiful and smooth and in his car control. You can see his work on the wheels ensuring that that rear end doesn't start to overtake the front because that's when you'll start going backwards busy conrod straight it's sort of the story of the race what this is doing is these repetitive safety cars at the moment at this stanza of the race is just allowing the leaders to run in clean air and not have to deal with lap traffic yes it's busy further like we're seeing here with the cabbage bmw working their way through some of the class cars but for marcus ambrose he'll get four laps of serenity without any dramas of the slower cars and having to deal with much like the 92 here caught up in the thick of the action under the high-tech oils bridge, just in front of the A1 class car of the GWR Ram Motorsport Mercedes AMG that we touched on before. But still hard to get a read on where everyone sits. There's a lot of cars out of position based on all of these pit stops that have been playing out. And quite frankly, I'm OK with that because it just keeps us guessing with this race and how it's going to play out in the second half and that ultimate fight to get to the final hour and then see how it all plays out. I would have thought the uh, the Russells might pull in Ambrose here. Those those X cars are, they're quick. Those those BMWs have a little bit more top end than, than what we've got. But Ambrose is matching them, uh, almost punching out exactly the same yeah. time on that lap. So he's um, he's he's doing well to keep that that Beamer behind him. Now, three or four seconds quicker than the cars around him right now, although, albeit there is some lap traffic out there as well, some slower cars for the likes of Hodges out there who runs in fifth position. This is Ben Barguana. How's the traffic jam at the front? <laughs> That's insane. I'm going to run up to Griffin's Bend. Is it like this during the week? <laughs> it looks like BWS on a Friday here in Bathurst. <laughs> so Ben down in 26th position at the moment. They're, they're another car well out of track position. They're contenders for a class victory in 
A1, these guys, and the, the four-wheel drive turbo, uh, sorry, normally aspirated five-cylinder engine, it is in the Audi TT RS. This is so cool. This is so cool. Because you just don't know where you're going to catch someone. You don't know what side of the road they want to be. Sometimes you just have to assume when you're a faster car coming through that nobody knows you are there. Yeah. The only way to survive this race with this many cars and this many different classes is to assume that that person hasn't seen you. And be patient. Yeah, and be patient. Absolutely. And that's, that's probably the one the one, one lesson I had for, for Ryder Quinn in the local Legends Mustang is be patient. Use your talk, use your horsepower and pick your moment. Because everyone, you know, when you're going across Mount, the top of Mount Panorama, it's not easy. You need eyes forward. You can't expect everyone to be looking in their mirrors as they're struggling to hang on to the steering wheel. We, we asked Josh Bucken earlier today, where is the worst spot to catch traffic? Skyline. Bang, another yep. one. Followed by everywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say somewhere between start and finish line, but yeah. Just... Yeah, skyline, because your approach speed, because that's because you it is such a fast part of the track. The closing speed can be huge, and it, it bottlenecks, and you're dis about to disappear down a mountain. Right, this is your car. Ryder Quinn behind the wheel. Talk us through a lap of Mount Panorama. Let's see what this 18 year old can do, eh? <laughs> I told him to go slow with the gears. Oh, okay, that was pretty quick. <laughs> Gentle, though because uh, we've had issues with the gearbox and driving this before, but that was nice. That was calculated. You've got to make sure it slots perfectly, guide it nicely, be clear, be precise with those gear changes. Under brakes, the back of the car moves a little bit here at the moment. We're getting a very hard pedal because the rear's kind of starting to lock up. He's working the wheel nice. He's looking calm. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Bit of squeal of the wheels. Got a bit of turning oversteer on this car. A bit of understeer now as he throws it in. You got to lift a little bit here. Yep, otherwise the rear comes around on you. So a little lift off the pedal. He's just going to roll out. No brake. Climbs onto it before the apex. To get a great run up the remainder of the rest of the hill. This is fun. This is good. Oh, whoa. He's dancing. He's dancing. <laughs> a nice little slide towards the wall. He's working hard. He wants this. All right, so here's your scenario. Do you throw it over Skyline underneath? No. Huge risk if you do. Tire squeal. Okay, as you turn in around the kink here, it's, the car doesn't break very well around here. The rear wants to walk around on you. So you've got to sort of catch it in your hands on the steering wheel, but he's got a good run here. The car in front's gone shallow, so not a great exit. This might be Ryder's chance. Around the outside, that's... <laughs> that kink's quite fast. It is done well. Disposed of another. Well done, young man. I know, uh, I know Grandpa, or Popeye as he calls him, will be really happy to see that. There's a twinkle in his eye when Ryder does something well like that. But... You can see it really walking around in the rears, a lot under brakes. God, it sounds good too. It does, I was thinking the same thing. Oh, well, there you go. Gee, it's an emotional roller coaster watching that in here with you, but that's fantastic. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no. So that's the sliding I was talking about. That's really, really easy to induce with, unless you're absolutely maximum concentration. That's great. Let's go down to Josh Bucken. Hey guys, I'm here with uh, George Medici and Tim Brook. When you said put a race suit on, I thought you had a gig for me, but <laughs> evidently not. Brooks, so you're about to jump into the car, mate. Um, last time you were here, you had a Trans Am on pole. Are you going to go and set some uh, sectors alight? Uh, look, I don't know if we really need to do that at this point of the race. It's just uh, play it safe. Gorgeous George is going to get in and, uh, and bring it home, so I'll just give him something he can fight with to the end, and uh, we'll see where we end up. Don't say yourself short, Brooksy. You're, a, you're an operator, mate. Uh, George, you'll be driving the car in the last stint to, to bring it home. How's it been so far? What are the kind of things you're looking for to, to finish? Are you looking for an outright? Are you looking for class? How are you loose shaping up so far? Look, I think right, right now we're on the right window for the pit strategy. It's not pretty obvious. So we're getting ready for a change here. And then when we do change, we'll be, a, uh, we'll be putting Brooksy in. Um, the car, Marx is really complimentary of the car. The pace is really good. He's, we've been very lucky to be able to run in clean air, um, and he's been setting great time. So, um, yeah, it seems that we've 
hit the nail on the head, kind of, from a setup point of view. Whether we've got anything for the BMWs, I think that's a strategy thing. We're going to have to get lucky there. But, you know, from a class, class point of view, everything's running pretty smoothly. And the car seems to be able to do its thing pretty much anywhere on the track, which is exactly what we're looking for. Yeah, that's excellent. We can see the speeds across the top are actually really good in the car, yeah. uh, even relative to, you know, the BMs and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, does only using the paddles aid that? Is it nice and easy to drive rather than an H pattern? Yeah, it's, it's got a lot to do with that wheelbase. You know, the car is so stable, exactly as you say. You know, as soon as when you're getting into that those floating sections, when you're coming over crests and into dips and all that sort of stuff, the car doesn't really want to kill you, which is which is really encouraging <laughs> from a driver point of view. So you can afford to push. You can afford to feel. You know, you can afford to feel comfortable, and that's that's really showing in Marx's times. Awesome. Best of luck, George and Brooksy. Stay two seconds now off the leader. If you're watching, who's staying? to rag the go-karts go BMW with Drew Russell behind the wheel here as we about to tick over two hours of racing in the high-tech oils bath of six hour he's doing a mega job here Ambrose to stay with this and Tim Brook who we talked about earlier in the coverage guys very underrated mm. and I'd love to see him get a, a full-time drive once again he was great Toyota 86s we saw him in Trans Am last year he could have been the champion last year yeah it was a wild old season too He's very, very highly rated. In fact, Marcus was saying very complimentary things about him early in the weekend. So just to confirm, this is a lead change now for the outright race lead. So Drew Russell has moved past Marcus Ambrose and car 58, despite their little trip up in pit lane earlier on, is now back in front of the race. And the Team Newcastle going along very nicely to go karts, go BMW. So Ambrose second, Ryder Crin third. Chris Lillis going along really nicely in that big HSV that we just saw overtaken by the local Legends car. They're going well in fourth position and third in A2. And Simon Hodges, having been set up by Jaden Ojeda earlier in the day, doing a really nice job in fifth position. But there's still a lot of cars out of sequence with pit stops having been taken. And one of those is Will Davison, who's currently in 12th position in car number 23. So we'll keep you up to speed, but I get the feeling as we have a hairy moment at the top of the mountain, we're not going to get a real read on where cars actually sit when all the pit stops are cleaned, cleansed going into that final hour of the race this afternoon. That moment for the Russells just then, that's experience. And you know what it's like there. You come up on a lap car just before metal grate, it's really one line. He read that play because they would easily have gone into the wall, couldn't it? Well, the driver in front had moved to the left and he's like, do I go around the outside? But if the driver doesn't see me, you're out of the marbles and you're in the wall in a blink of an eye. So he was smart. Uh, yeah, D-Ross, he just, he just pulled the car up. He, he, he checked out of it rather than take the gamble because it, it wasn't worth the risk. And it's so easy to do up there. It's just confusion. Yeah. It's like, oh, hang on, I saw him in my left mirror, now he's in my right mirror, where is he? And then all yeah. of a sudden now that lead driver, he's lost his place on the track. So this will be the overtake for the lead. You can see the BMW on the right-hand side and zipping up the inside of Griffin's Bend to take the lead while we're down the pits talking to the Mitiki teammates. And now goes out to fair margin. Now, on our screen, Ambrose has dropped down yeah. to fifth. Now, there's been a moment here, perhaps. He's lost 15 seconds in the first sector, Nolts. So yeah. it's somewhere up towards the top of the mountain. So we'll try and chase that story for you. He is now 27 seconds behind our race leader at the end of this lap. And here he is. That car is cruising, gentlemen. I reckon they've pushed it to the fuel limit and she's coughing and spluttering. That's the only thing that makes sense. I can't see any marks on the car. It's running super slow. So this team didn't take the opportunity of that last safety car to tick a compulsory pit stop box off. They've got one of their four mandatory stops complete, but that's it. And this is costing them a huge amount of time. It's lucky it's a long way downhill here. Yeah. You can actually roll from the top of the hill if you're really, really careful, but he's idling. If not... Is the engine running? Yep, just. Just coasting, though and the belts come loose. So this will be a stop, but yeah, I, I think you might be right, Grant, that maybe they've just gone a little bit too far and he's put that thing in the reserve or the thing started coughing, so he's got right out of it just to make sure. Yeah. But that started at the start of the lap. All their time loss was in sector one going up the hill. So often sometimes when it coughs, this is such a long lap around here, if it coughs right after you've gone past pit entry, it, you, you're not gonna make it. You're not gonna make it without enough warning to get around and, and fill it up. And they've just pushed it possibly just that little bit too far. And that's the risk when you take that chance. So take on fuel now after leading a lot of this race. Tim Brook now jumps in. That's George Meneke with the Balaclava on. 
I need to get him prepped and just keep himself warm. It is so cold here today at Bathurst on your Easter Sunday. Hope you're enjoying our coverage on Stan Sport of the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. Drew Russell now into the lead by 15 seconds as we get a whole sea of traffic here making its way up Mountain Straight. Chris Lewis is in third position now, but uh, yet to do a second stop. Second in Class A2. Holtzy leading our Class A1 cars out there right in fifth position. As Richard Crowell said, a long way to point out here on who's actually in the scheme of things. We say a big thank you to Grant Denyer. Enjoy this afternoon. It's always fun having you up in the commentary box, mate. Mate, it's great to be here sharing this with you, and it's good to see us in P2 at the moment. Look at us leading, <laughs> leading our class and uh, second outright. Looks like oh. it hopefully is a good day. It's up and about. We love it. Oh, and there's Thanks, a car gents. in the fence at turn two. We thank Grant Denyer. This race just does not stop throwing curveballs. Amazing stuff. And uh, that Subaru has found quite heavy contact to the fence. Car 66, Dimitri Agathos, who's been here plenty of times in this car. Mate, sort of flying under the radar a little bit. It's uh, Brianna, Brianna Wilson, Wilson behind the wheel. And we go to safety car for the fourth time today. With Drew Russell leading. Wow. And good time safety car for the Ambrose car as well, having just gone into the lane. They're going to be able to make up all that time. They lost with a green flag pit stop and get to the back of the queue. Yeah. It's Brianna's fourth start with Dimitri Agathos here and that car finding the tyre wall up at Griffin's Bend. Safety car comes out fourth time. Look in the background of this shot perhaps. Or is this more contact on the way up? Now there it is in the background of the shot. Uh, it's similar to what the dude did here years ago. Yeah. And Taz Douglas and several other drivers. Well, and he came back to win. I'm not sure if that's going to happen again this time. So that car just drilled under that tyre bundle and the retaining strap that protects it on the run up into turn two. But we didn't get the start of that. It's hard to know what happened, whether there were traffic around. There's going to be more pit stops. Simon Hodges has pitted from fourth position. Chris Delsmit in the lane in the 2 one And Will Davison pits as well. So it's been a busy start to the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour for 2023. A race that is increasingly challenging to read and understand with early safety cars dictating the way this race is playing out. But in and amongst all of that, there's been drama, there's been action. Pretty much a standard day at the office at Mount <laughs> Panorama. Super Cheap Auto race highlights at Bathurst. The race started cold conditions. Perfect for turbocharged BMWs, and boy, didn't they put on the show early on. They're yeah, locking out the first three rows of today's great race. It didn't take long for the lead changes to happen. This was Ojeda down the inside of Di Pasquale at the DBA chase in the early stages of the race. And our first big incident, the Levitt Mercedes finding the wall on the right, then the left-hand side would bring out the first safety car of the weekend. At this moment here for Dwayne West, how we didn't have more cars, and this we'll never know. Look at them all streaming up behind and just gassing up that car. Big contact down here for Hadrian Morrell with the Wilkinson car going off into the gravel trap. That brought out the third safety car. Then the little 86, just enough to nip the wall there on the exit of Forest Elbow. They got the car back into the pits and a fair bit of work to do for that team. This was Jason Gomesol locking the rear, skating off the track. We believe clutch issues with his Mustang. He'd pull up at the bottom of pit straight here and get dragged back into the pits. And then this moment that happened a few moments ago with a change of the lead, saw the go-karts go BMW back into the lead of the race. And moments and after, Noltz down at Murray's, pushing hard, Drew Russell in the lead of the Bathurst six hour. So, gee, there's been a lot going on. We're only two hours into this thing. We're not even halfway. So the Russell's lead, uh, Grant Denyer, we've just heard from, very happy to be P2 outright at the moment. The HSV going along really nicely. Chris Lewis, brilliant stint from them. The Lancers just creeping up, the Lyacono and Holtzell team. Cavich is in the mix. They've got some pit stops up their sleeve as well for the yellow car and that BMW M2 with Tom Randall still to come later on in the day. Class leaders, need to give a shout out to Jake Camilleri and Scott Nicholas, the Class C leaders. They're running 16th outright at the moment in their little Mazda 3 MPS, doing a good job. And the Dowsett Matron and Bloxham Subi BRZ leading the way in Class D. Alexander Dooley and Shane Fowler about the zone leading the Class E battle in their Mazda 3 SP25. Camilleri started 33rd on the grid today, Rich, as well. So good job for them. Yeah, reigning champions in Class C and the dominant force 
in that side of the sport. So the clean-up well underway up at Griffin's Bend. That's the run up the top of Mountain Straight. And from pit lane to the commentary box into the warmth, it's Molly Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It's uh, definitely a lot warmer up here. We can see a bit of sun coming through the glass, but pretty uh, opportune time for me to come up to the commentary box when the WRX goes off. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been there in a similar model car before. It hurts. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's, what's the vibe like in pit lane? This is a really hard race to read right now from a strategy with all of these safety cars and some cars going well out of sequence. Yeah, totally. And to be honest, running up and down the lane, there's there's so much happening that I, I'm looking forward to coming up here and sitting down and actually sort of taking stock on, on where we're at because, yeah, it's been really hard to watch the race because there is so much so much going on, dramas, so many different pit stop strategies as well. Really interested to see particularly how the, the Randall Cavage car comes out, it, comes out of that one. Just saw at the window, the Brook car has just come back into the pits and there it has been pushed down there again. So they've just fueled this car. But we'll see what happens when this car has been pushed down the apron. What is going on with car 95? And the leader in as well, and so too Chris Lillis in the HSV. I got some messages from the top of the mountain saying the car had an over rev or it sounded really bad at the top of the mountain before we saw Marcus limping back. So th there's something more going on than just getting limping back to pit lane with fuel for strategy and straight into the garage. The reason they do that is because you can throw more people at the problem inside the garage across that red line. But interesting if they said it sounded like an over rev because that's got an automatic transition, transmission. So normally if you have something like that, it's when you've mucked up a gear change and, and you know hit the wrong gear and, and cause the engine to over rev. But the automatic gearbox should be doing all of that. Um, you shouldn't be able to, to make yeah. that happen. So it could be a, yeah, who knows, larger drama there. Okay, on the upshift, it's the downshift that spikes the they're motors. The ones, yep, yeah. they don't like that. Time car 96 back in the pits right now. Robert Rubis behind the wheel. Let's go to pit lane. Marcus, the bad part is when you're part of the commentary team, you have to talk to us no matter whether it's good news or bad news. You're laughing, but what's the uh, issue? Yeah, we're completely cooked. We're done. Uh, gearbox is gone. So we we're trying to run this 10-speed auto and everything was going great. We had a lot of speed across the top of the mountain. Everything strategy was good. The old man was double stinting. It was all working <laughs> out. And then, bang, it just started slipping the plates inside that gearbox, and it was done. So at what point in the in the race in that stint did you start to think it was up? Uh, just, it was immediate, straight off turn one. And then, yeah, it was slipping in every gear. But everything else was going so well, wasn't it? Had you started to think about the end of the race, or was it too early? Well, you know, we're running A2 class, so, you know, obviously we're leading our class and then we're leading outright laps and I started looking at these BMWs and they are rockets down the straightaway. It's got to be 20 lengths down Conrad. I mean, it was just incredible. But we were hustling really hard across the top. We had a lot of speed there. The balance was beautiful. The Mustang was handling great across the top. Brakes were great and the gearbox was great until it wasn't. <laughs> well, unfortunately, you don't get to race. So now that you're out of the race, we're going to get you up in the comments box, but I guess you'd like to say thank you all down the team. I will. Just Tim Brook, you know, he had a raw deal this weekend. Hardly got any laps. He's a great driver. George and Andrew Medici for putting on this program for us. GRM building this car. Uh, yeah, we're trying to make this 10-speed work. I think we're coming back next year with a manual. That's the good news. Up to the box. We'll catch you later. Thank you. Can you believe that? The big, big story of Bathurst. Just like that, they're in such a good position. And now the day is done for the Mediki Group car. Yeah, such a shame. And I think they were sort of cautious of some temp issues in, in that gearbox, uh, only using four of the, the ten that they had available. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, likely then that, that, that temp's caused that problem. But but interestingly, the Seaton Mustang had an issue with the clutch as well. Yeah. So gearbox issues with both different types of transmissions for the Mustangs. Let's hope that doesn't become an issue for the other Mustang that's oh. leading this race at the moment. Yeah, but let's not talk about that, shall we? <laughs> Grant was in such a good mood. Uh, yeah, so, but it's funny, isn't it? We come so accustomed to bulletproof race cars at this place. Supercars, the 1,000 Ks, at flat out. 12-hour GT3 cars, flat out. This is a different style of motor race. It's an old-school Bathurst race where the cars are still very fallible and you need to manage the car as much as the driver and the strategy and everything else over the six hours. Yeah, totally. And I think as you know, as much testing and R&D as you do, you don't test for six hours around the mountain. So in many ways, sometimes this is this is the first time that some of these cars are, are trying to do this, this sort of stint and you try and manage things the best you can, but you often find these out on the go. 
just starting to see the Gremlins sneaking into the field here today at the High Tech Oils Bathurst 6 Hour. Also hearing reports, the BMW, the Spinifex car that Matt Charter's steering is got a sticky clutch and a sticky brake caliber as well. So we'll keep an eye on it. Armin Charter sending that message through to us just a few moments ago. They're back in a 34th position in car 28. Matty Charter did an awesome he job did. in that car in qualifying <laughs> yesterday. I think it was 16th or 17th outright. Hold that thing up. That 335i is the most raced car at Mount Panorama. Full stop. Two thousand the stats. 2007, it made its debut in the Bathurst 12 hour. It won. Won the 12 hour again in 2010 in the production car era. And it's raced in every six hours since then. Uh, let's go back down to the lane with Josh Bucken. So I'm here with Dylan O'Keefe. Dylan, uh, former sparring partner of myself in TCR Australia. How's your weekend going? You're in an A45 with Mike Sheargold and Brett Hobson, some fairly decent teammates. How's it shaping up? Yeah, we're going really well. You know, this is the second year I've done the six hour with Mike Sheargold. Uh, he's going for three in a row, so that's how I am. Um, the car's running faultlessly thanks to the GWR crew. Uh, our car's run by Ram Motorsport as well, and yeah, a whole, whole lot of fun, you know, super easy going. It's a relaxed event. Uh, the lead up's been really good. Just trying to look after the car, manage the brakes. Uh, Hobbo's running really well at the moment, and I think I'll jump in with about three hours to go and hopefully run to the finish. I can see out the back of the garage there, there's a, a set of tyres that probably look like they're good to go on an A45. Is the plan to slap a set on for you and you go and uh, haul across the top and see how many positions you can make up at the back half of the race? I think so, you know. you just got to get through to the last couple of, probably the last hour, and then we'll put on a new tyre and see how we go. This car's, uh, you know, it's four-wheel drive, but it tends to use more of the front tyres, so we uh, change the right front every uh, couple of stops. You'd be used to that, front-wheel drive around here? Yeah, that's it, racing against you. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Best of luck. Cheers, mate. Uh, I love the, the TCR battles, the sparring between the drivers in TCR when they're out of the TCR cars is <laughs> sensational. Even on a weekend off. So this is the recovered Subaru, so just being linked back down to the paddock. Sad sight for our co-commentator Molly Taylor. That's not good, is it? That's not good. A, yeah, there's a bit too much toe-in and camber there. Yeah, unfortunately I don't think that comes back today, although there are plenty of spare parts lying around. But Bree Wilson with a, a lot of miles at this place and Demetri Agathos too. And these these cars, the Subarus always battled against the Evo as it did back in rallying, but never quite had the success in production car racing. Stubbsy? Rich, we can't go racing, racing without having, having some good tread on some tyres. And we've got Vivek from MRF Tyres. Vivek, you guys and your team absolutely love this event, don't you? And motorsport in general. Man, is the best place in the world to do racing. You know, it's Bathurst, isn't it? You know, currently I live in Europe, and I tell all my friends, Bathurst is Bathurst, you go through the mountain, you know what I mean? So this is this is mystic, man. This is a place to be, you know, in the world, yeah. We love your passion, and we love this tyre. The feedback from all the teams, it is so durable to be able to go the whole distance for six hours. Yeah, it's it's not good for my pocket, but, but it's good for other people's pocket, and that's what MRF is known for, to give the best tyre, durable tyre, long-lasting, and this is, a, this is a home people, you know, people from home come and compete here, and they hard-earned money, right? This is not, you know, a Formula One team where you can throw tires how much ever you want. These are people who manage their cars in the garage, come over here, and we, that's a matter of policy, right? To look after the customers, and that's why we are here. Vivek, your support is appreciated. MRF Tire support is appreciated. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much, Chris. You know, and you guys are doing an amazing job. You know, go stand. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, much. Cheers. <laughs> go stand. Absolutely. Uh, that's good. I, I, he might sell some more tyres before the day's out. I, I never bought that Furphy. We were told earlier that they were going to run tyres all the way through. And Dylan O'Keefe just shed some more light on that, that they'll put at least a right front on that AMG A45. So uh, I think Vivek will be OK. He'll, he'll move it through a few more MRFs through today. He was trying to sell us a set of tyres on Friday when we first got out the rental car. <laughs> they love it. And thanks to MRF for being the control tyre once again here at the High Tech Oils. Bathurst, six hours. Car 66 makes it back into the pit lane. The Ford recovery vehicle just stopping to pick up some debris on its way back as we're approaching the halfway mark of this year's edition. Still behind the Hyundai safety car with Ryder Quinn leading this race. And we understand lights out on the Hyundai safety car this lap and they'll go back to racing. So Ryder Quinn will find himself leading an endurance race at Mount Panorama, aged 18, driving with his granddad and Grant Denyer, local superstar, and he will lead that Ford Mustang around. And I'm just trying to pick up where the next car that's likely to challenge. So 
Alex Holzel is second on the road in that number 14 Mitsubishi Lancer Evo. So that is for position, but it's not the next car in the line. So there it is, it's four cars back. And then you find Ben Cabbage behind the wheel of car number 92, and that's the leading car in class X. They pitted earlier today as well. The first cars to come in when the pit stop window opened 30 minutes in. Just joined our coverage. The pit stop window will close. 30 minutes of competition remaining as the Hyundai safety car pulls away. What a moment this is going to be. The local legends car with a star in the making will take us back to green flag racing. That's the control point where the green flag is. And if he learned from the guys before, it's time to get on that skinny pedal on the right-hand side. Well, and again, he'll get a buffer zone here with those lapped cars in between he and especially Ben Cavage. I think that's the one he'll be most worried about from an outright point of view because that BMW M2 competition will be the quickest car of this leading group. There it is, just going past the RX-8 and the Renault Megane. And Cavage goes down the inside. So that's net second now. Just holds all... Open the steering as he got midway through Hell Corner. We heard from the Dylan O'Keefe car, so that's Brett Holson behind the wheel of car 45. That's the green and black Mercedes AMG A45. And that, that's done well here. That was, what, fourth or fifth last yep. year? Uh, I was chatting to Dylan earlier on, and, and he thinks that they're on for, for a podium, and we saw, particularly in practice, when, when it was a little bit slippery, I think they were third overall, so some good uh, curb ride in there. And was that Adam Burgess? It was in car number four. So he's making ground there in that brightly liveried BMW. That's the Anthony Sewell Anton Di Pasquale entry. So they're back up to seventh. They were one of those cars that stopped really early in the race. And the Higher Express Evo is getting marked up here on the run up to Reed Park. And it's a really busy time of the race. Grant Sharon in the Sharon Rentals car. And the 57 did a really nice job there just to get hard across the driver's right and get out of the way of these faster cars coming through. It was a little interesting pit stop we um, I saw earlier on. I was down at the pits at the Sharon rental garage and uh, as he was coming out of the pit lane, there wasn't quite enough room and there was a little oh, bit really? of a little bit of a gentle uh, touching oh, going on as we got out, which was uh, oh, it was all good. It was all good. It was just uh, it's a bit exciting to watch from from my perspective, but I don't think the the cameras caught it. Josh Bucken. Guys, I'm here down with Jackson Rice in the number 31 Renault Megane. Mate, uh, clearly you don't want to be in here. I can smell to the gearbox, diff oil. Tell me what went wrong. Uh, so the boys think it's a, it's probably a drive shaft issue, so it's a real shame. Like, we were sitting second in class, so... But, I mean, the boys are going to work. We'll get it back out there. We'll just keep chipping away. I mean, the, these boys at Osborne Motorsport are just fantastic, so, you know, it's a shame, but still plenty of time left. We'll get, uh, we'll get the problem sorted, and we'll get back out there and keep chasing them. Are you... Uh, to, do you know if you're planning to get back in yourself to do some more laps to Savo, or what's the strategy there? Yeah, I think so. So Jordan was uh, was meant to take next stint, so I think he will. Um, and then I'll jump in at the end, and then we'll figure out how to, with, just with safety cars, if we go for a splash and dash. So obviously, strategy's changed now, but uh, no, well, I'll definitely be back in. Awesome. Best of luck. We hope to see you back out there. Thank you. There's a bit going on in pit lane here as they come through to complete another lap here. Ryder Quinn, nearly four and a half seconds. Back to Walden now, who's up into second spot. So the Class X cars making their way back up into the mix. Cavage is third with three pit stops next to their name. Now, we just saw the Burst Auto Parts car go through a long way from the tail of the field, Krause, just on that last lap. I'm trying to look for him on the screen here. 25th position, though, on our screens. Well, they... Oh, and the drama's here. That's blown up. And that goes back to that clutch drama this car was having before. And the brakes on the 28 Spinifex recruiting BMW. Matt Harris behind the wheel, they were 34th, and they've stopped at Murray's corner. And that's down towards the National Motor Racing Museum. Well, that car's won two Bathurst 12 hours. You could just drive it around the corner a little bit further and drive it into the museum. He's doing it now, I think. <laughs> and just park it there. Brad Owen runs the museum. He'll be happy to take it. That, you know, that's a long way down the escape road there, back towards the city of Bathurst. So I wonder if that's far enough out of the way. I think people will start having some real concerns if there's another safety car. To answer your question about the Barguana, I picked that up too. And I, they just stopped. So they went back into the lane. And yeah. they're showing four pit stops alongside that car. If that's the case, they've ticked all of their compulsory pit stop boxes already. So it frees the rest of their race up for them to run it however they want to without any 
um, requirements around it. So it could be a really guru strategic play here for the Bargwana team. They're just with three, three and a half, or just over three and a half hours to go. So they, they still, uh, it's not, not quite enough time for uh, one of them just to jump in and bring it home. They still still will have to come in for some driver yeah, changes. Exactly, but it takes the overheads out of the way, doesn't it? To worry about doing a compulsory pit stop now. So we look at Cavic, third position. Walden just ahead. So the Sharons starting to show their hand. They've done three pit stops as well so far. Back in fourth position, we saw Brandon Ian race in the monochrome GT4 Australia races over the weekend, betting in that new M4 for the 2023 Sprint Series that starts later this year as part of Shannon Speed Series. Yeah, they've been getting a lot of lot of laps uh, around here, which is, you know, I think we've really seen the benefits of that. Different tyres, so it's not exactly plug and play between the two cars, no. but still there's a lot they can take away from that. Walden comes in to pit lane. So that's from second position. So this will be their fourth pit stop. Garth is a canny, canny operator. GWR, a very good racing team. And they've got some smart brains looking after these cars down there. And I wonder if this could be a brilliantly timed pit stop because the 77 B-Dub is off the road and well and truly stuck at McPhillamy Park. It's a bit like the pit stop of uh, Anthony Sewell that came in. They, they managed to time that perfectly. It seems like a bit of a, a similar luck. So they were limping already and they've just driven straight off the road. There's been contact with the wall. Maybe that's happened at the top, past the grate, or maybe on the run to McPhillamy Park. So again, safety car comes out. If Richard Crowell can't pick this race right now, we're doomed. <laughs> oh, it's no. one of those days. Oh, mate, I have absolutely no <laughs> idea what's going on. You pick this nine and a half times out of ten. And now throws another spanner in the works. So Ryder Quinn, who just started to ease away from the field by five seconds. They've only done that one pit stop in the local Legends Mustang. Grant Denyer was part of that team earlier today, was up here in the commentary position. So just confirming it was Patrick Navin behind the wheel of the Volkswagen Scirocco that had pulled to a stop at the top of the mountain. Car 77, Lola MPRS and AED group, the sponsors on that car. Nathan Halstead, the second driver, so unfortunately well and truly out of the race. And I agree with you that I think there was contact a little bit further back. The right mirror was the telltale sign. Doesn't have to take much, does it, around here? It to be all bad. I think the thing with these production cars as well, we've seen so many donor cars and so many things be repaired to uh, get back get back um, out there. But they, because they are production cars, they're not designed to be worked on quickly. So they often, it can be repaired, but it often takes a bit longer. Or hit walls, for that example <laughs> up there. So safety cars back out. Let's go to pit lane. Here's Chris Stubbs. Yeah, really good opportunity to check in here with Daryl Henderson, who's uh, racing alongside his grandson. Sorry, Daryl Leslight, who's with racing with his son, uh, Henderson Leslight. Um, because we've got something to present to you because your car looks awesome. So we have a check here from Super Cheap Auto for our best presented team in your class D. And in your hand there is the $500 gift voucher for Super Cheap Auto. Daryl, how do you react to that? <laughs> well, you, you can hear the family in the background. That's great. Thanks very much, Super Chief. That's yeah, really appreciated. It, we're, we're having a ball. Oh, I think we can tell you're having a ball because the whole crew over the back have just erupted with applause. And how's Henderson going out there at 16 years of age and on his learners? He's really, he's, he's really enjoying it. Um, yeah, it hasn't got his uh, his P's yet for his public <laughs> public license, but yeah, he, he's having a ball. We're, we're both having a ball. Oh, we'd love to see it. Congratulations. It's spend it well, 500 bucks courtesy of Super Cheap Auto. Can, can I say, um, you know, thank you to everybody and, and especially uh, uh, PB Motorsport, the, the Phil and Ann, they're just amazing and they, they put all of this together. But it, it's been a wonderful experience. Thanks very And thanks very much to Super Cheap. Well done, Daryl. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. So from the awesome. cheers of next door, we can actually hear them. Uh, class B2, super cheap auto, best presented. I've got driver, Mike, and team owner, Tony. Well done, gents. Uh, best presented for Class B2. More cheers in the background from the uh, from the happy folks. Uh, gents, well done. Thank you very much. You know, it comes as, as a bit of a surprise. Um, didn't expect anything like this. Um, you know, the car is always pretty well presented, but um, to get an award is something special. Well, not only an award and a nice uh, big novelty check, but actually 500 of the best 
for you guys to spend at Super Cheap Auto. Hopefully you don't need any uh, parts quickly, but that's not a bad kicker either. That's an absolutely fantastic kicker, and it's an a absolute credit to Tony and the team in their uh, car presentation. I'm sure uh, you have a lot of people to thank to help you get here and run the weekend, if there's anyone you'd like to throw to. Yeah, look, look. I've come up here with a small team this year and, um, you know, they've done a fantastic job about our ups and downs, but, you know, they've all pulled together and the car looks great. And, I um, mean, we've got, got our little, like I said, we had our little issues, but we're back on track and we're going really well. Excellent. And the day from a driving point of view, uh, on track, not going too badly either. Uh, car's looking fantastic. The team are doing a great job. Um, Justin's out there now and uh, circulating well. I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of the afternoon. I'm sure to give him a kick knowing that he's got 500 to, uh, to spend towards when he comes back in. So, uh, well on Jen, Super Cheap Auto, best presenter for Class B2. Nice work, Josh, down in the pits. Uh, we've got a Good decibel boys, metre you. award as well for the biggest <laughs> crew cheering down there. There's a lot of noise down the garage, and rightly so. A lot of guys and girls have, have burnt the midnight oil, not just this weekend, but the entire 12 months to get to the high-tech oils bath of six hour, and they're rewarded with thanks to Super Cheap Auto. Yeah, and how good of, of Super Cheap Auto to, uh, to be supporting all levels of motorsport from yeah. grassroots right up to the top. So that, that'll definitely go, go a long way. Some more pit stops underway. I was just about to make the point that I was a little bit worried that the local legends Mustang hadn't yet been back into the pit lane, but they're back in the pit lane right now. So Ryder Quinn will jump out of that car and looks like Tony will jump in. So they'll tick off their second compulsory pit stop. This is Adam Burgess jumping out of the number four car, Anthony Saul and Anton Di Pasquale, to drive that for the remainder of the race. As we approach the halfway mark. So they're going to get another box as well. It looks like they've got a little bit of a, a data download going on there as well. <laughs> How's the, the extension on that cable too? It's a USB cord. Clever. And there's the pit stop underway for the local Legends team. So this will be a crucial stop. Team just working to get TQ or Bolton in. Drink straw will be plugged in and stay hydrated throughout this race. And even though it's <laughs> cold outside, it still get quite warm in these cars. Just check the weather a few seconds ago. 12 degrees on our screen. Does the, not feel like 12. It feels like four. Well, that, that four degrees. Most. It was three oh. at the start, so it hasn't really changed, has it? It is incredible. Hope you're nice and warm if you're watching us on Stan Sport here today. The only place you can capture the high tech oils bath of six hour live and ad break free is the local Legends car makes it back out onto the track, puts two Class X cars back into the lead. Cavage behind the wheel of the yellow 92 that Tom Randall. Drove earlier today. They've done three stops. So too the Sharon Rentals BMW that runs in second now. And how's Tony's form been all, all weekend in the, in the GT4? Yeah. He was sort of saying when I spoke to him on Thursday before the race that he was just here to have fun. And, uh, yeah, next minute he's, he's out there uh, bombing it. Yeah, but you race car drivers, Molly. Come on. <laughs> yeah. We're not buying Oh, no, we're just here to have fun. We're just here to have fun. Oh, I need to find half a ten. Yeah. Why can't I go quicker? It's funny, isn't it? You know, yeah, even if you have the, you know, whatever intentions you think you have when you hop behind the wheel and you start up, suddenly, you know, something <laughs> oh, something right. happens, something mystery, mystery uh, happens behind there and it's, uh, yeah, you just got to send it. This is why we're under our fifth safety car for the race so far. It was the Volkswagen Scirocco are parked at the top of the hill and we understand contact a little bit earlier around at the metal grate or potentially a little bit further has caused this safety car. So the Ford Ranger recovery, the V6 powered Ford Ranger is parked up in our Bathurst recovery, Bathurst towing crew there as well. There's also a good chance to retrieve the number 28 BMW that went down the escape road at Murray's. It's been towed back into the pits. Reports of a clutch drama with that car and then slipping brake caliper or sticky brake caliper in this case there it is being towed back into the pits of the day might not be done just yet but the smoke coming from that car might tell a different story the other one notes that we've just had an update on is the number 40 bmw m4 which is the speed cafe car being driven by carl beck david russell and robert Gurley. they've had a shocker so far this weekend they've had fuel pressure issues all the way out Dave Russell has got that car shown in 25th at the moment, but I've just been told that it was stopped at the top of the hill for about 30 seconds for a full reset, it seemed, <laughs> from the outside looking in. So they've had some more dramas there. Gee, if anyone could drag a car up through the field, it'll be Davey Russell. He's, he loves a challenge. He does. <laughs> yeah, that's a very, very big challenge. But Dave, it really is. Sometimes it's that just control alt delete mm. that, that does the trick. It's me and my computer most of the time. <laughs> as we jump on board with the Harding Performance 222 Volkswagen. They've been flying under the radar a little bit today and it's Sarkis behind the wheel and they're up to 14th 
place, actually. So they started outside the top 30. That this was 30th, been a, yeah. Yeah, really consistent run from this car. Very, very well presented race car to the new livery for this year. So had a bit of sunshine today, a bit of a cloud cover starting to make its presence felt here at Mount Panorama. We'll polluted with that on, when, on Friday for first practice, won't we? of a shower during yesterday, particularly in that XL race late in the afternoon, but so far we've had no wet stuff falling from the skies. It's probably cold enough to snow out there, if anything, as more cars make their way into the pits. We'll do the same here, Stubbsy. Thank you with Ian Salteri, one of our leading A1 competitors. Ian, you're just all casually dressed. You're just waiting to the finish, right, to get in for the last stint. How's it going? Yeah, good. We um, we had Jim Musil in the car for the first stint. He was really fast. Um, we started P30 outright, and I think we're up to about P14 at the moment. Uh, we've done three of our four CPSs, so we're in really good shape. Um, we really only have to stop once a for fuel, and I'll jump into the car at that point and, and love it. You guys love this stint, don't you? We really do. I mean, you know, we've we've had a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. We've uh, we've blown two gearboxes in our five years of coming coming here, but um, the car's working really well this weekend. So yeah, we just uh, hopefully I can uh, jump in in about an hour and a half's time and, and do the final two hours home. And what's a good result for you from this position? Um, we loved what we're trying to do is really stay on the lead lap here. Um, we're, we're there still there at the moment, um, so hopefully a bit of strategy keeps us there. And I think we're P4 in, in A1 at the moment, which is which is huge for us. We're up against a, a lot of faster cars, so a bit of clever strategy and uh, hopefully um, top three in A1 would be great. Ian, thanks for your time. We hope we see you on the podium for your class at the end of the day. Perfect. Thanks so much. Still 24 cars on the lead lap of this race, which is at this point of the day amazing and all helped by the number of safety cars. So it bodes well for a flying finish. Yeah, they've had a, a really good day. So the Cabbage car leads the race now. And uh, we were posing the question before about Team Barguana and, and their pit stops. Uh, I've heard from the Minister for Enthusiasm as to how good is this Jason himself. <laughs> and he says they've completed three compulsory pit stops on the Burson Audi TTRS. So they're 20th. So they've only got one compulsory stop to go at any point in the next three hours and 25 minutes. So that puts them in a really good position. So while they don't have track position right now, they've got some strategic flexibility to take a, a pit stop when they can deliver it. So I like that and leave it to Jason to play a nice canny strategic game at this place. Also, uh, Garth Walden as well, their, their crew, uh, they've got four, they've done four pit stops as well. So a little bit further back, but they, uh, they've got a bit more flexibility from their end as well, which will be interesting to see play out. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually, and, and I'm not surprised that that team's done something a little bit creative from a pit stop point of view, too. That's the car that finished second here last year. Tim Slade driving right at the end was that's right. uh, aggressively passed by uh, Cameron Hill at the top of the mountain. Chris Stubbs was in the middle of a very nice pit lane report at the time <laughs> and got rudely interrupted by some on-track action. And uh, Brad Carr, who was partnering with Tim Slade, is also he's here wandering around oh, the pits uh, this, this weekend, so... I think it, it must be tough for him to, to stand by and watch would not be behind the wheel, particularly, as you said, after that, that amazing fight and result last year. So Tyler Everingham shown back behind the wheel of car number 24, and they're in 18th position. But as you said, Molly, they've got a pit stop up their sleeve relative to some of their Class X rivals. Remembering they've got to make six stops, the Class X cars. So they need to spend two times 90 seconds, Nolts, in pit lane more than the A1 cars. And I'll tell you what, if we keep getting these safety cars, that is absolutely going to keep the A1 and A2 cars right in, in this mix. race yeah. for outright contention. It's a lap and a half worth of pit stops. They've got a... Totally. Yeah. They're third and fourth, it's Hobson and McGill. Could it be enough to dare to dream for JB? Another victory. It could be the final year. Can they safety car... About to pull in. No, can you imagine if Aaron McGill wins the race outright? Can you the celebration? We won't be going home tomorrow, that's for sure. We'll go for months. <laughs> It'll be cool. But Long I, way to go. I genuinely think all results are on the table at the moment with this race. It is as wide open as it's ever been. And this rush of safety cars early on in the first half has just kept things very, very open and unpredictable, and there's still a lot to play out. So we're back underway. Three hours and just over 20 minutes remaining in the high-tech oils Bathurst six hour and it's Ben Cabbage who leads the field back to green but I don't think it'll be for long because Grant Sharon is going to go down the inside and take the race lead away from 
the similar BMW. So the Sharon's now lead for the first time today. There is the go-karts go BMW as well. Remember that pitted prior to that last safety car period. Dropped right down the field outside the top 20. But now charging their way back up into the mix as well. They've also done four stops, although one of those stops that won't count. Is that right? No. It's still a question mark. For, next is to that the, the yeah. Russells? Yeah, yes. correct. No, that is correct. So I think they're only on three. Half a second, wasn't it, the difference? Yep. It's a whoops, oh. little one percenter like that. But the way the safety cars have fallen, they're, they're okay. Like they're fine. It didn't cost them as much as it could have. If we had a long, drawn-out green flag period, which I think we'd like to see now, um, it would have cost them more. But the safety cars, the way they've fallen, have really helped those guys. It's not the, the simplest thing. You've got to, you know, time how long it's going to take you to drive through the pit lane, plus then how much time you've got to stop. And, and a lot of this is just done by a hand stopwatch. It's not, there's nothing sort of... I mean, obviously, they're electronically measuring it from a race control point of view, but from the teams, you know, they've got a stopwatch standing out there and it, you know, it, it doesn't take much to be half a second early or late and you don't want to, you want to allow a bit of caution, but if you allow too much, you know, then you're just losing time and track position. So it's not super straightforward as it would seem. Yeah, so it's a 90 second compulsory pit stop. It takes 32 seconds to transit pit lane from line in to line out, but then there's slowing to pull into the box. There's accelerating away from the box. Mm. And then there's the stationary time as well. So the, all these things have to be factored in. This is a good battle for the lead. Ben Cavage hasn't let Grant Sharon go here. The little M2, very handy across the top of Mount Panorama. The M4 will have the legs down the straight. Brett Hobson is holding on to them in third position in the A45 as well. As we watch Orange's finest, Tim Lay, Blaze past Aaron McGill and Carter number 23. First chance we've had to see him all day. Tim Lay, one of the great characters of Australian motorsport. Running back there in fifth ahead of Hodges. Campbell in the Lancer. Evo 10 is next. They're regulars here at the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. It's the Ranger entry McGill. Fourth spot right now on the racetrack. So yeah, Hobson is hanging on to the guys ahead here. Leading Class A1, the Ram Motorsport entry, sharing with Mike Sheargold and Dylan O'Keefe once again. Yeah, this is a big drive from Brett. Hanging on to them, fastly experienced in GT racing. I, I've got a bit of a... I reckon I'll put a bit of money on them making the podium. Ah, OK. Outright? Yeah, why okay. not? Yeah. No, I'm fully on board with that as a, as a thing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's a great team. <laughs> They've won their class. Got to support the all-wheel drives, don't you? Well, you do, and it's it's not going to be a Subaru, Molly, so you've got <laughs> yeah. to pick the next best thing, right? Exactly. <laughs> we'll keep it in the somewhat family. Yeah, so they won in 2021 and 2022. So it was Mike Sheargold and Brett Hobson in 21 with Ollie Shannon co-driving as we jump on board the Barguana machine. And then Mike Sheargold and Dylan O'Keefe on their own last year, so Hobson's come back. Dirty screen. There might have been a car in front trailing some oil or some fluid. It's certainly not raining. We can pull no. that out. Chris Stubbs, all from the lane. Yeah, well, while we're talking about the Barguanas and seeing some vision of the little five-cylinder Audi TT ripping around the mountain, I thought we'd grab a man who's ripped around the mountain and won here back in 2000, the 1000. Jason Barguana, how's it all coming together with a strategy for you guys? Yeah, look, the boys are doing a really good job. I mean, it's... um. It's a bit of a struggle, that little Audi. It doesn't like the straight line very much. It's very fast across the top. It's probably one of the top five cars in terms of lap speed. At the start of the race, Jude struggles a bit because the big V8s just pounce us and then we struggle, get stuck behind them. But we, so we dropped a few spots. Um, but the strategy's worked out all right. We're actually sitting pretty good there. We've lost vacuum with the, uh, a little bit of vacuum, so the brake pedal's gone a bit hard. So we said the boys are just going to have to harden up here and, uh, and get on with it. But where we sit right now... We're just working out. We're pretty close to one stop from the end if we get a few more safety cars. So yeah, the, the thing will probably get out to about a, an hour 40 on a tank of fuel with a bit of safety car and a bit of fuel saving. So it's probably working out our, in our favour at the moment. How proud are you having been your son there and you've got Jude, your nephew there, and, of course, you've got your dad is here and your uncle is here. Everyone's here. They're all here. I mean, the, the family grew up in Orange and Cowra and Young, so I think there's more cousins come across as well. So there's about 38 Barguanas <laughs> floating around the place, so it's very exciting. About 38 too many, Chase. We'll leave you there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a little update. 
Now, this is the Speed Cafe, the BMW that we've seen. Uh, it's been in the garage now for quite some time. Another one of these cars with a fuel pressure uh, issue. So that's huge disappointment for Beg, Russell and Ghoul in the speedcafe.com entry. They have just been put through the ring of that squad all weekend. And how's uh, Stubbsy's shout out to the five cylinder as well? <laughs> they, they are awesome, sound fantastic. We actually have a little tradition in our family whenever we hear a V10. You don't go, oh, that was a V10 going past. You go, oh, two quattros. Oh, nice. Um, so, yeah, we're, it's a big... Uh, two quattros. <laughs> two, so two quattros. It, it, the, the, it just, there's something that sounds kind of wrong, but so good about a five-cylinder. Yeah. So does the does the rally love with the quattro overrule the Subaru love, or is it like oh, even? Oh, you're or? putting me in a tough position. I am. I mean, the two... You know, two different eras, so I think we can get away with loving Very good both answer. of them. Very good. Um, so I'll leave it there. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're talking about engine notes, the Boxer engine note as well. That's very iconic. unique and iconic, isn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> that's a good answer. That is outstanding. You got yourself out of that one really well. Really good Thank digging. You. <laughs> Just only sweating slightly. If it was a bit, uh, it was a bit warmer, I would be. Oh, that's outstanding. <laughs> I love it. As we uh, pick up this leading battle, so that was Aaron McGill just dropping another spot on the run up to the cutting. Oh, I just, I hate hearing that squeal of tyres on the run up through the kink, and you don't know what's going to come out the other side. Fortunately, everyone has. So Grant Sherrin's now leading the race. Ben Cabbage running with him, and Tim Lay catching them all at the moment. So the leader's all starting to condense. Stubbs chatting there before about the speedcafe.com entry here and we've got Carl Beck alongside me. Carl, the fuel pressure issue, talk us through it. When did it rear its ugly head? Yeah, look, we've been having issues uh, from Saturday morning onwards, so um, put a new fuel pump in it, rerouted some fuel lines, bits and pieces, but uh, yeah, for some reason it's it's fine and it's fast and then it just starts, uh, starts dropping off, so the boys are trying something at the moment, but uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be a couple laps down, so we'll, uh, yeah, we'll do our best, but we can hear how deflated you are, but in your other categories this weekend, you've had a bit of fun. You've been one of the busiest men at the mountain. You've got the GT4 hat on at the moment. How have you found that competition? Yeah, the GT4 is an awesome car and, and hoping for um, yeah, a few more competitors to come along. We should have sort of seven or eight at Phillip Island and then we can continue to grow that category through the year um, and moving to our own, our own field next year. So it should be good. But, uh, yeah, awesome car to drive. It just does what it's told and you don't have these issues. So... And of course, lots of people tuning into speedcafe.com to get all the updates across the weekend. And you, you can see it, of course, on speedcafe.com, speedseries.com too. But that's keeping you busy, that side of the business. Yeah, it is. It's been, a, it's been an interesting journey, the, the Speed Cafe thing. So, yeah, I, I, learning learning journalism and, and understanding. It's not that hard. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one, but uh, yeah, no, we've got a, f f a lot going on. We're uh, launching into the US later in the year and just released a new app and, you know, get pushing through it, so it's good. Outstanding. We appreciate all your support in motorsport and the more stories, the better, Carl. Good on you. Thank you, Thank you mate. Tom. Two race wins for Carl Begg this weekend in Monochrome GT4 Australia, making its solo debut. Not a championship round this weekend, but certainly as the Speed Series unfolds this year, they'll attract more and more cars as the McGill car comes into a bit sorry the Lillis car comes into pit lane now Sharon still leads the race by one second as we try to work out some sort of pattern on how this race will go into the second half with three hours and 12 minutes remaining in this year's edition of the high tech oils Bathurst six hour do you know the one thing that Jason Bargwana forgot to mention in that great chat he had and stuff here before how good is this no it's Ben Bargwana's birthday <laughs> Kept that under wraps. Twenty yeah, second birthday today for young Ben. So what a good way to speak. What a birth. present, yeah. Amazing. And a big uh, couple of weeks coming up for for Ben as well. He's about to head overseas to do the uh, TCR World Tour around in, in Portugal. So I was just chatting to him about that. I think he arrives on like the Monday, and they're testing the day after or, or the day after that. So he's got a a big a big week ahead, a big opportunity as well. Good way to rub the jet lag away, wouldn't it? Just jump, <laughs> you, I mean, you would know all about well, this. We, we were chatting about that. I, you know, we're sort of, you know, kind of, what, what tips do you have? And it was basically, you know, you're going to feel rubbish and then the adrenaline will kick in yep. and um, you'll, you'll be right and then sleep a lot lot afterwards. But for days. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, adrenaline and uh, the red mist do uh, wonderful things. The red mist. <laughs> it looks like you need some of that in extreme, eh, by the way, I think. But uh, Yeah, it's wild.
it's wild. When, when is your next round, by the way? Just let the viewer know. Uh, so it's, it's actually the same weekend as Phillip Island TCR, so early May did in you, Scotland. You negotiated yourself out of that round, did you? Uh, well, it's a shame. It's a shame yeah. not to be there, but, you know, I, I would rather be driving myself, so I'm not too disappointed. But, um, you know, I'll be following on. I'll, I'll try and I'll see if I can FaceTime you while you're on air and I like uh, that. see what happens. No, I think the live cross <laughs> needs to happen We can make that point. happen. How do you cope with the jet lag? I mean, it's a serious issue when you do travel. I mean, I've done it for work over in the USA, for example, but when you go away racing, how do you adapt to it? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's tough. Um, you know, there is... You know, there's no sort of quick quick fix, I guess. Uh, you know, I take some melatonin and, and try and get as much sleep on a plane and, you know, try and set up some things like this. But So you, you, there is going to be a couple of days where you do just feel tired and I think it's a case of if you can arrive a few days earlier, I try to, yeah. it's just so you can be on the ball. But, yeah, other than that, it's just adrenaline kicks in and you know and totally worth it and totally worth it so uh, yeah it, it does it does muck you around though it, it does it does get to a point where you do sort of need to just allow particularly on the way back home some some more time for rest and recovery so you can you can sustain those those types of treatments but uh, what's your what's your trips or tip tips adrenaline it's just adrenaline <laughs> <laughs> Nolte gets out and he goes for a run half marathon here I, or there. I would say yeah, I could, yeah. a nice gentle stroll when you drive the destination because you, yep. you sit on a plane for so long um, we don't get the luxury that. of business class or anything. We're at the back of the plane <laughs> usually sharing a seat with two people. This is Jake Camilleri, Class C leader in the Grand Prix Mazda entry heading up Conrod Strait. Uh, sorry, at Mountain Strait here. Moved on from that very quickly. No, it's nice <laughs> work. This is the, these guys have done an awesome job this weekend. Uh, qualified on pole Second quickest time in Class C history at Mount Panorama, and they're leading the way in their category, and it's been a really good job for the Grand Prix Mazda team from Caboolture up there in sunny Queensland. Josh Buchan. Well, hi, guys. I actually am here with Jake Cavalieri, uh, leading Class C at the moment in your Mazda 3 MPS. Now, I've driven one of them on the road. A bit of a talk steer weapon. Uh, <laughs> how is it out on the track? Yeah, yeah, it's going really well. Um, yeah, it's definitely a little uh, talk steer um, when you get on those strolls, especially on these tyres. But no, it's it's all going to plan. Um, Scott's doing an awesome job. We just got to, he's just got to hit the the target every single lap. Um, yeah, it's a bit more down to strategy now because we just got some, we got good pace. So yeah, cross our fingers that um, it just keeps going on the way it is. So are you kind of driving to a number a little bit out there at the moment? Are you pacing yourselves, or is it just play it by ear? Yeah, well, it's, a, it's an awesome car. I've done so many laps in it that um, actually it's qualifying lap as it's race. It, it's just so consistent. And it's, a, it's just an awesome car. So, it, it yeah, we know what it's going to do. And, um, yeah, hopefully um, we, we take the win. As a driver, it's nice just quality laps for a six-hour race. That's pretty uh, pretty cool. You're going to jump in for the final stint and bring it home? Yeah, Scott's going to do like a double now, and then I'll jump in at the end there and... Yeah, and all our um, CPS should be done right on schedule, and yeah. Excellent. Best of luck. We'll be cheering for you. Thanks, Thank you. He's a hell of a driver, Jack Camilleri, massively underrated, and he's driven that car for a long time. This is not a great story because the Osborne Motorsport team started with two really nice Renaults. They picked up the Super Cheap Auto Best Presented Team Award for Class C, but right now they've got none in the race. Car 13. Now the fire bomb and some fire extinguishers gone off on that car, and they've gone into the lane. It was awesome to watch Jay Robotham qualify this car yesterday, and he was so so fast, almost got pole position. It's as quick as the Megans ever gone around Mount Panorama, but unfortunately their day appears to have come to an end. And it was Jay behind the wheel now behind the wall in the garage. He started 35th in today's race as well, but we're just starting to see him fall away a bit now. We were fairly clean for the first hour of racing today, but guys, we're starting to see those gremlins sneak into the machinery out there. It's a sunburst out here once again at Bathurst. And that, that is the skill of driving these cars, isn't it? You want to go out there and drive as hard as you can. We know the tyres are pretty hardy so the tyre management isn't you know as much of an issue as it might be yeah. with some other brands but yeah you've still got to find that balance between looking after the car and and sometimes that can be a difficult a difficult game to play when you're used to driving you know more highly tuned race cars as so we've yeah, seen seen that and then before as we've spoken about it about these teams not necessarily getting out of these in these cars as regularly as well to test and, and find all these gremlins 
across the mountain we go once again. Car 49 on the surviving Mustangs. Of course, just joined our coverage. The Ambrose Medici and Tim Brookcar out of this race after leading earlier today with a broken gearbox. They were looking so strong up until that point. But right now, it's Class X, one through six here at Mount Panorama. We jump back in board with car 23, our pole sitters from today's race. Well, this is for the race lead, Nolt. So Tim Lay has got by Ben Cavich. And there is Ben just in the back. So these three BMWs all locked together. M4, M3, M2. <laughs> Line them all up for us nicely. So Tim Lay, who just was biding his time getting to the back of the Cavich car, has now got to their old rivals, the Sharons. These guys have had some awesome battles here over the past, these two teams. They're the peak two squads in production car racing in this part of the world, at least in the six-hour era, if not before it. Both, uh, both six-hour winners. Yep. yep. Correct, in consecutive years, and they've had some great battles before that as well. Is this the first singles, maybe, maybe Krause, of what we're going to see later today? We're starting to see a pattern building here. Well, I think so, and imagine Will Davison in car 23 and Tom Randall in 92 behind it, and then you throw an Anton Di Pasquale or a, a Tyler Everingham into that mix as well. I think that's what that final stint is going to build to. So these three cars have all completed three of their six compulsory stops. So it's basically 45 minutes now, because you want to get to within that final hour, make your final stop, and then race to the finish, having ticked that box. Bearing in mind, you need to complete all of your compulsory stops before the final half an hour of the race. And we saw the pace of that M2 last year. Uh, so do you think we spoke to Thomas Randall over the weekend and doing it? You know, an amazing driver, and he was saying how first time in a production car, he um, yeah was just getting used to it. So do we think we'll see him get more and more uh, up to speed and a really big challenge in the end? Yeah, I do. It's um, yeah, and he's got more laps, and he drove a really smart, intelligent race early on. So he'll build up to it. Just go back and have a look at our class lead, uh, D leader briefly. The uh, Class that's never been lost by a Toyota in this race in six years. A Toyota 86 has won the race. And there'd be an argument that if it's a Subaru BRZ <laughs> that comes through at the end, whether it's, is it the same car or different? Look, I don't want to play favourites. But, but you're going to say uh, it's a Subaru. You know, it's, it's the wrong colour. But, uh, you know, I mean, they are a great car. 86 BRZ, uh, great fun to drive on the road and a great, great race package for this kind of uh, production racing. And this is Lone Star 11 Racing. Murray Dowse at Mitch Madron and Lachlan Bloxham, uh, Porsche Sprint Challenge racer, who have done a great job. They qualified on pole position and they've done a really nice job all day. Chris Stubbs. Richard Cryer, we just saw the fire down here. It was the Super Chief Auto Best presented team earlier, but as you mentioned, it doesn't quite look as shiny at the moment. Jay Robotham's alongside me. You've just uh, hopped out of the car. What happened down here? Uh, yeah, so I just come in for a driver sh uh, driver swap, and um, I think the fuel's just leaked underneath and got in the exhaust, and yeah, just caught fire. But um, we're having a bit of trouble, you know, the cylinders are dropping in and out, so um, yeah, we just, you know, one of them days. So a bit of a tough old day, but that's the mountain, isn't it? You've still loved this event, haven't you? Yeah, it's been good, you know. Uh, it's a, it's a laid-back event. Um, everyone's here to have fun, and, you know, these things happen, but um, at the end of the day, you know, it's, uh, it's been a good weekend. Well, the good news is, as we speak, the car is just rolling back out. So you're, you're still out there. You might get a few more laps yet. Yeah, I think the boys just changed the coil pack. So, um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully we... Good job. Must. Thanks, mate. Cheers. The Shane Best presented board this year. They're back in the pits. As we approach three hours remaining, blink just like that. The race halfway over here at Mount Panorama. BMW still one, two, three and four. The first three covered by just two and a half seconds. So they worked their way out of Forest Elbow and worked their way down to Conrod once again. 55 laps into the race. Here today, Tim Lay now behind the wheel of car number 23. Barry Linton started the car today from pole position. Did a stint during the monochrome GT4 Australia event as well. Starting to get that feeling though. This is where it'll be come 5.45 as they come up to one of the lap cars caught your attention it does it just throws another element when you're having those battles and and you know there's been some great great uh, respect among all different different classes but it still takes a bit of time you're not getting a perfect pass 
So they're coming around to complete the 55th lap of this race. And we chalk up the halfway mark. And what's been a cold but exciting day here at Mount Panorama, the High Tech Oils Bath the six hour. It started just after 11.45 with an aborted start. After the first time in history here at Bathurst, we've sent them around for another lap. Well, there might have been smiles at the start of the day. There's been a lot of heartbreak as well as we take a look at the Super Cheap Auto race highlights of how it looked when the lights went out for the second time. The BMWs let us down. Uh, pole position converted this into the first lap lead as they made their way through turn number one. This was the 86 finding the wall down there and almost collecting Anthony Saul's BMW early in the race. This was Jason Gomesaw locking the rears off the track. They had dramas with this car. That's been towed back into the pit. So not the greatest debut for the Gomesaw Motorsport team. This was Russell taking Marcus Ambrose for the lead of the race in the overcast conditions. In the background, the Subaru finding the tyre wall at the background. Car 66 going back on the tilt tray. One of a handful of cars so far. This has been the big story so far. The Ambrose, Beedeke and Brook car. Tim Brook getting out for one lap and bringing that car back into the garage. Their day is done. Then we cleansed the field. The BMWs went back to the front. And before we got to turn number one, there was a change of the lead with the Sharons going into P1 in the Sharon Rentals BMW. Cavish dropping back into second spot. This is how I'm looking so far coming into the three-hour mark of this race. We'll take a look at how it looks so far. On your high-tech oils leaderboard, Class X cars right through the top 10 right now. Of course, Sheargold, O'Keefe and Hobson leading Class A1. And of course, Chris Delsma back behind the wheel with Ryan Kasher and Rylan Gray, the sole Mustang inside the top 10. Rylan Gray starting that car today. Kasher winning the XL race earlier today, just the outside the top 10 right now, the Saul Burgess and Di Pasquale car. Eight classes making up this year's High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. And the Sharon's leading on a class X, but out right at the moment. Sheer Gold O'Keefe and Hobson leading class A1. Delsma, Kasher and Gray in A2. Down to class E, headed by Alexander, Dory and Fowler down there in the Mazda 3. So that's how it looks as we've blown the halftime siren into the second half of this year's High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour here at Mount Panorama. Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it, Nolts? And what a day it's been so far. A brutal Bathurst Enduro, lots of safety cars, some green flag running now, and a new race leader, Tim Lay from Orange, just up the road, assumes the lead in the number 23 BMW. So this car's been here a couple of times today. Berwick Linton led the way from pole position, surrendered the lead nice and early, and then uh, They've worked their way back through, but they've ticked off three of their compulsory stops. And this was how the pass worked. So down the inside, nice move on Sharon's. And Cabbage just trying to sneak through there as well in car 92, and he's still running very, very close to Grant Sharon's car. As we go back and find the Class B1 Holman Commodore across the top of Mount Panorama. So Lay, 1.2 seconds to the good. Cavage still hassling Sharon. Aaron Russell up to third. Tony D'Alberto now running fifth in the big HSV and going along really nicely here in Dwayne West, Class X car. And this green flag running's allowed the Class X cars to cycle their way back to the front of the field. A lot of them out of position early, given all of those safety cars and the varying pit stop strategies. So Tyler Everingham up to six now in car 24 for Garth Alden Racing. And that car has been a really under the radar performer today. Hodges in car 21 next. Brett Hobson still leads the way in A1. Ryan Kasher leads the way in A2. And they're inside the top 10. And uh, Adam Burgess, it is in car number four that he shares with Anton Di Pasquale. And Anthony still rounds out the 10. So that's the leaderboard as we work into the second half of the race. And while we're happy to have him here in the commentary box, we're disappointed that he's out of the race. But been a great member of the Stan Sport team this weekend. It's a, a good afternoon for us. And welcome to the commentary box to Marcus Ambrose. Yes, it's not exactly how I wanted the afternoon to go, but I must say we went out in a blaze of glory. The <laughs> Mustang was really fast. I was having a lot of fun out there. Um, we did know that that 10-speed uh, automatic gearbox 
you know, was a, was a challenge and it proved to be our demise. And it was a gamble, wasn't it? A better ratio spread for this track. It was a bit of a roll of the dice thing. Unfortunately, didn't quite work, but, but worth having that adventure and trying to find out if it worked. Yeah, look, there's been a few guys that have tried it and, and we're one of them. Mm. Um, it just didn't didn't play out. Obviously, we, we've had a mechanical failure there somewhere. It just spun the clutch plates up in the in the gearbox. So uh, the, our day's done, absolutely done. Like there's no coming back from that. But uh, we thought it was going to be better up the hill, and we thought it was going to be better, you know, straight line speed compared to the uh, the manual Mustangs. But out there on the track, you know, my eye it actually it, it hurt us a little bit because it's a bit slow to change gears, and it was a bit of a challenge to get them down the gears to get ready for the corner entries. Um, and so I'm not sure there was an advantage at all, really, to run the 10 speed as it worked out. But uh, the car was so fast across the top, and those MRF tyres, they haven't got a lot of lateral grip, but geez, they're fun to drive on. <laughs> and I was just, um, you know, I've been in retirement for eight years, and then they put me into a double stint to start the day. Yeah. Uh, and I just got really comfortable out there. I was really pushing across the top, and the brakes were great. The Mustang handles beautifully. Um, we're probably going to come back next year with a manual gearbox, I reckon. <laughs> Marcus, did you love it? Chris Stubbs joining you in commentary, by the way. I'll do my own intro there. Thank you. No, that's all right. <laughs> You've got this. You've been taken over by Tasmanians here, <laughs> two side by side. What a joy it is for me on a personal note to be alongside Marcus in the commentary box. But did you love it? Is it back, the, the, the feast? Uh, the, have you fed the beast that is being a, a racing car driver uh, again? Look, my kids have never really seen me drive a race car in their memory. I mean, they're eight and nine, and then so... You know, at that age, the kids don't remember too much. And so I just wanted to do a race with them here, yeah. you know, to enjoy it. So Sonia, my wife, and the two girls have been here with me this weekend. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I enjoy staying current. I mean, it's good to drive a contemporary car and these MRF tyres and just see what it's all about. So that's good because I'm also a driver coach for GRM as well. So it's good to sort of stay relevant. Um, I, I don't know, I might do it the odd race or two as long as I enjoy it. I mean, I don't need to do it any longer. Um, as a career, I just want to do it for fun. Let's go down to the lane. Here's Josh Bucket. Well, Marcus, feel free to stay away from TCR. We don't want any more big names <laughs> coming and uh, taking us off our perch. But um, speaking of perch, Mitch Madrin, you're uh, in the lead of Class D at the moment in your brand new built Toyota 86. How's uh, how's the afternoon playing out? Yeah, it's going really, really well. Um, couldn't really be better at this moment. Um, you know, the start of the race, just try to keep the your nose clean and you know stay out of um, harm's way and then you know push really hard from there on and we've got a really healthy lead at the moment so and the car's handling really well so i'm really happy with it that's fantastic and you obviously started the race could put you guys into a good position uh, i can see someone else is suited up uh, you, you're not what's the plan now in the back half for the race now that we've only got halfway to go yeah so um Lockie's just about to hop in the car he's going to do a good stint in that um, we're not probably go and um, once Lockie's done, I'll probably hop back in the car and you know we might do it even an extra stop and put Lockie back in afterwards. We'll just see how the race plays out from there. Yeah, okay. Best of luck and uh, we'll be cheering you on. Cheers. Awesome. Great to have Josh Bucket with us. Here's the Lone Star entry. This is number 11. Fantastic little organisation. This really enjoying the work that they've done. Queensland based, supporting young drivers, which is what this event is about. In large, on the walk up to the commentary box, it's like a crash in one of the corporate suites here. There were kids running around everywhere, having a great time. And where else would you rather be? On that note, shout out to my young son Lloyd, who's actually in a hospital bed in Albury at the moment, having cracked his head open on a uh, bird bath at the uh, caravan park. So rest up, young son. But uh, certainly enjoying what uh, we're seeing here on our stand sport coverage today. Marcus, at this point, strategy. How, if you cast your eye over the field, and given our compulsory pit stop situation of who's got some in the bank, that this is now where you start to reap those rewards, isn't it? It is. Look, the race really starts in the second half, doesn't it? Like, it's all positioning and strategy uh, early on, just staying out of trouble, and now you're starting to see all those X cars climbing to the front. Their strategy is starting to play out and getting some long green flag runs. Um, for me, it really gets serious in the second half of this race, and you, you got to you got to think that the guys have worked out their cars now. If they're going to have mechanicals, they probably would have probably would have happened in the first three hours, and so really now they're starting to think about okay, what do we need to do to get this this car home? Um, and the strategy starts to really kick into play here because uh, as as the field thins out, uh, the chances of safety cars are less. Uh, the drivers have worked their cars out; they're really in tune, you know, with their machines. And so your strategy really kicks in for the second half, no doubt. 
the other thing, Mark, is that all these safety cars have done have kept a huge number of cars on the lead lap, so it brings in the A1 and A2 class cars to play a role. Now, they probably can't compete on outright speed, but they've got two less pit stops to do in the race compared to the BMWs in Class X, so more safety cars could play a role. It just builds it all nicely to that last sort of half an hour shootout that we traditionally get at this place. Yeah, it, it does, and we weren't too sure. We are running in the A2 class mm. with the Mustang, and we we needed the race to go green so we could take advantage you know, of that pit stop strategy at the right time. Um, so we could actually stretch our legs and make those, force those guys to pit under a green flag condition. So it really depends on the racing gods and, and how it rolls with the safety cars here this afternoon, if those A2s and A1s can compete. But those BMWs, they have got some straight line speed. My gosh. I reckon it was 20 lengths down Conrad on the Mustang, and Mustang's no, it's no slouch. I mean, it's got plenty of mumbo itself. So those, those BMWs, they are fast. Speaking of the go-kart go entry, the Russell car that has had pace for a number of years here at the mountain and just hasn't quite fallen their way, but they're in, they're in good shape at the moment, sitting in fourth position. And the leader in terms of our non-X class cars at the moment is that Hobson car with Dylan O'Keefe and Mike Sheargold. And Rich, that's been a car that last year was the best of the rest, wasn't it? It's, uh, it's a consistent performer, really well rolled out. Yeah, it really is, Stubbsy. They've won that class the last two years in a row. And I had a chat to Garth Walden, who runs that GWR team at the start of the week, and he said, look, we understand it completely. We've run those cars now for almost the entire history of the back of six hour. So when it comes to an A45, they know what works, they know what breaks, they know what they need to manage over the course of a race to keep the car reliable, to keep it safe and then give them the tools to fight with them that last hour if it does come down to an arm wrestle. But in Brett Hobson, in Mike Sheargold, and especially Dylan O'Keefe, who's the pro in that car, they've got three drivers who understand endurance racing at this place. So they know that they don't need to get the elbows out now. They can wait until later and the race will come back to them. So they're, they're a really well-drilled team in this style of endurance racing. And I think that's why they've had so much success over the last couple of years and it's been really solid for them today. Not so solid. Well, the concrete wall is not so much for the RX-8. One of two cars entered by Rick Shaw who prepares a whole fleet of these for a, a one-make series that races around Australia. But unfortunately, Car 81 has found the fence on the outside of Murray's Corner. Rick Shaw, of course, a, a guy, Mark, as I'm guessing you would have had a, a little bit of experience with over the years. He's raced in six Bathurst 1000s, Nurburgring 24 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours here. He's, he's done it all, hasn't he? And he's got two cars. Yeah, Rick's weekend. a real competitor, no <laughs> doubt about it. He's been around a long time and he's been doing this stuff for a long time, there's no doubt. He's a good driver, but he's also great at preparing cars, getting to the track. But getting the car that far over on the inside there, that's not easy to do. <laughs> that's Chris Mackey behind the wheel. So we're watching the Subaru coming out of pit lane on our High Tech Oils replay. Ah, so that's exit of turn one. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah, this'll, he's this'll de definitely it. committed. Let's have a look here. Oh, gee. Oh, well, he kept the boot in, didn't he? <laughs> oh, and this is going to be quite oh, a big accident. Dear, that's a huge dear. hit. That's a very big quick, uh, hit on the hard concrete wall and it's, it's not generally a place cars end up so there's no tyre protection alongside it so the Ford Ranger V6 recovery unit is quickly at the scene and we're back under safety car once again and on cue cars in second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth and ninth all peel off into pit lane. Tyler Everingham has remained on the racetrack in car 24 so the strategic games and another tick in the compulsory pit stop box unfolds and unfortunately, that Mazda well and truly out. It's funny, this place, you know, we look at the 23 corners and you look at all the stuff at the top of Mount Panorama and McPhillamy Parks, this epic 220k an hour left-hander. How often do these two 90-degree left-hand corners at the bottom of the hill cause all of the drama? <laughs> they really do. And Mount Panorama's like no other track because the bottom half of the track uh, actually, there's so much lap time to be found down there, and so you've got to really push the limits. And obviously, the 81's push it too hard there. But there's whole different types of drivers here. You know, pure pure amateurs, pros, guys in between, um, has beens like myself and John Bow. I keep saying it, but we are we're we're, we're well past our best. And um, yeah, it, it just this is what the race is. I mean, you just don't know what's going to happen. 
Oh, this is coming into pit lane, Stubbsy. So the go-karts go, BMW. We've just been talking about Aaron Russell behind the wheel has barreled into the lane and has cleaned up the braking markers and the sponsorship sort of hoarding on the inside there. You'd rather have that on the front of the grill coming into pit lane than oh, out, though. Yeah. It's a long way around heating up the car with that on the front, isn't it? That's but a wild moment. And the the 92 Cabbage car was involved in that, was just in front. I wonder if it was just missided or a little bit too hot coming into that. Late call, maybe left. finding yeah. out the safety car was on a late call to get in. Yeah. Uh, real, real... Disappointment for that car 81 as well because a couple of Kiwis in there that never been here before. The, the other drivers in that car, Ash McConkey and Jared Pimenta. Jared owns a workshop there over in Timaru. First time here to Bathurst and first time also for Ash, 33 old from Christchurch. So a shout out to them for making the trip across the ditch and that's what it's all about. I mean, this, this mountain, Marcus, you would know well, is as popular and as big a deal on that side of the Tasman as it is here. Of course it is, and there's, there's some great drivers that come out of New Zealand and um, got, a, got a great heritage of motorsport in New Zealand, but this place, Bathurst will bite you. I mean, that just shows you again, like, you just wouldn't think you could find the wall off a turn two like that, but it can happen. Just getting word through from Race Control, there's a few cars, Stubbsy, that have been pinged for pit lane speed today, and it, it is a thing when you're bouncing through the curbs and you get to the control line directly underneath the high-tech oils bridge. Uh, Chris Lillis, 43 k's now. Jake Camilleri, 43 k's now. So it's only tiny. One of them that won't have to serve a penalty, though, car 95. Marcus Ambrose, 41 k's an hour, Mr Ambrose. Tut, tut. 41, they've got an opinion for 41. 41 k's an hour. It's a double demerit weekend here <laughs> in New South Wales as well. So well, you're we lucky the car's out of the race. We don't have pit lane speed. Um, right? Oh, really? So, yeah, so we're just, just doing, doing it off a little dash. Oh, right. And there's a minimum time from from line to line. So when you enter pit lane, there's a certain time you've got to do the pit stop and the whole pit lane procedure. And so we were very manual in our car. And uh, and with the auto, it's actually really hard to see what speed you're doing. So I didn't know. How are you managing that, uh, actually? Because it's 90 seconds from control line to control line, 32 to transit. Do you then work backwards from that for your station? Yeah, time? I haven't seen it before, but in our car there, they had a race logic box. And it actually gives you um, seconds to go. So when I came down pit lane, it gave you a speed that you were doing, so it was GPS, and then you come into the box and it actually ticks down the time that you need to stay in the box for. Nice. And then when you leave pit lane, it goes back to the pit lane speed for, for a second, but then it goes into whether you're plus seconds or minus seconds on your stop. So if you five seconds to the good or, or, or not, you can work it out and, and, and tailor your tail into the run down pit lane. That's cool. Good system. So a rash of pit stops continue while we're under safety car. It is a, a free stop. Yes, you give up some track position, but a green flag pit stop is much, much worse. So it looks like Lockie Bloxham's going to step into that number 11 Toyota 86. Never lost Class D Stubbsy Toyotas. They have dominated that category. And this has been the sternest challenge they've faced in Bathurst six hour in terms of retaining that honour the same way that BMW's never lost this race outright. So that team is going to work and the Hyundai safety car continues to lead the field. So car 24 is the race leader. They stayed out. They did not take this opportunity. But earlier in the race, they banked a, another compulsory pit stop. So they were already one CPS clear of the other Class X rivals. So a little strategic gamble by Garth Walton Racing has paid off. And that's one of the cool things about this race, isn't it? That you can really roll the dice with how you manage safety cars and pit stop strategy and often doing something completely different pays off. Well, it's not certain until the race unfolds. I mean, there is no right way to do it when you start the day. You just got to yeah. go, you know, with how the race rolls. And, um, you know, right now I'm looking at it, I'm, I'm not sure it's certain about no. these X cars versus, I mean, Ben, ben Barguana again in the seventh car. Yeah. Another A1 car that pops up there again. So you just don't know who's going to be in contention at the end here. And this is what they needed. They they had that extra bit of strategic player in hand when we spoke to Jason earlier, and uh, he said a couple of safety cars, and uh, and we could be in the mix here. Yeah, so they had ticked three of their four compulsory stops off in that Class A1 Audi TT RS. They've got an hour and 40, he said, on fuel for a stint. So if they tick off another stop now, which they haven't done, they've stayed out to get some of that track position back. So they're going to run as long as they possibly can now. And with a little bit more yellow, their aim is to get somewhere within 90 minutes of the finish of the race. And they can go all the way to the end. 
because everyone else is going to have to peel off into pit lane. So the Baguanas have been quite smart with the way they've played this race. They sacrificed track position early, knowing that it had come back to them a little bit later on, hopefully for them, with some interest as well. That's what makes this race so fun, Stubbsy. It really does. Well, just and, the fact, and the fact it's just here. And it's Easter. Correct. And we're all together, and the buzz in the paddock is, is electric. You, you've been in some paddocks in your time. This is just the best atmosphere in a paddock, isn't it? It's yeah. so chilled. And what I love about the 6 air is that anyone can come. Yes. You know, like, you, whatever car you can afford, bring it, you know, and put your driver line up together and just come out here and have a go. And these guys are racing for their outright Class D, and they're just as serious as the guys running in, in the X class. And so that's what I like about it, that it's a grassroots form of uh, racing. We've got to support the grassroots of racing because that's, that's where all the pros come from. That's where, you know, that, that's where it all, you have to look after the base. If you don't look after, and, and this six-hour race is perfect, I think, perfect format for these production cars. And people, you know, support it well. We've got record numbers of cars that enter and, and names that you've never heard of, you know, um, are on this driver's list and, and teams that you don't normally hear of as well. And they come out for a, a big TV race, six hours. And it is. I mean, it's a real achievement to make it to the finish of one of these races. And the balance feels about right to me between the, the pro drivers, mm. like yourself, Anton Di Pasquale, Will yeah. Davison coming in, gives it that star power. But I've spoken to several people in Class D, Class E this weekend going, and I'm not saying this because you're here, I can't believe I'm racing Marcus Ambrose. I can't believe I'm racing Will Davison. That is so cool to see. Uh, I can't believe we're working with Josh Bucket. He's down in the lane. <laughs> Oh, well. Um, so, gents, I'm here with uh, a driver who's driven for some of the biggest teams in Australian motorsport uh, for the great race, Steve Owen, the O Show. Um, mate, you got the open face. How good is that? It's nice to uh, be able to look around the cockpit and not have the confines of a, a full face. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit chilly today, so I'm going to leave it on keeping my ears warm. Yeah, when you said that, I thought you were taking the you-know-what out of me, but you've actually left it on. You've been out the car for about five or six minutes now and you still have it on. Uh, you're in the Lexus RCF, pretty unique car here at the Bathurst uh, Six Hour. How is the car travelling? And uh, you've been chasing your tail a little bit with setup, yeah, it sounds. It's a great car. We, you know, we love it. But, um, you know, we've had so many things break in the lead-up to the event. I think even broken a flugel binder. You know, there's everything that can break, has broken. So <laughs> we're sort of... We're sort of just chasing a setup a little bit. We did three shock changes in the morning warm-up, and the car's okay. Like in the overall scheme of things, the Mustangs are sort of like the rabbits, and we're like the tortoise, you know. So we're just going to plod along, see if we can just keep going round and round, and see where we end up. Are you going to jump in towards the end and bring it home strong with the Flubin, Hubin, whatever it is installed or deinstalled? Yeah, well, I'll probably do the last sort of two hours. I've got two hours left, so two hours to go, I'll jump back in. It's actually nicer in the car today than it is out. She's pretty chilly, so uh, fingers crossed it keeps going that long. Speaking of nicer, it's nice to be in the com box, so uh, back to you, James. <laughs> Josh, you're absolutely right. I tell you what, I know now why these guys are commentators, not pit lane reporters. It is a nice little seat up here, and you can see everything. You've got the timing monitors, you know what's going on, and it's warm. I don't want to give too many of those secrets away, Stubbsy. <laughs> Come on. It is quite nice up here. Not really. The air conditioner is actually a little bit cold today. I've had to upgrade from oh. the vest to the jacket. Oh, yeah, poor you. Yeah, it's, it's, you need a cuddle. It's been hard work. <laughs> little half sleeves, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. the, uh, that Lexus uh, 18th position outright at the moment, so they're just a case of preserving along. Don't have the car speed to go with the Mustangs in their class, but with someone like Steve Owen behind the wheel, you know you're going to get maximum value out of his driving stints. Yeah, Steve's a great driver. That car is beautifully presented Isn't it? too. It, it's a beautiful colour and the... the the quality of that car build is, is second to none. It really is a nice car, but it's it's not as fast as some of the other A2s. I love the story of where these cars come from too, because the way that they come together and decide, we're going to do that car. I think the guys involved in that one were having a beer one night and the, and the joke was made, we should get the uh, Lexus out and take that around the, the mountain. And, and here they were last year. So there's stories everywhere to be told. Oh, and I love the variety as well. And, and there's lots of Mustangs and they're a great car. But for example, Chris Lillis has a Chevy Camaro coming for next year. In fact, it'll run later rounds at the Australian Production Car Championship this year, which is cool. So this is the swan song for their HSV, which has been running really well today, by the way. Um, but yeah, brand new, current gen Chevy Camaro. Um, I know I'm sure Chris Payne from Chevrolet Motorsport in Australia will be watching that just to keep an eye on that and their presence in the sport here in supercar racing and they've got some drag racing as well. So that's great and, and that's what this series and this race in particular should be about is 
that variety, different cars, different performance levels at different points of the racetrack. I mean, where else can you see a screaming five-cylinder Audi TTRS like the one on screen with the birthday boy Ben Barguana behind the wheel in seventh position? I tell you what, they need to uh, pull a tear off of that windscreen. <laughs> yeah, it's not or, good, is it? Or get a sponge out. <laughs> We think they were caught up behind someone who was trailing some smoke earlier in the race, so I think it could be oil. So I'd be really worried about getting the old wipers going because yeah. it could just make it worse. And you know the Barguanas are pretty frugal. They probably <laughs> saved budget on those tear-offs and didn't put any on the screen. <laughs> on board at the moment with the triple two, Semisel Ian Saltieri, and it's Adrian Sarkis behind the wheel at the moment. Caught up with Ian earlier on. They were trucking along quite nicely, reasonably happy with how they were positioned. Well, they're on to 13th outright, Stubbsy, and this is another case of just flying under the radar today. They've taken their opportunities to pit when they needed to under safety car, so they've got some really good track position. And again, that's another example of a, a different car in a class that in the past has been dominated by Evo Lancers and more recently the A45 AMG. So... We're about to go back to racing. Don't forget, we'd love for you to join our conversation on social media too. Lots of banter going on. Hashtag Speed Series AU, or you can follow us uh, at Speed Series AU and at Bathurst Six Hour. Join the conversation. Let us know who you think is going to win today's race because we have absolutely no idea, which is tremendous. But let us know who you think. Hashtag Speed Series AU. As the Hyundai safety car peels back off into pit lane, and Tyler Everingham will lead the field back to green with two hours and 35 minutes on the race clock. There's still a lot of motor race to play out this afternoon at the mountain. And that BMW is very, very quick in a straight line and it pulls away straight away. Ryan Cashes, so car 221, that's that Ford Mustang. Middle of shot, just getting passed by Adam Burgess. He goes up the inside, but he's right in the mix as well. And everyone else sorting themselves out right in there is Tim Lay in car 23 also. Evos, there's the Russells. So P5 for the go-karts go-kart. And Dwayne West just behind them in that big HSV that he's sharing with our colleague this weekend, Tony Dalberto. How difficult are these restarts, Marcus, when everyone's bundled yeah, up together it, like that? Because it's, it's all shaken up and you've got lap down cars mixed in with the X-Class cars. But I must say... There's, there was a lot of respect out there, and there was a lot of good driving that I saw. Guys were just being patient. Uh, slow cars were, were trying to get out of the way where they could. Um, and so it's actually been, I think, quite successful so far today. Um, but as the race one, runs on here, it's not going to be as nice, I don't think. They're going to have to really... The X-Class cars are going to have to really start pushing limits, trying to force these passes across some of the mountain, because you just lose so much time when you get trapped behind a slow car. We saw that on the restart there. Adam Burgess, of course, was back behind traffic, but he's managed to weave his way through and under a little pressure here at the moment across the top of the mountain. But uh, just trucking along pretty well, that car at the moment. Yeah, with Tim Lay bottled up behind a couple of BMWs. There's the Russells, Ryan Casher in front. He's done a super job this weekend. He's been running in the Hyundai XL, so he's getting some bonus lap time, but it's a pretty big jump from an XL into a Ford, <laughs> Ford Mustang. But that Century 21 team have done a nice job. Chris Delsmer is behind this operation. He's been racing production cars for a very long time. Um, GTP Falcons and uh, the like in Australian production car racing dating back to the late 1990s, early 2000s. So very experienced in this and good to see him giving some young drivers a go in car 221. And they've put on a really good show so far today. And it was um, young Ryland Gray who started the race at 16. Jeremy Gray's son. It was a huge performance from him. And was for a time running in the top five outright. And it's such a cool thing seeing these young drivers get their baptism of fire at Mount Panorama and work out how this place works in endurance racing. And more often than that, they do an outstanding job. And you're working with young drivers through the GRM Combine and, and working with a lot of the young driver program there. Some exciting talent coming through. Yeah, there really is. And um, GRM, I mean, we've run a lot of cars. And uh, so there's a lot of drivers come through through that stable. And I just, I just help where I can. You know, the young drivers today, they've got a real advantage with iRacing and, and, and all the exposure and TV time. They can watch other, other drivers and stuff and do their, their study before they get to the racetrack. They're already very good. Um, most of what I do for the GRM drivers is just support them, just encourage them. Yeah, you're doing it, you're doing it well, you're doing it right, stay with it, stay confident. Um, driving is hard, tough. It takes years and years to get really good at it, uh, put yourself in good positions, and, um, you know, 
the GRM drivers do great with uh, with the guidance, but I'm doing terrible with my own kids. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I've had to hand them over because, like, they oh. don't, they don't, they, they don't, don't want to listen. No. <laughs> well, and it's not right either. I think it's actually good to have someone from outside come in and, and provide that kind of advice. Good to know. Uh, Molly Taylor. Dean Campbell, you've just jumped out of the Evo 10. You're sharing with Cameron Creek. We just watched drive past us there. You just had a really big stint, a couple of hours in one go, and, and you're looking pretty fresh. So it's all all going well, all going to plan? Yeah, all going to plan. Just stay clean, have everyone's battles, and just mind our business and keep it clean. We've, and we'll, we'll be there at the end and look after the car. That was the biggest thing. That was my goal. Don't know, uh, silly, yeah. And you were in second, it dropped a little bit back in the pits, but we're just talking to Cam Hill, who's also car controlling you guys this weekend. You reckon when all the pits sort of all level out, you guys are sitting around second place in class? I think we might be fourth place in class, but effective second, so that'll it'll all shuffle out soon when the pits come through again. And yeah. Well, another reason that we wanted to come down here is we also want to present you with the best presented for the class A1. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, you do a great job bringing together this yeah, really professional outfit. So as part of winning that, uh, our good friends at Super Cheap Auto are giving you a $500 gift voucher oh, okay. to go on a bit of an Easter shopping spree. Yep. So congratulations. There's obviously a lot more that goes in just to the, the mechanical running of the car, but, but getting the team together and bringing everything here in a, a really good quality and, and good finish. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much to Super Cheap. I really appreciate that. I'm sort of blown away. I didn't expect that at all. <laughs> well, congratulations. Very well reserved. We might try and grab Cam Hill. Um, he just heard uh, a Super Cheap order gift voucher and I saw his <laughs> eyes prick up. So we'll see if we can grab him. Can we bring you out here, Cam? Uh, winners last year, car controlling this year. What's it like on this side of the fence? Oh, it's way more stressful. Uh, I don't get a break. I have to look at the screen for the whole six hours. But so far, so good. You know, the boys. I've nailed all the pit stops. The car seems to be running really well. Uh, and Dino pulled a obviously big stint there and he set us up really nicely for the finish. And we can see you've got four new tyres here ready to go. What is the tyre? How are the tyres lasting? What do you think the strategy? Will you be replacing just the right side or are you going to go the full distance or what do you think you're looking at? Yeah, I've got them laid out just in case. I think um, we might take a similar approach to last year. Uh, right side. All right, well, best of luck, we're getting it going. Just see uh, another name. Just bear with me two seconds. Oh, looks like another safety car. Man. I'm just going to go grab Lockie Dalton as well. Oh, we this. you for a second? It could be all on the track. It's, down all, there. it's all happening. It's all happening. Lockie Dalton, we're used to seeing you in a Trans Am car. Uh, what are you doing this weekend? You're just watching, you got a roll? I actually live, uh, live with one of the cricks, so Cameron's brother. So, yeah, come out and give um, Cameron a little bit of a hand. Uh, bit of, bit of fun, really. So, yeah, usually racing, but no, awesome to see Cameron and Dean doing an awesome job out there. All right, well, we've got to run, but great to see you all for your championship as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. The Brains Trust in the group there. It's getting wild down here at the chase. It makes you think that perhaps there's oil or something on the surface to see so many cars going off at this point. Yeah, well, it looks like the hold down there is um, blowing a bit of smoke, and that's normally a bad sign, and then cars are sliding yeah. off behind him here. So definitely there must be something on the track. Yeah, looks that... like it is coming out of the exhaust system there too, so it could be terminal for the engine. Yeah, these guys have had a solid day so far. Car 42 in the B2, which is high-performance, normally aspirated class. The SSV Commodore, not that modified from what the road cars are, and they've generally been a very reliable product in this race, but unfortunately, uh, it's come off. Now, that's also caught out several other cars. One of them was the Class C leader, in the Camilleri Nicholas Mazda 3 MPS. While all that was going on, this is... Aaron Russell up the inside of Adam Burgess at turn one. So this is for position number three. So track position change there, and Aaron got that pass done quite nicely down there at one. So there's a lot to take in through all of that. We're back under Hyundai Safety Car once again today. It's been a, a regular occurrence, and it's just not allowing this race to settle down into any form of rhythm. And when a four-wheel drive, oh, and the cabbage car off as well. The oil flags are out there. You can see yeah. on the left of the screen that the flags are out, but clearly there's a fair bit on the surface. But when the, the four-wheel drive Evo Lance is having trouble to keep the thing in a straight line, you know there's something down on the road. Yeah, and it might be sprayed too. Like, it might be just a big film across all the brake zone down there because they're battling on the inside and the outside down there. And even the Audi also couldn't keep 
can't keep it on the black stuff. So how's that for Cameron Hill? Everything he touches turns to gold. Hey, last year he was here with the win. Now they've got the super cheap auto best presented team. And he's a smart cookie. He's got great racing IQ, doesn't he? The thing that Cameron Hill's got, he's a professional race car driver. He's racing full-time in supercars. But he also runs his own race team and a really successful one. Australian Formula Ford champions. They won Porsche Carrera Cup with their own team. He's a really switched on individual and a hell of a race car driver. Yeah, you've got to love the way he's gone about his business, don't you? Like, you know, they, they don't have a lot of means, so they've made the most of what they've got. They've had to get into motorsport to make it all work and uh, and, and get some customer cars to, to make the workshop work. And he's gone, not only has he built that behind himself, he's also gone out there and delivered results. I mean, you know, winning the championships that he's done, making it all the way through like he has done, it's... it's uh, it should be heralded as a, as, a, as a wonderful thing he's done. And Cameron Crick, of course, in that team as well. And Cricky, we know, is a great guy and loves mm. his racing too. And so. fast Very. when he needs to be in these cars. Lots of experience. So this is the first real swing at tyres we've seen here for the BMW. Uh, so you can tell us now, because your car's out of the race, what had you guys planned to do with the Mustang from a, a tyre point of view? Yeah, we'd planned to do two tyres. Um, yep. you know, these MRFs, they, they just have got so much endurance to them. They just last and last. Yeah, they, they, um, the tyres last, but they get hot and they get grimy, so it's always good to put two on. You've got to anyway, and there, there is a small advantage on going those two tyres. I did like the wry smile from Cameron when he said, we're going to do what we did last year, yeah. and then he just grinned. And what they did last year was win the race. So we are under Hyundai safety car. Cars are running through pit lane, recovery vehicles out. Motorsport Australia race control managing this. So some teams have taken the opportunity to tick another CPS off their list with two hours and 27 minutes remaining in the race. And that has Tim Lay in the lead. Dwayne West has not yet stopped. So they've been elevated up to second place. That's the HSV GDS that he's sharing with Tony D'Alberto. And then Ian Sharon up to third. The Park Woman is up to fourth place in the Burson Audi TT. Marcus, casting eyes forward in terms of the tyres, and we'll touch on them there. If you're putting the two down the right-hand side, these MRFs, how long do they take to, to get up to speed, to temp? And, and in terms of the, any performance gain, how long is that window? Yeah, it's not, it's not too bad. Maybe a lap or two and they're, they're in. Okay. Um, for me, what I found out there was the tyre didn't like to be too hot. Um, if you really push the car and you, you could hear the tyres howling and squealing through the corners, a couple of laps, they get pretty grimy. And you actually notice that in the brake zones, the car started just to walk around, and you could tell the ABS was starting to kick in. You back the car off a little bit, cool the tyres down, the grip comes back to you. Um, they, they are an amazing tyre for, for this type, kind of race. And I think um, MRF, you know, drivers have been, you know, not that happy happy with the feel of the grip and everything. But for me, for this type of race, um, the, the tyre's perfect. And red flag has been displayed. So this race will be suspended and that is to clean up the oil at the chase. It has been deemed too dangerous to continue at this point by Motorsport Australia Race Control. So for the first time in high-tech oils, back to six-hour history, the race will be paused. This just throws even more question marks into how this plays out this afternoon. There are a few people that probably wouldn't be too disheartened to see a red flag at this point, especially some of those two driver combinations that get now to really just take a breath, get the fluids on and just reset markers. Yeah, de definitely um, you can do this race pretty pretty comfy with two drivers. It just gives everyone a chance to just maybe reset here a little bit, but um, yeah, this is unusual. Red flag for, for oil down like that. Hopefully this is uh, going to be a short short red flag when we get back to racing. And the engineers with their strategy now, a chance for them as well to just reset, recalculate, think exactly how this is going to play out. To see how long this red flag will last will impact the mathematics that are going on up and down the line. So I assume with the red flag, the time keeps ticking? It does. So okay. because it's a timed race, not a lap count race, the clock will continue to tick. What it does do is will cause some headaches for teams. Like you mentioned, Stubbsy, only running the two drivers with the minimum, maximum driver time allowance that they've got to play with, depending on how long this red flag is. So we'll bring you up to speed on all of that when we get a bit of an understanding about how this will play out. But the teams have to follow the safety car into pit lane and they'll pull up to a stop and then the track will be able to be cleaned and then we'll get this race reset and it will resume at some point. So the field behind the Hyundai safety car under red flag for the first time in Bathurst six hour history. Red flags in motorsport of late have been a bit of a thing. <laughs> 
the stoppages restarts. Uh, a week ago, a fairly major event down in Melbourne had a few of those, so we're just picking up on that trend and continuing well, onwards. Your training is right on, on point at the moment. Yes, uh, but the Richard rules Carl, are the, so different, <laughs> Stubbsy. The, the caller of F1, and what a great job you did too. Tim Lay leading the race at the moment as we pull in, Marcus. A, a guy that was and is an incredibly talented driver quite clearly and was really close to, to making it supercars level and, and decided to go the business, the business route in the long term there, but a quality driver with good connections in the supercars world. Yeah, T Tim Lay's a good friend of mine. We were actually roommates, flatmates, I should say, uh, back in 1997 in uh, Cronulla. So Tim and I go back a long way, and he is very talented. Um, he, he did co-driver duties for a long time for the Bathurst 1000 when supercars were in their boom period. Um, but he's also running a fantastic business over in Orange with the Ford dealership and BMW dealership. So, you know, he's been able to balance, you know, personal life, business life and racing. Um, and he loves coming out once or twice a year and doing these races. And um, he's a good character. He's really fast, not to be underrated. There's, there's no doubt he's a contender. They've they won the race here before. Um, and, and he's one of the favourites, no doubt. Well, while we've got a red flag, we've got a bit of time. Take us back to Cronulla and what it was like back in, uh, in the 90s for you and Tim. Well, the PG version, please. Yeah. Yeah. We cooked a roast dinner one night and we had three tots of potato. <laughs> No green. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we bunked in together pretty much, uh, and my wife now, Sonia, was, was with us as well. Um, yeah, so Tim had half the house, and we had half the house, and we were both running Formula Fords and trying to run them ourselves out of um, Harry Galloway's shop. Well, I, that's where I was, and um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun, and we raced the National Formula Ford Championship in 1997, got beaten by Garth Tan. I'm like, who is this, <laughs> this, this tall bean from Western Australia just What colour was the hair then? My butt. Was it the blue hair? Was he rocking that no, back no, then? No, or no, that, no, that no, was still he, to come. He, no, he was pretty normal <laughs> back then. He didn't go with the wild haircuts uh, back then, um, but he, he had a lot of talent back then too. The, the talent was thick in that year. We had mm. a lot of really good guys racing in that era, and Tim was in there, and I was in there, and... Um, Baguanas were there, and uh, we had, um, obviously, um, uh, Ritter was around, and, yeah, a lot of good guys that were in there. Steve Owen was there. Steve was another great driver at that time. Yeah, St Steve Owen's story is a fantastic one, too. I, I remember he, he turned up to a national go-kart race with a go-kart on, on his roof racks. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he couldn't stay for his trophy because he had to go back to work. Yeah. And look at him now, hey? So this is the reason why we're under red at Mount Panorama for the High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour. And getting that replay a little bit earlier, there was a lot of flame out the back of the Commodore. So that's had quite a significant failure, hence the oil that's been spilled over the chase. And that is why we are under red flag conditions due to oil at the chase and the conditions being too dangerous to continue. And clear the racetrack, get everybody in pit lane and allow our amazing Motorsport Australia volunteer officials to do their job safely. This was pretty wild, though, down there with a couple of those cars rejoining. Now, what's occurred at the moment? The race has been suspended. Uh, Motorsport Australia just waiting to instruct crews to go to their cars. They need to work through the process because at the time of the red flag, some cars were serving their compulsory pit stop. So they need to sort that out and get them back into the order, having completed their stop, and then let them get back into the race. So our pit lane team will bring you up to speed with everything going on down there. In the meantime... The cleanup continues down at the chase, but situations like this, and we've been talking, Marcus, about thinking on the fly. Come back to that. In the meantime, let's hear from the lane and go down to Molly Taylor. Well, it's time to talk about some fuel, and I've got Mark Tierney from Race Fuels, the man behind keeping all these cars running out on track. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for your support of this event. Tell us a little bit about the logistics. How, you know, how much fuel do you bring? How much fuel are these cars using? How difficult is it to arrange it and get all that together? Thanks, Molly. It's a 50,000 litre project this weekend, so some of the top teams will need 600 litres. That's three of these 200 litre drums. Uh, our race fuels team service the event live during the race, so the teams order their fuel as they need it. We give them a 200 litre drum and they go racing. Unreal. And this is the, the 98 octane fuel that they're running. At race fuels, you do a whole different bunch of fuel options. So why the 98? 98, this is as close we get as a production car fuel, so we run a service station quality product but we have some better handling techniques and making sure everyone's got a consistent batch. What's really important this weekend at the six hours is one batch of fuel for every single car. Well, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for, uh, yeah, keeping us, keeping us all going as well. Thanks, Molly. Thank you. So the work continues. Red flag out here at Mount Panorama in the 2023 High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. We've seen a couple of firsts today. 
Marcus Ambrose, what a day. <sighs> what a day, but I've, I've come from NASCAR in American stock car country and under a red flag, you can't touch the car. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? That's kind of snuck in over the years over here. We, we had one here back in 2014 at the 1000 and that's where it all really opened up that day. Cars were allowed to be worked on, but I would have thought, it's only me being race fan slash caller or announcer, that if you... If you stop the car in the pits, we're under really a red flag. You're pressing pause on the race. But this changes the whole game now. Yeah, it does. It throws things up. So the regulation, I won't bore you with the numbers, but under the, the standing motorsport regulations is that if the safety car is directed into pit lane, which it has been, teams must follow the car into pit lane and stop in the fast lane in a line behind it. So they've done that. An automobile may be worked on in the fast lane. Refueling is prohibited. And unless <laughs> permitted by the clerk of the course, your condition... Uh, the changing of any tyre is also prohibited. So they can't just go and throw, like they did in F1 last yeah. week, they can't just go and throw new tyres at all the cars. But we've seen some teams throwing, look like brake pads on well, some cars. So they can work adjusting on adjusting tyre pressures, changing ride height, so much you could do on the car. It's just quite an incredible rule. So how does this affect the CPS then? Well, this won't count as a compulsory pit stop because it's it's not under racing conditions and there's no stopwatch on it. Yeah. So they're still going to have to serve their CPS. But there'll be the, – the stewards are going to have to look at that because depending on how long the red flag is, there's a window you need to get those compulsory stops in. So it closes half an hour before the end of the race. We've still got two hours and 17 minutes. So let's say they've still got two hours of racing to go. There's still time to do it. So the only way you can change tyres unless it's a safety reason. And <laughs> they also – cannot carry out a driver change under this red flag. So the driver that's in the car mm. has to remain in the car. And how does that affect their driving time? Well, with the, the race clock, still can, the clock continues. Yeah. So that's the thing with this race. It's a timed race. It's not to a set number of laps. And all the regulations around driver time are based on time, not laps. So when they say you have to spend mm. a maximum of three and a half hours in the car, this that's on time. Yep. So this counts. Mm. This all counts. This is a pretty hefty clean-up we've got going it, on here, haven't we? It makes you wonder how much oil that yeah. Holden, Holden held. It must have had a fair bit in the sump there because they've got a lot of speedy dry down. Well, I've got one similar, and I don't think it holds that much. <laughs> I don't recall putting that much in it at the last service. It's definitely put it all on the track. There might Possibly. not be much left in that motor. We're, we're lucky to have not many other cars involved in that incident down there too. Several went skating off the track during uh, the period down there, but most survived, but the... VFHSV out of the race while the work continues down here in the lane. Still two hours and 14 minutes under red flag. Let's go to Josh Bucken. Hello. So we are with Jenna Jada. Um, mate, bit of an odd scenario at the moment, but you've had a pretty good race so far. Your first stint was pretty impressive. You uh, hit the juice button and off you went, mate. Yeah. Yeah. We finally um, got it running as it should. So yeah, that first stint was pretty good and got to show, I guess, the pace that we've got and stored for later in the race. And yeah, it feels a little bit like Albert Park at the moment with the red flag and the pause in the race and everyone changing tyres. So um, I guess it might be two three-hour races today. How were your tyres, mate? Did you Were they OK or is it a welcome set that is about to go on the car? Yeah, they're well, well used. Well used. <laughs> yeah, OK, technical term. You're in a pretty good spot. I think you've got a pit stop more than uh, some of the other guys. So you're looking pretty good for the finish. Yeah, I'm not too sure. I just jumped in, so... Yeah, I'll be into the finish now, so fingers crossed we can get it there. You heard it here first. He doesn't care. Full send from uh, Jay No Jada. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Uh, thank you, Josh. Appreciate that. Now, the regulations state that you cannot change tyres, but that, that may have been permitted by race control. We'll get clarification on that for you. You don't want to get bogged down in articles and sporting <laughs> regs and all that because it makes for pretty dry television. So we'll... Just wait and see how this all plays out for you. But we are suspended for the first time in the history of this race. We've never had a red flag in the six previous editions of the High Tech Oils, back of six hours. So it's just another plot point in what's been a pretty wild day at Mount Panorama. So back to Jaden Ojada. So I, I really didn't know Jaden before this weekend mm. that well. Uh, but he's been very fast all weekend. Yeah. And um, I took all my gear, my race gear, down to scrutineering on Thursday to get it all check, checked over. And anyway, I'd left my my um, I'd left my uh, head sock there. Oh. So Jaden comes over. He says, "Hey, hey, you got your head sock? Have you picked up your head sock yet?" And I thought, "Oh, how about this guy? He's yeah. getting into me already about not wearing a balaclava." But it, actually, <laughs> it was actually it was hot. actually true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I ripped right into him. He was like, oh, "What are you t talking me off for?" Because he didn't he didn't know the story. He, he didn't well, grow up around it. You see, he's twenty be years be a ago. Baby, yes. That's right. Oh, what a That's great right. yarn that is, Molly Taylor. 
to Barwana. It's been a great run from you and Ben in the Audi TT so far, but it hasn't been without its issues. Yeah, look, it's been uh, quite hard. Uh, may it looked easy from the outside, but Ben and I are working quite hard. We have a problem with the brake pedal and the brake booster. Um, so the pedals are really hard and really firm. So Ben's in there at the moment. He's um, doing really well and he's coping with his legs. So we'll uh, keep pushing on and um, we'll see if I can jump in later on. Well, thanks, you. We'll try and grab a word from Ben uh, whilst he's in the car. G'day. Uh, we're hearing that you the vacuum for the brake booster's gone, so you've got basically a, a solid pedal. How do you manage that from a strength point of view, but also managing the ABS as well? Uh, look, just push the pedal literally as hard as I can. So uh, my right leg's starting to go to sleep. It's starting to hurt a fair bit, but look, we just have to manage it. We can't, we can't afford to go a lap down or anything, so we've just got to push on and do the best we can. And you tried to get away with not telling us it was your birthday today, but you're not going to get away with that. Happy birthday. How old are you? I'm 22, so thank you. <laughs> had a good uh, celebration so far. What what would it mean to uh, to win your class as icing on the cake for your birthday? Oh, it'd be everything. I mean, this is our third year at it. We really want to win. We've given everything to get to this point, and look, it, it would literally mean the world. So we're going to give it a red hot crack. Well, have a good one. I hear you're also running a bit tight on fuel, so I think this is your saying thank you for this. Good luck, Ben. Thank you. Anton Di Pasquale joining me at the moment. Mate, uh, sitting pretty well in this car. Everything was tracking OK. What's it, uh, the feel for you? Um, just got back in for a long one home. So uh, just got in just before that red flag. So I haven't been in the car for a few hours. So I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> want to do a couple more laps. But, yeah, it's all shaken up. It's getting pretty hectic. You did two tyres down the right-hand side in the stop when you jumped in. Now under this red flag, you've done the two down the left. So the rubber's all good. What sort of performance gain are you expecting from that with these MRFs? Um, no idea, mate. <laughs> I haven't done that many laps on them, I couldn't tell you. But, um, yeah, I, the tyre doesn't wear that much, but it's probably more of a safety thing and just make sure you've got new ones. It's better than old ones anyway. Can't go wrong. So how do you think you're positioned in terms of where you are with track, in terms of your CPS, in terms of just the general setup for this run home now? It's getting to the go time. Yeah, I think we're somewhere in the hunt. Um, I'm not too sure. You get it's hard. It's quite hard to follow sometimes. So we're somewhere there. Um, I'll just put in two two hours of my best work and uh, hopefully get a trophy at the end of it. All right. Well, we can't wait to watch you go. He's got the no and the yes buttons here. He's also got a button that says beer on the steering wheel. We'll get uh, Billy to come around and have a look. So uh, they're taking it seriously here, and hopefully at the end of the day they're on the podium <laughs> and they do get to press the beer button. That would be good fun. So I'm here with uh, another one of the big dogs, Aaron Russell. Mate, um, day's going pretty good so far. A couple of safety car timings that probably haven't gone your way, but the car's looking fast and all you guys have done a pretty good job. Yeah, car's feeling all right. It's a bit bit nervous across the top, but um, just probably haven't had the luck of the draw so far with all the safety cars. But one more stop to go and see what we're pan out in the last hour. Put, put the big dog Drew in and see if he can bring it home. Did you use scissor, paper, rock for that? Or how, how do you come up with that? It just depended on how everything fell. The plan was for me to finish, but, um, you know, it's just with the safety cars and everything and how it's panned out, we got one more stop, Drew's into the end. So it's all up to him from there. I'll kick back and have a latte and see what he can do. Give and I both, mate. Best of luck. Enjoy. 11th position for the go-karts go BMW. And there's the clean-up that's just about finished down there in a DBA chase of why the red flag is out here during the high-tech oils bath of six hour. We've been down for at least 15 minutes now while they clean up. It's been a great day here once again, this edition of the Bathurst six hour that started 11.45 on the coldest days we can recall here at the mountain, but the action on track certainly red hot here today. It's been a lot to talk about. It took a bit to get going, including the aborted start, not seen here in six hour history, but it did get away at the second attempt. Richard Crowell, the BMWs squaring off on the way to turn one. Nolts, we're ticking off the firsts today <laughs> at Mount Panorama, there's no doubt about it. It was a clean start when they finally got going that second time around, and very quickly Anton Di Pasquale put his head down and passed some cars as we take a look at these super cheap auto highlights. This was a sad tale, the Mediki Ford Mustang off. This was the Volkswagen up the top of the hill. We understand made quite hefty contact with the wall before driving straight off there at McPhillamy Park. And this was a change of the lead. The Sharons got to the front. One of multiple different race leaders today. It's been hard to keep count of everyone that's had a share of the race lead. And then Tim Lay was putting on the moves and car 23 sliced down the inside in 
this all BMW battle at the pointy end. This is when we started to get a feel of where the race was going, but didn't take too long for the next bit of action to happen. A big hit on the wall here. For the 81, man, that one was a bone cruncher, which would bring out the yellow, but then this would cause a red flag for the 42, the HSV coming to the infield, the DBA chase, a lot of oil, which sent a lot of cars skating, including the Cabbage and Randall car. And look how close he was to being nailed there, sitting duck on the outside the track there. They persisted with a yellow for a bit, but ultimately the red would come out and the car's chilling out in pit lane right now while we get that cleanup sorted out. But here's how the leaderboard looks with just over two hours remaining. See, there's been a bit going on and you feel like there's more to come. So Class X cars one, two and three. The Barguana's currently leading A1, but there's a stop to come for them as well. Razum and Forrest in there, R8 on top in A2. That's a surprise. That's the first time we've seen them there at this point today. So the Mustangs looking to come back later in the race with Quinn, Denya and Quinn currently third place in class. Speaking of the categories, there's been some giant killing performances as always here. Class C leader, Jake Camilleri and Scotty Nicholas are inside the top 15 outright at the moment in their little Mazda 3 MPS. Dowsett, Madrum and Lockie Bloxham currently leading Class D as they have done for a lot of today's race. And the Alexander, Dury and Fowler Mazda 3 SP23 continues to lead the way over the similar Mazda in the Class E baby class battle. So that brings us up to speed. Thanks to Super Cheap Auto here at the High Tech Oils. Back the six hour and the clock continues to tick as we get set for a race restart. There is the Grand Prix Mazda car from 33rd on the grid inside that top 15 right now. So we'll keep an eye on him leading Class C. So Class X, one, two, and three. You've got Class A1 back through fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh as we get set to release him behind the Hyundai safety car and go back to green flag racing. Yep, you're right. It's been a day of first here at Mount Panorama. And it's almost like we now get a second half of competition here as the Alford car waits to leave the lane here too. Quite a lot of cars still in this one. How do you mentally set yourself for this, Marcus, after a pause of 20, 25 minutes? It just really starts again, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, um, as a driver here, you've got uh, Anton De Pasquale. He's going to stay in for the rest of the race here. So uh, driver changes are out. Just one more pit stop and he's, he's, he's in for the win. At least he'll be warm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so the Hyundai safety car will lead the field out and behind them it's Tim Lay on board the BMW M3. He shares with Berwick Linton and Will Davison. We expect Will to be in the car for the final stint. So they've still got two pit stops to go. All of the Class X cars have still got to tick off two compulsory pit stops, but that will work for fuel for them. And it might mean slightly less fuel in that final stop actually going into the final hour of the race. Here's the Mustang. So this is a local legends car with Grant Denyer back behind the wheel now after a wow. solid early stint. Look That's at that steering. fancy steering wheel. We're, we're running a that. stock job, <laughs> weren't we? <laughs> I need to get my hands on one of those. I'm fairly certain that's off the GT4 spec. Mustang, it was yeah. provided by Racer Industries, Ryan McLeod. And, and that goes back all the way to the very beginning of the car build because you've got to work out what wiring loom do you want. Yes. I mean, if you commit to just putting a brand new wiring loom through it, going a full Motec system, you can go put that steering wheel in. For our car, um, for the Mediki car, the Mustang, we chose to go with a standard wiring loom and it forced us to stay with the standard steering wheel. Right. Because it's got all the buttons on it. So you need those to get into the system. Y yeah, because you've got to keep untriggering all the errors yeah, that, right. that keep popping up. So it's like when you get into the rental car nolts at the airport, yeah. you turn off the lane warning assist yeah. and the close following cruise control thing. Pretty much anything is anti-fun yeah. <laughs> yeah. as we get in the car. We, we had airbag warnings and back, back seat, didn't have their seatbelt on. And, yeah, we had all this stuff going on in our car. Oh, the joys of production car racing. That's the scene, Mount Panorama. What a place. And well done to the Bathurst Regional Council, as always. Great partners in this event who have done a great job preparing this place. It's always extremely well presented, Mount Panorama. A bit dry on the mountain there. Just a tad. There's that beautiful little lookout that was added a few years ago. You can walk from the bottom of the mountain now and chase that walk that goes all the way down to Forest Elbow. And some spectacular sights there during the day and more so by night as this snake of cars make their way across McPhillamy down into Skyline. It really is one of these magical racetracks that we have in Australia. We're very lucky to have this kind of racetrack, aren't we, Marcus? Oh, we are. It's definitely Australia's finest racetrack, and it's just wonderful to be here. Now we have uh, four or five races a year here. It really uses the facility properly. 
But you can actually just see these drivers now. They're not worried about the view. They're, yeah. they're worried about getting this race restarted. They're trying to get the brakes warm again, trying to get the tyres going again, get all the marbles and everything off the tyre and try and get themselves ready to go. You see down, that's where the path actually drops into. And when you come here, we've done it a few times like I have, you'd never stop learning about this place. We drove up there a couple of years ago. Don't listen to anyone in race control. We parked at the spot we probably didn't. And there's a little road to the right there, which takes you into people's properties. So one side, you're going down the hill, looking at the people's backyards, but then you've got race cars zipping past you on the other side. Those internal roads were all put in in the early 2000s for the Bathurst 24 hours when yes. they literally can't have a residence access break to get the residents in, so they had to build all the internal roads out through the middle. Uh, we are going green, we are told, this time by. So very quick resumption of racing with what will be almost exactly two hours left on the race clock. So it's a sprint race at Mount Panorama to the finish. And a dramatic afternoon at Bathurst for the high-tech oils, Bathurst six hour, and who wins? Well. Right now, your guess is as good as ours because this is a wide open car race. It's one of the first times I've seen you actually stumped in an endurance race here. Usually you've got half an idea by now, but even you're like, uh, uh, red flag, throw it out the window. Yep, pretty much. I'll tell you in uh, two hours and three minutes, That's Matt, my how's, that That's a, my how's that for a tip? <laughs> Great recovery from the 90, Dwayne West and Tony D'Alberto. They had that big spin earlier today coming out of the Dipper to be running second right now. I'm not sure where they fit in the pit stop cycle, but recovery, that car could have been damaged. But they're exactly the same as the race leader just in front of them. So they've got four CPSs ticked. It's showing five on the monitor, but they've all been through the lane for that red flag. So we uh, won't let that confuse us. Right, let's see if we can get some green flag running. A full race restart at Mount Panorama after a 25-minute interruption. We're back at Bathurst and the green flag flies. Tim Lay leads the field. The Chris Lillis HSV is out of position. It's Dwayne West in second on the road. That's that gold HSV GDS. Then Ian Sharon in the red Sharon Rentals BMW. There's the local legends, Mustang going up the inside, Grant Denyer on Keith Bensley, so that is for position as well. And right now we actually, I think there's 50 cars left, but there's some running that haven't caught up to some of the cars that are actually out of the race that are walking wounded. But remarkably still more than 45 cars running safe for now. We'll give you a final tally a little bit further into the race. And Daniel picking off some of the lap cars in the local legends entries back behind the wheel of car seven. As they climb up through Griffins on this restart lap, you just joined the coverage, a lengthy red flag here at the Bathurst six hour. And we're less than two hours from home as Tim Lay leads the race. There is the Aaron Russell car that is 11th on the road, but still having to, having to pick off some lap cars in the mix. They managed to have a moment coming into the pits earlier now. I think these guys have still got the car pace. So something tells me this 58 car is going to be there at the end. Do you know what also I think they've got as we look at John Bow waiting to get into the Ranger Falcon GTF. The other thing they've got is I think they're the first outright car to have to be one pit stop away from finishing this yep. race. They've got, I think they've got one more stop up their sleeve. Confirm that for you, but they have been through pit lane more times than anybody else in this race. Probably pass more cars than anybody else today. Yes. Yeah, oh, there's a lot of passing going on. <laughs> no doubt about that. What Tim Lane needs to do here, he's got the race lead. He's got to really make some time here because uh, his major competitors are buried pretty deep down here yeah. amongst some lap cars. You've got Russell uh, sitting in 10th with a lot of lap cars in front of him. You've got uh, Deepak Squally buried deep down. He needs to make some time now so he can try and get a gap and get his pit stops done and get an advantage out of this, uh, the way the race has unfolded. Nearly six seconds alone. We just had a waiter there of the cars coming down the straight, so that's a big advantage to have in just one lap, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, if you get caught behind traffic here, you can lose 10, 10 seconds a lap, no doubt. So you've got to be very careful here to keep your car straight. Don't forget the fenders and the bumpers and everything. They're all plastic, <laughs> and they, they don't like to be touched too much. No. So, you know, you've got to be respectful of the guys around you. You've got to look after your own equipment too. Ian Sharon going around the outside there and driving through that oil dry, the clean-up material they put down, even the street sweeper. It's still pretty thick down there at the chase. That's one way to move it out the way. Well, that's really going to take away a passing chance here for probably the rest of the race. That's not going to go away in two hours. Molly? Sitting, sitting in second after that monumental spin that Dwayne had earlier on. Really lucky escape, but it's amazing so far to be where you are. Yeah, he was pretty lucky there. Uh, but the car's been pretty solid all day. 
Uh, we're into that sort of final leg of the race now, and the car's looking pretty good. So we're pretty happy considering the weight of the HSV compared to the Beamers. Uh, to be in that sort of top five is, uh, is a nice result for us so far. And you've still got one more pit stop to go. Is the plan to, for you to jump it in and bring it home? Yeah, just the way the day's worked out, I'll jump in for the last in and bring it home. Originally, Westy would like to do the finish, but uh, I get the honours today. And do you reckon that you'll have the legs to uh, to hold off the BMWs? Probably not. Probably not. But uh, the big old HSV is doing pretty good for, uh, like I said, the weight of the car. It's got lots of horsepower. And uh, when you're sort of 200 kilos heavier, it's, it's a little bit hard to defend. Well, thanks, Tony. We look forward to the show in any case. Thanks very much, guys. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Very great steer, as always. The reigning TCR Australia champion, Tony D'Alberto. There is his car out there with Dwayne West behind the wheel. Do a bit of a tribute to the Holden Tirana that Dwayne's father, Neil, ran back in the 74. Great race here. As they make their way across the top of the mountain once again, one hour, 56 minutes remaining with the Class X cars back out. Can the 90 stay in the mix? This is really good to see after that spin. Pretty much down here coming through the dipper on the way to Forest Elbow. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Nolts. I think that car playing a role in this and with the knowledge that Tony D'Alberto has yet to jump in, that's exciting. And we've yet to see a HSV, a legitimate outright contender in this race for years. So the Chris Lewis car, Nathan Callahan, that we've been talking about, they got an outright podium. In fact, they're the last non-BMW to be on the outright podium in this race. So it can be done. You just need the cars to fall your way. This is really busy. Look at the Russells going down the outside of the Cameron Creek Evo. That's our Super Cheap Auto best presented car in the A1 class. And it remains that way because it got out of what was a potentially fairly hairy moment on the run down Conrad Strait. So Aaron Russell behind the wheel of car 58 up to seventh. Tim Lay is the race leader. Ian Sharon next and Dwayne West running third. Russell's actually now up to fifth. So a couple more positions. Dylan O'Keefe, Matt Nolte will be the next target. So I'd say at least 50 cars out there on the track, quite a few in the pits. Uh, fixing cars, some decide to call it a day out there, but really a clean affair apart from the oil down we had down in the chase. Starting to mix up who's going to be in the top 10 of this race in the closing hour and 54 minutes of this race. And Ops, we've just had Marcus Ambrose who made his name here in the early 2000s and we're now joined in the box by Matt White who called those moments of Marcus Ambrose <laughs> in the early 2000s. Hello, mate. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I made my name like Marcus Ambrose did oh, here, but I'll tell you what, I don't mind jumping into his seat. I, yeah. You know, it's funny, I, I was just walking to the commentary box and I saw the yellow Mustang being put in the back of the trailer and I went, oh, what a bummer. And I just had a quick chat with Marcus as he left the commentary box there and I said, you had the pace? And he goes, yep. And across the top? Yep. yep. I was like, oh, geez, it's hurting even more. But it just goes to show you, fellas, doesn't it? The Book of Bathurst yeah. is never closed. You think of all of the years, all of the amazing races, all of those crazy storylines, and you go, you could possibly write another chapter, could you? It just keeps doing it. Well, we're writing one right now. That red flag for me, pretty much bang on the two-hour mark, was really interesting. I reckon a red flag on the hour mark is very, very different, but it seems to me as though the strategy game's coming in a bit earlier than, than possibly what we expected. Yeah, I'd agree with that, totally. And just to put a full stop on the red flag, we were questioning about whether they were allowed to change tyres or not. Clearly, a lot of people did. Race Control granted approval for that to happen. So they cleared that, allowed everyone to put new tyres on. But there's still a question mark over fuel for some of these cars. So they weren't allowed to refuel and that it hasn't added to the compulsory pit stop tally. So you can give an ice cream headache all yeah. these race regulations and things like that. But that is a full stop on what we've seen the first red flag in six hour history. But it's also helped our drivers that had a bit of a rough run this morning, for example, being buried down in the pack to move themselves up into contention here as the Russell car really gives Dwayne West the hurry up and see how narrow the line is down there now. Into the chase, take a long time for that to clean up as the go-karts go BMW. Fancies a look here, might just get it done. This for position two on the track. And the Nova Castrians get a spot. And move it up now into P number three. So BMW's one, two, three here at Mount Panorama. Smart move by West there, wasn't it? He knew he was under attack. He was waiting and waiting and waiting and just thought, well, what's the point? 
why, why put up a fight at this stage? So the Russell Russell and Russell car sounds like a good law firm, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> takes the spot there. And, and this is really a good opportunity for us now to see at this stage of the race. But take a look at the conditions, guys. I don't know if they've been as good right now as they are right now throughout the course of this race since we started at quarter to 12 this morning. The sun's come out. It's been cold all day, so the, the cold factor's been there. But now Aaron Russell has a chance to show us just how much he's, just how much pace he's got at this stage. Yeah, the feels like temperature's gone up to 4.2 degrees, Ooh, so it's, it's absolutely brilliant. I took, my, I took my third jacket off just before. <laughs> started to sweat. <laughs> Well, this is a really interesting phase for mine. Now, from a strategy point of view, there's still two pit stops for a majority of our leading cars to do. The, the thing for mine is where the Class A1 cars fit in. So they have to do four mandatory stops compared to the six for the Class X cars. Now, a lot of them are very close to ticking that box, but I think the outcome is, is that a majority of the fast BMWs have still got to make two pit stops. I think most of the A1 cars have got one pit stop to do. That's a move position there too from Russell going past Sharon. Uh, my seat thinks I think he the Russell. Sharons might have a bit of a problem yeah, with I think their they do. It's in behind the wheel. He's taken the shortcut down at Brock Skyline and that was just too easy oh. across the top of McPhillamy. Stack in the field up. That was beginning on the way to McPhillamy Park. I think there's a drama here for the Sharon rental scarf. Dropping from second position. It's cruising down to Forest Elbow. It's only been 11 laps since their last race pit stop where they put fuel in, so I don't think it'll be a fuel issue. Perhaps a, a technical drama for this team that uh, the former race winners here at, at Mount Panorama, they took this race in 2018. They finished second here in 2016 on the debut of this race. They've got an amazing track record, the Queenslanders. Oh, and off. Oh, the Lexus has had a big one at the top. That's the run to Brock Skyline at Mount Panorama. It's going to be another safety car for sure. That's been a huge impact. Dust just clearing across in front of our drone camera here. So not even two laps back into the restart of this race. And the safety car will be called once again. Big shunt on top of the mountain for car 48. Here it is on the High Tech Oils replay. Keith Bensley is behind the wheel. Oh, did he get some help? You oh, bet he no. did. And he's a passenger. Oh, this Straight. is going to be hard. Oh. That's a two or three deep tyre barrier. The significant damage to the 48. He won't get out of there. Their race is done in the Bathurst. Six hour for 2023. It's an 1800 kilo car, that Lexus, so it's not light and it made heavy contact. The tyres did their job. The gravel trap pulled some of the energy out of it, but that's still quite a big impact. He was he was wide on the outside there, Keith at McPhillamy Park, and he's moving around. Thumbs up to the fire marshal up there at the top of the hill. Well, that ends what was a quite a good day for these guys. We heard from Steve Owen just before, who was rocking the helmet despite not getting in the car, mainly because it was the warm thing to do. And he was quite positive about the performance of how they're going. They didn't have the outright pace to go with the Mustangs in their class, but they were chipping away and at one point hovered around the top 12 or 13 cars. Start the race today from 28th on the grid. They finished 33rd in last year's race. And this may help as the 90 comes in. They are in the top three. So what is going on with the Sharon Rentals car? Remember they're debuting a new BMW in the monochrome GT4 Australia series this year. That raced over the course of the support races. He's working on the front wheel. I don't oh, recall Sydney concept, although he was in a sea of lap cars at that moment. We were high above the track, so... Well, no telltale signs. I wonder if he's just felt a, a vibration, perhaps, through the right front corner. And remember, at this place, the front right side of the car is the one that gets all of the load across those high-speed corners. They're checking the left front as well. It just goes to show just how quickly things can change here. I mean, it wasn't, what, uh, a lap and a half ago we were focused on Aaron Russell and Dwayne West fighting for position. And then Russell gets past him and all of a sudden the world opens up. He gets fired straight up into second and uh, Ian Sharon has a problem there. He knew he was a shot duck, didn't he? He pulled away quickly at the very top of the mountain and you don't do that unless you know you've got a major issue. And there were a whole stack of cars lining up to get past him. So... We're going to have to see how that one plays out. Stubbsy. With me, as we said, a, a former champion here, Grant Sharon.
what was the issue with the car there across the top? Uh, we got a radio call in from Ian. He thought he had a um, front tyre out the front right. But, um, it's come in. I haven't had a chance to talk to the boys yet or what they've seen, but um, we didn't change the tyre, so there might be something else there if there's something wrong with the actual tyre itself. But everything looked all right, so go back out and see what happens. But um, unfortunately, we lost a little bit of track position, but the safety car um, has helped us a little bit as well. So we've got that last, another CPS done. So one more to go and see how we go from the run home. So in terms of the strategy now, you it's not game over. You're still in the mix, but you might need a couple of things to come your way. Yeah, we'll need a, bit, a little bit to come our way so we can get back up into the field. So um, we're back a little bit now, so we'll see what we can do. Great, you always roll out an awesome looking car. It's so well presented by you and the team. You've been there and done it before. You're still in the mix and good luck. Yeah, we're still there. It's still got over an hour to go. So anything can happen at Bathurst and um, hopefully it comes our way. Thanks, Grant. Thank you. That's experience right there. Better to come in and check the car to make sure he's only feeling that and it's not a real tyre going down than fence it around Mount Panorama. So the Sharon Rentals car rejoins the track right now. Will Davison's back in behind the wheel of car 23 to take us to the chequered flag. He's now released after his 90-second pit stop, one hour and 46 minutes remaining. And you get the feeling there is so much more still to come around this famous Mount Panorama course. And no matter how many times you do this, no matter how many times Will Davison's been behind the wheel of around, around Mount Panorama, there's, there's nothing quite like coming out of pit lane, isn't there? It doesn't matter if it's with an hour and a half to go or the start of the race or in the smack bang in the middle of mayhem, but those nerves will be there, the same protocols will yep. be there. I'm interested to know, just especially off the back of that red flag as the cleanup now continues at the Lexus up the top of the mountain, is just what are they doing here to stay warm? What are they trying to do here so that when they don't jump in physically they're not cold because everything cools down so quickly right. at the moment. I've just been, before I came to join you guys, I went for a walk up the top uh, of the pit lane complex here. I went out the back, I checked the remaining GT World Challenge cars that are still there just because I'm a nerd and I want to perv, <laughs> I want to perv on millions of dollars of machinery. Yeah. But Nothing you know what? Dreaming. No matter what I did, I couldn't get warm. Yeah. So these drivers, as experienced as they are, these conditions will certainly put them to the test. So Will Davison now aboard car 23, as Noltz said, and I think they're in the same position as the Sherrins that we just heard from, and that was telling from Grant, and he said, we've got one CPS to go. So one compulsory pit stop of the six that they have to make to get to the end of the race. This car should be in a very similar position, though they've got better track position now with that slow inlap from Ian Sherrin. So one more stop to go. You can make that stop right up to the five hours and 30 minute mark. So there's an hour and 46 of the race to go. They'll run as long as they can now, drain this tank of fuel and then get the car back out and the Sharons have come back in so clearly that problem was unable to be resolved with a kick of the tyres and a play with the front axle on that car. So that will remove them from contention, they'll drop a lap down now even behind the safety car. So scratch a, another contender because this car had hovered around the top half a dozen cars for much of the day and certainly showed the race pace to go with the leaders that we'd been tracking across the course of the race. So focus on the rear of that car. They may be able to get out at least salvage a result and give up just yet to the Sharon Rentals team. They never have. That's why they've won this race. They've been class winners. They've done it all in Australian production car racing over the years. Don't like the look of that rear, though. As they peel off that MRF tyre. Field still making their way behind the back of the Hyundai safety car that spent plenty of laps out here today with Russell, Walden, Randall, Ben Barguana behind the wheel on his birthday today in the Burst and Auto Parts Audi. Still in fourth with Anton Di Pasquale. Still in fifth, Grant Denyer hanging tough there in seventh spot. Ryland Gray's back behind the wheel of car 221. And Will Davison also behind the wheel of car 23. It's a massive effort for these guys too to be running fourth outright, leading class A1. And I've just asked the team if, if they're good to go. So they've had five stops. I think they've still got one CPS to tick off on this car. And they're just entering their fuel window now. So they're about an hour and 40 with safety car, probably an hour and a half under green to get this car to the end on a tank of fuel. So they need to, I think they need to make one more pit stop, but they're looking really sharp at the moment. 
They started 17th on the grid. They finished ninth last year. This is the reason why the Hyundai safety car is out on the track. An ambitious move here. Even though there's enough room for the car to go through a bump at that kind of speed, near 200 k's an hour, sent the Lexus across the gravel trap into the tyre wall. And as soft as that tyre is, the velocity the car was carrying, certainly enough to do enough damage and put it on the tilt tray on the High Tech Oils replay. It's an odd one there, yeah. isn't it? That's a really odd one. Josh Bucket, what do you got for us? Yeah, Jen Solo, uh, the Sharon car that you're looking at has done uh, the rear subframe. So basically what holds the back end of the car in place oh. is broken on one of the mounts. Uh, so that is an enormous job to get fixed and I would suggest their day's done uh, from that, unfortunately. So they must be, maybe they've hit the wall. I mean, that sea of traffic again, we only saw it at the tail end. Did he make contact with the wall perhaps? Potentially, I couldn't see any damage on the rim or on okay. the rear guard of the of the car. Um, subframe mounts and and whatnot take an absolute pounding in these cars. Uh, it's it's actually a known thing on BMWs uh, of the past. So uh, unfortunately, it looks like it's uh, come a proper on this. So that top wishbone has broken away from its mount, so the the bearing is still hanging in there, but the wishbone flopping around. So, but that's not the wishbone breaking. It's actually torn the mount away from that rear subframe, as Josh was explaining. That's remarkable. And, and that's just not the thing you go and crack test, really, is it, to prepare for a race? It's, you'd think a, a subframe that holds the entire rear axle into the car is, is going to be durable <laughs> enough, but clearly the rigors of Mount Panorama are not quite there. But that's that's a new one for mine in seven back to six hours. Put that on your checklist. <laughs> Put that on your checklist before... It's getting pretty long, Matty, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Well, I did a little checklist uh, heading into today. If you, you know, if you're coming here as a driver, for instance, for the first time, what do you, what do you want to make sure you've got ahead of a six-hour sleep? Put that at one of the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Knowledge. You want to walk around this joint from Thursday to Friday to Saturday as many times as you can and ask as many questions as you can. The weird part about this replay, as we take a look at it, is the turn in on the Lexus right there. <sighs> is that a silver Astra? going up the inside and this is being looked at by the team upstairs in Motorsport Australia Race Control. So the front left looks sad I could see from our view as it was coming across there so he's in is out of control by the time that incident had happened and the tyre wall was waiting for him. Yeah. Here it is again. So McPhillamy Park Ooh. and it's made contact with that left front see it's just angled in you can see from that side it's just pitched in enough and Imagine if that was concrete like it was many, many years ago there, the speed they carry across them. And in the day, they'd arrest the cars there, but these days we've seen these cars skate over there with the speeds they carry. Just trying to play car spotter and work out what car it was up the inside, but it wasn't really clear enough to no. see. It looked like one of the HSV Astras in Class C, but I don't want to, to name and shame anyone and get it wrong, so we'll get that to you as the race goes on. What about Matty's checklist? We're up to that. Checklist, be ready for a restart anytime, <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> you know what once there? Basics. The old basics. Get the basics right here and you'll go a long, long way. But there's still a long way in this one. An hour and 38 to go. Sun shining as they form the freight train all the way down Conrod Strait. Hyundai safety car pulls away in the DBA chase and leaves Aaron Russell at the head of this queue. He made the move on the Sharon Rentals car. They still try and clean up some of the speedy drive that's been put down in that little short shoot into the chase. If you just joined our coverage in the closing two hours, we did have a lengthy red flag. Let's change the complexion of this race. Don't think how you see it right now is the way this race is going to end with one hour and 38 minutes remaining. The 2023 High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour goes back to green flag racing here on the mountain. And still, they come. Look at them all. BMW down the inside at turn one. So the HSV is out of position there. So it's Thomas Randall behind the wheel of 92. The yellow BMW M2. Car 24's got Garth Walden. He knows how to drive and win at this place. And Aaron Russell scampering away out in front. 
There's still some pit stops to come. We think most of these cars all have one stop to go, and that includes the Barguana Audi TT. Mm -hmm. They've definitely got one stop left, and then they'll be playing fuel saving to the end to get there. Screech of tyres up through the kink on the run to the Worth cutting. Other notable performers, Grant Denyer's up to seventh position and leading Class A2. The local Legends Mustang, they won that class last year, he and Tony Quinn. Ryder's done a super job today in that car. And Ryland Gray behind the wheel of 221. They have been a star performer. The other four Mustangs, so they're well inside the top 10. And meanwhile, Will Davison starting to gobble them up as well in car 23, the car that's led a majority of the laps today. Thomas Randall here is climbing all over the back of Garth Walden. Garth will love, love this. There is no way he'll make it easy for Thomas to get through. He used to be a professional driver, now full-time running Garth Walden Racing. It's a bit of an empire. Runs a huge amount of cars in a vast array of different categories and gets a steer every now and then and is always very, very quick. See how quick Aaron Russell was getting out of here. The car stepping out at the top of Solomon Park. The gap's out to one and a half seconds already. He wants to get on the move here and get away from the cars behind. Let Walden and Randall battle it out. Build a margin before getting to the next and final pit stops in this race. Di Pasquale still fourth. Barguana holding down Class A1 honours here. As into the chase we go. Those shots down Conrad are amazing, aren't they? The, imagine living on the side there. And there goes Will Davison down the inside of the HSV. It's a couple of laps down now, car 64. So it's out of position. It's the third time today that car's had a restart right at the very front of the field being a lap down. They would, they'd be right in the mix for an outright win if there was a wave around yeah. rule in this race, but there isn't. So they didn't get it. So on the first lap back under green, Aaron Russell leads. The margin 1.2 seconds. And gee, there's some energy in the circuit now as well. Aaron Russell sets his car's quickest lap of the race. 227.15. And Jade and Jade are going even quicker than that further back. Holly. Had, had the big off. Firstly, is Keith OK? Yeah, that's the main thing. Keith's OK. So we can repair the car. It may be repairable today. We'll see how we go. But, um, yeah, just came together with another car, which is always the challenge in multi-class racing. And did you get a good look at what actually happened? It wasn't quite clear on the replay. Yeah, I, I've only seen the replay briefly, so I can't really comment. It's uh, The Lexus's strength is a straight line speed, so it is, it is a little bit awkward across the top being an 1,800-kilo car, so... I can sort of see how it's happened, but um, yeah, the main thing is he's okay. And you're no stranger to many laps around this track here, but how special is it, you know, in any type of car and how much different is it in the Lexus? It's um, it's actually scarier in that car doing 232s than is in a GT car doing 202s, believe it or not. You know, it's a, it's a big, heavy car that goes quick in a straight line, so it um, keeps you on your toes, but, you know, any lap around this place is a good lap, so I'm happy to be here. Not bad luck. Thanks, Steve. Cheers. Pity too. I, I mean, we've been camped right next door to their garage, and I've had my eyes on that Lexus all weekend. I, I would have thought they'd be up for 500 bucks from Super Cheap for <laughs> best presented, although they're a little bit dusty and rusty at the moment. Good, good to hear that Keith is okay. You've really got to take advantage of any race, but especially here when it comes to you, and that's what's happening with Aaron Russell at the front at the moment. He's now. Um, leading the race, of course, and in the last 10 or 15 minutes, everything's fallen his way. Mm -hmm. So now the opportunity for him is to take advantage of that space and try and put a gap on Walden behind him. But Garth Walden's closed the gap just a little bit. First to second, now under a second. And not all of these leading cars punching out personal best laps in the race so far. So 76 laps in, with an hour and 33 to go, and all of a sudden the pace is just energised. So the sun's out, there's a little bit of UV into the circuit, so track temperature's up. Everyone's got fresh tyres on. Well, a lot of people have got fresh tyres, remember, after that red flag period. So that's going to help the cause as well. Lap times, 2.26.2, 25.8 Walden, 25.9 Randall, 25.6 Di Pasquale. They're all absolutely flying at the pointy end of the field. We haven't seen these kind of laps since lap two yeah. of the race. So about 11.50 this morning since these kind of lap times were punching out. So they know the time to go is now. As Russell continues to lead, Walden runs in second. It's a Garth Walden prepared car running in third spot behind his crew. 
And that little happy hour for Aaron Russell lasted about two minutes. Because <laughs> yes. he's now got Walden Randall, Di Pasquale all chasing him down in a hurry. You can see the ball in his mirror. Yeah, he's rolled in and they've called last drink straight away on the, the cheap heights, hasn't he? <laughs> so these leaders going at it and they're still pushing on. So Randall unable to get past Garth Wald and Anton just taking a watching brief. That's him in the PI store entry. And Andrew Saul, Anthony Saul, I should say, owns this car. And Burgess did a terrific job early, a real under the radar stint. To be fair, he did a lot of it behind the safety car with all those interruptions mid race. But Anton should be in for the finish now, short opening stint for car number four. So he's got the bulk of the heavy lifting to get this car to the end. What they've also done is they've gapped Jade No Jada. However, there's an asterisk for mine over car 21. The Juice has been doing good things today. I got a sneaking suspicion they could be the first car in the field to have ticked off all of their compulsory pit stops, which means their final stop to get to the end will be fuel only. So their final pit stop can be quicker than the 90 seconds that those around them will have to take to tick off all those CPS boxes. So. There could be something to roll out for car 21 later in the race. And the strategic uh, pieces begin to fall into place here at Mount Panorama. As they go past the Bathurst monorail there, I'm not sure if you noticed that, there is a, literally a monorail parked on the inside of Conrad Strait, a little Bathurst obscurity. Some pretty upset passengers too, wanting to get home. They've been sitting there since October. <laughs> sure put North Haverbrook on the map though, didn't it? <laughs> Can't wait to get to Ogdenville. Now these are the four cars at the front of the field right now. Russell. Walden, Randall, D. Pasquale, as you mentioned, O'Jada just a little bit back, Will Davison in the car as well. So positions five and six just out of their reach at this stage, but an hour and a half to go in the six hour. This has got the 2022 feels about it, hasn't it? Except it's about 30 minutes early. Four door closes there from the number two on Saul, so he's got a lap car in between. And now clears him, but that would have got the heart rate up for the number four BMW. So Class X cars now filling the top six of this race. Three drops back in the 226s with 90 minutes remaining. 226.3 on the previous lap for Russell, 226.4 for Walden. The gap sits at 1.1 seconds, but suddenly the Cavage. And Randall car with Randall behind the wheel. I don't know how Garth Walden feels about this with one of his own cars Oi! as it steps out and almost grazes the wall at the exit of the Worth Cutting. The temperature is certainly rising, Stubbsy. Yeah, we're just talking to the team here, to Simon Hodges with the J No Jader in the car. And uh, they have ticked off all their CPS, but the Beamers, they think an hour and 10, uh, same as the Russells to get home. So they do have to come in and get fuel, but CPS ticked off for them. Yeah, thanks, Stubbsy. So one compulsory stop to go for the Russells that lead the race and these cars that are squabbling, the team cars, squabbling over second place. But they've got to make a compulsory pit stop, which is 90 seconds. What the Ojeda car can do is do fuel only, so they'll do it to time. So just enough fuel to get to the finish. So the car in fifth place, their final pit stop will be shorter than the four cars in front. So they might not have track position now, but it could come to them at the final stop, especially if this race has a more meaningful green flag run between now and the chicken flag. Because he doesn't need to do the 90 second stop time. That's a big gain. Roll the dice early and it's going to pay big. Thomas Randall is just waiting to pounce here. He's seen from behind Garth Walden's car. Walden being crossed up left, right and centre on this lap. Take a little look on the outside. It's just a matter of if. Not really so, but when. There's got to be a point, surely, where Garth goes, nah, do you know what? You're quicker, you go. I'll follow you for a bit. Let's both work together as team cars run by GWR. Let's go out after the Russells, who are now out to over two seconds at the race lead. Aaron Russell, 225.7. That's that car's quickest lap of the race. Jader no Jada has done a 225.2. He's just set the quickest lap of the race, full stop. So there's huge energy in the field right now as we all race towards what will be the final pit stop. Now, the other magic number, gents, to worry about is the number stops, he said, which is an hour and 10, which is a fuel load for one of these BMWs. Any stop before that, and you have serious worries 
about getting to the end of the race without a friendly safety car to help you with some fuel saving. Right. It's good, isn't it? It's awesome. Cool. Hasn't this been a bonus for Russell, though? While these two are squabbling away, Aaron Russell stretched his lead out to 2.3 seconds. It was down to close to half a second after the last restart, and they just continue to battle away behind him. And the man with the watching brief is Anton D. Pasquale. Why join this blue? Let these two duke it out. See what happens. There might be a Bradbury moment coming through. <laughs> ADP's just waiting. Smart driving. No data, just replaces his own fastest lap of the race at the end of the 79th lap, 2.25.2. He sits behind his crew of cars and the man in the box seat right now in car 21 with Will Davison. A further four, make it five seconds behind. Through the dipper as the sun disappears into the west. A thrilling finish coming our way here in the 2023 20, edition of the High Tech Oils Bath of Six Hours. See, they're all maxed out down here at the elbow. You'd think this is the last lap. <laughs> if this is a, a, a scene setter for what we're going to have on the last lap, not on here for it. Man. What a race. All of a sudden, come alive after that red flag and that last safety car. So that's the leader. Aaron Russell, the margin out to 3.2 seconds now. He's gained another second this lap. And it's a combination of where Aaron Russell is on the road, the pace obviously that he's got it, as we mentioned, the fight that these two are having. Here he comes. I think Walter's a bit slower through the chase, but he covered him off nicely. Randall had the pace. And look now, Dean Pasquale has decided it's time to join this party. He was a couple of seconds behind on this lap, and now he's run on the rear bumper of the 92. The other thing for mine is that there's not an enormous amount of pace aboard car 23 with Will Davidson. So sixth position at the moment, but they're now a full 11 seconds out of the race lead, and he's five seconds behind Jaden Ojeda. So they don't have an enormous amount of car speed, at least not to go with these leading group of cars. Now, whether that's management or not, probably the big question of where we're at right now about how that car is performing because they don't have at this point in the race the car speed to dice with these guys the fastest of the top four in that last lap was Anton D. Pasquale but just by a whisker and behind them Jaden Ojeda a 225-28 so he's starting to close the gap and looks to try and join this foursome at the front oh Again, Walden slides out at the worth cutting. But Russell's two seconds quicker on that lap alone. It goes out to four seconds. He'll be loving what's going on behind right now. Here's these deeper squally to get into this. And Ojeda is there now as well. So two battle packs of two cars. Got him. Uh, yeah, and, and that I think that was a friendly move from Garth. Off you go, mate. Not sure why it didn't happen on Mountain Straight or Conrod, where it's slightly less perilous to do so. But uh, either way, Randall goes through. And that needed to happen because Aaron's just scampering away out in front. So there was a point where you have to give up the fight and let the faster car go through. But I wonder if 24's got some issues because he's now being harassed by Anton Di Pasquale, who's going to try and go around the outside. Ojeda wants to go down the inside. Garth Walden is in a world of pain at the moment. What's going on with car 24? And he gets split either side by these two BMWs. And he's dropping away quickly from this group. And it's side by side now between Ojeda and Di Pasquale. Battle of the BMWs. Who's going to blink first on the way down? Into the chase. Give it to the juice. Squeezes his way into the position. It felt like it was always going to be Ojeda who was going to commit to that, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he's probably got more to prove at this point than Anton Di Pasquale does. Great pass. So, car 21 has come alive in this one. Jaden and Ojeda up to third. And as far as we understand, they have ticked all their boxes from a pit stop point of view. So, it'll be fuel only for them at the final stop. And it'll be shorter than those around. And we're now 15 minutes away from that window opening to get to the end on fuel. He's gone up the charts with a bullet, hasn't he, Jaden no Jada? And it was the lap before that really did the damage. And yeah. for those in front of him, it put him in the picture, that 225-2, put him in the picture of those top four. Yeah. He didn't know that Garth Walden was going to go backwards at a rate of knots, but you've got to be there to take advantage when the door opens. And now he finds himself 
in third position. So Russell leading the way. His gap's still good. It's 4.7 seconds. Then Randall, then OJ to Anton Di Pasquale. Well, he's been having to throw punches left, right and centre. Garth <laughs> Walden, we don't know what the issue is there, but Will Davison will be ready to pounce on him in an instant as well. So we'll follow the Walden car for you. Last time around, 2.33. All the pace vanished. I mean, that's seven seconds slower than what they were doing three laps ago. But I'm interested to see if Randall can get out after the Russells. If this car, the M2, has got the raw speed to go out after the race leading go karts go BMW M4, which on balance has been one of the quicker cars all weekend. Oh, Jada throwing the thing at Brock Scott. Like it was sure it's not qualifying. It was cranked <laughs> sideways over the curb there, down through the S's. Comes the 62 BMW to put them a lap down, so they've caught the tail enders already after the restart. It's on the 82nd lap of this race. It's had a bit of everything here today. A false start at the early point of the day, a red flag, and now a spicy end coming. They work their way down oh, the straight. Who's that off on the grass, Nolts? It's one of the BMWs with two wheels off, halfway down Conrod Strait. You're that, right, the mind. That was a wild, wild moment. Could that have been Ooh. the Randall car? Could it have been? Well, I think Ojeda's gone through. I wonder if it was Jaden Ojeda. Because this traffic has been a nightmare for Tom Randall. Yeah, it was. He's gone through. I think that was Jaden Ojeda. Passing people with two wheels on Conrod. Please. The boy has no fear. He's, he's had a Will Brown. Race. He's had his weak picks for lunch, that's for sure. So Ojeda goes through. He is second. Check Here this out. Is. Conrod straight. Watch car 21. White Background. BMW. There he is. Oh, what grass? What are you, you talking are about? You're kidding me. It's like an extra few horsepower on that grass today. <laughs> that is awesome. That is, <laughs> Matty, to use one of your old uh, jobs, play of the day for mine. Garth Morgan's come into the pits while well, that's been happening, boys. In car 24. So our pit reporters will be on that one. He's dropped out this mix now. How did he keep that straight incident? How did he keep his booty to it for <laughs> one? <laughs> it just seemed like it found more power. And I think a little bit of caution from Thomas Randall in that move as well was held up behind the lap car. And a whole lot of ain't care from Jaden just to send it. And gee, it paid off. The margin between that working and not is not particularly large, though. What a great period of the car race this has been. And pity for Garth Walden, too. It'll be interesting to see just how long, what kind of problem it was and how long he was struggling with it because he was muscling the, you know, what out of that car to try to keep it in front of Thomas Randall. Molly? Just been down with the GWR guys. Not getting a whole lot of information, but yeah, it is fuel. Looks like they're running low on fuel. That's why we saw that drop in pace. Okay, so it was fuel, more fuel conservation trying to get that window out, but with an hour and 21 to go without meaningful safety car, that car probably won't get to the end on this tank of fuel, especially if it continues at this pace. That's not quite in the fuel window for a BMW. Unless so they've got something up their sleeve that we don't know about, which... It's about would, 10 minutes, isn't it? Yeah. Wouldn't put it out of the realms of possibility that they do have <laughs> something up their sleeve. But this day is going, anything's possible. True. Well, it could just be a case of, look, we're probably going to get another safety car based on the way the day's rolled out. So let's roll the dice. Let's get it in. So Randall and Di Pasquale, third and fourth on the track. BMWs, one, two, three, four, and five. Ryland Gray continues to hold on to sixth position, but a fair way away from these guys ahead. But what a standout performance with Ryan Kasher in that car as well. We're in car with Will Davison as he comes down to complete another lap. Let's go to pit lane, Stubbsy. So in the Will Davison car at the moment, they're just struggling for straight line speed. It's been an issue that they've had for the last little while. They're really really slow down the line especially compared to the other beamers such as Ojeda so they tried to have a bit of a play with it in the last stop but it doesn't seem to have improved the situation so that's the issue for them. Good update thanks Stubbsy and that's a concern because even if they do get into that leading battle late in the race then they are going to be fighting with one arm tied behind their back uh, Car 24 Garth jumped out and they've put Tyler Everingham back in that car 
you'd imagine to go to the end now. So they've rolled the dice. They're the first ones to do so. Ticked all the boxes. They're going to see if they could get that car to the end and MacGyver themselves a Bathurst victory. <laughs> MacGyver. <laughs> It's another one on the checklist. Yep. <laughs> here's, a, here's a piece of string and a paper clip. Go on, win Bathurst. <laughs> Watch 10 episodes of MacGyver. There's your research done. Richard Dean Anderson might be in his dreams three. tonight. <laughs> Interesting stage of the race too, not just with that one hour 10 mark approaching, but what are we, close to half past four local yeah. time. So everything starts to change, not so much weather-wise. It doesn't say we're going to get bothered with any rain. He says... <laughs> un unknowingly at Bathurst, but this is when it starts to get a little bit darker. The sun's really low. It starts to get a little bit cool or the wind starts to pick up. So those variable conditions start to play havoc with cars that have been going since quarter to 12 this morning. 5.49 local time is the sunset. We're scheduled to finish at just before 5.45. Now, remember, the sun's going to go behind the mountain, so it'll be darker before we get to 5.49. You're right, the sun on Pitt Strait has played havoc here for the last 60 or 70 years. We've barely seen the sun this weekend here. 12 degrees outside. It feels like five on our screen. We follow the big Holden on its way up Mountain Strait. Molly. Darren Forrest, you're having a great run, 16th overall, fourth in class. Paul's out there. He's done a cracking job all race, as, as yourself as well. Yeah, no, we're having a really good run. Um, we've got all our compulsories out of the way, and... Um, yeah, he's going to stay in the car to the end. Uh, he's younger than me, so he can have a bit of a go, but hopefully, yeah, we go all right. We were just chatting before about uh, this rim damage that you had. I don't know if the camera can pan down here. So you were running around. How many laps did you do with this tyre? Everything still held on fine? 15, 20 laps maybe with it like that, yeah. So but I'm feeling this bump, 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 and everyone's going, no, you'll be right, you know. Car's not haunted, you'll be right, Darren, press on. So I did, so happy days, we made it through. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, glad you got some clean, uh, cleaner rims on there now because we actually want to present you with the best presented team for, for your class. So congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and as part of that, uh, Super Cheap Auto are giving you $500 gift voucher to spend. So I don't think you can buy those rims, but there's a lot of stuff that you, you can buy there. Thank you, Super Cheap. It's awesome they're getting me on this event. And, um, thank you very much for this. It's because my crew looks so smart. That's why we want it, not the car. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. A very well deserved. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's a real surprise. It is. <laughs> And on that note, we'll keep the presentations going because the best presented team in Group E, we've got Mark to bits alongside. He didn't know what we'd got him for. $500 courtesy of Super Cheap Auto. How good is that? So here's your voucher as well to take down to the shop. You're a Geelong man. You can head into the store down there. Mark, congratulations. Excellent. Thank you very much. Do we? Can I keep this a secret from the rest of the team? <laughs> yeah, you can. I'll never know. <laughs> Stick that in a pocket then, show it. Beautiful. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Super Cheap. Um, thanks, everyone, at the Bath of the Six Hour. It's been a fantastic event so far. First time for all of us uh, doing this event, and it's been an absolute ball. We're loving it. And you purchased the Class C winning car from last year. You're right in the mix. Tell us about this, Teddy, because we've seen it up and down the lane. It's been on the car all weekend. What? What is the story? Well, he's a bit of an attention seeker, old Bear here. Um, he goes by the name of Bear. Um, he's been uh, Andrew's lifelong companion, as far as I've known Andrew anyway. So Andrew's out driving the car now, doing a fantastic job for our sponsors, 1-800 Lasagna, um, LK Diesel and uh, heaps of other sponsors that have been helping us out this weekend, so we couldn't do it without all of them. Having an absolute ball, loving it. We're getting to the crescendo of the race, so I won't take too long, but the 1-800 Lasagna, tell us the story there. Well, 1-800 uh, Lasagna is um, a restaurant that's been started up by a good friend of ours who races with us in the Victorian Porsche series, Joey Kellogg. Um, started up during COVID and um, just boomed, so people are getting... Uh, Lasagna ordered from home when uh, they couldn't go out for meals, and um, yeah, it was fantastic for him. The business boomed, and he's here sponsoring us for the weekend. So, uh, we're big thanks to Joey. Oh, we love it. Every car in this race has a story. This is one of the Rippers. Bear, go well. Mark, well done. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Stubbsy and Molly have been doing the Oprah down there. You get a voucher. You get a voucher. <laughs> Everybody gets a voucher. They've well, never been so popular in pit lane. Yeah. Poor Andrew was the meat in the lasagna just then, wasn't <laughs> he, coming through the chase? They were six deep there. Yeah, it's busy in Class E, isn't it? But you spend your lifetime looking backwards. Let's be honest, they won because they're sponsored by a lasagna company. Exactly. But the car does look brilliant. Uh, thank you to Super Cheap Auto, we've got to say, for offering up that prize. And um, g'day to Justin Murray, a bit unwell apparently. I'm watching on from a hospital bed. So we hope you get better soon, Justin. Uh, hope you're okay, mate, as we've got a HSV parked up on the run-up to the Worth Cutting. But thanks to Justin and the team at Super Cheap for their support of this race. Yeah. 
Krause, if this car doesn't stop, look at the time. One hour and 12, we're not near that window that they want to be at. It's still running. They give it time as much as they can to get it running under its own power, but it's such a busy part of the racetrack. Oh, the Subaru getting mugged by some BMWs. Critical timing, critical timing. We just saw that before we went to the Best Presented Awards going up Mountain Straight, so it's grinded to a halt there at the Worth Cutting. Car 29 of Paul Rasm and Darren Forrest. Oh, safety, safety car. car. It's right on the edge yep. of getting to the end on fuel. It'll be nervous for a lot of people. For Garth Walden's team who pitted the 24 car, a couple of laps ago, this will be a, a sigh of relief for them because they'll be able to fuel save and it might get them off the hook and they might actually end up with some track position there. So expect pit lane to be very, very busy in the next couple of minutes. And then conserve, conserve with an hour and 10. By the time they get to the pits, it'll be about maybe an hour and 10 and 30 minutes. And look, OJ has got right to the back of the Russells in the race lead. So these two will enter pit lane locked together. How cool, what a setup this is for the end of the race with an hour and 13 to go. They've got a, a lap car they can't overtake as well and they peel straight down into pit lane. They need to be careful to not trip the pit lane speed limiter either in terms of getting done for speeding. A couple will have already today. We know there's a battle right there. Uh, we know that this one's gonna go to the end. Russell and OJ to car 58. Car 21. They've both got the pace and we've seen that. Randall's brought into the picture. Di Pasquale's been there in car four in the picture. Will Davison's a really interesting one for me. A couple of laps just before this, he punched away some good numbers. Fastest in the top five out there. And this, of course, brings everything down. But as we know from what Stubbsy told us, they don't have the straight line speed that they would like at the moment. So we believe car 21 just needs to take on the minimum amount of fuel, doesn't need to do the 90 second stop. Yeah, correct, so they can they can fill it. The problem is though, Nolts, is that it's a full tank of fuel, so it's still gonna take some time, but they could get some track position out of that. Everyone over the line, there goes Ojeda, and they're still working on the Russell's car, so they're going to get track position. So ticking off those compulsory stops earlier has paid off for car 21. Driver change in the Russell entry. But they would have been hoping for that to happen under green flag conditions to get the margin longer. Yeah, but you'd take it, won't you? Absolutely. And, and at this point, track position, I think, is king in that run to the flag. Better to lead than not. The way his last 10 laps have been, I'm sure he'd better drive yes. away again. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just pass some more people down Conrod or something if he needs to. No problems. <laughs> or with two wheels on the grass. So Di Pasquale released. Ryland Gray in, the Class A2 leader in that black and gold Mustang, Century 21 car. So they're outside the deep in the top 10. And the A1 leader to Dylan O'Keefe pits in the Merck and Will Davison has to give way to Anton Di Pasquale. The two teammates at DJR are going to be line of stern for this. He thought about it. Yeah. He thought about it but tucked out behind, tucked in behind the four, I should say. So once again, the tool trays sent out and collected on the customer. I wonder with the 29 hold guys whether that's a fuel pump issue again. They swapped it out after warm up this morning. So maybe that's come back to haunt them here today. Good point, Knox and it's going to take them a bit of time to retrieve that really tough spot of the track there. The, the climb up there, it's tough in a car. It's harder to walk up there through the worth cutting. There it is, the Ford Recovery crew. Big shout out once again to them and the officials, volunteers, Matty, nearly 300 of them here over the course of Easter to help with this event. The High Tech Oils Bath, the six hour. This Ford Recovery car has had plenty of customers today. It's once again, the Hyundai safety car is out leading the Juice, who leads the way from Russell, Randall, Di Pasquale, and Will Davison. That'll be the order when we go back to green flag racing soon. And of those five nolts, four stayed in the car. Drew Russell jumped in, Aaron Russell out. So the only driver change out of those top five through this cycle through pit lane was in car number 58. That was planned. We heard them talk about that today, that Drew would finish the race God, can you imagine Wayne Russell if oh. they could do this? He's one of the most excitable cats you'll ever meet. <laughs> if they do this today, 
there will be a national public holiday in Newcastle. (laughs) (laughs) Just in that little area. Uh, The Ford Ranger recovery V6 ute is out and the flatbed uh, truck there as well to recover the Commodore from the Worth cutting. We're under the Hyundai safety car once again today. This is all set up. So driver time will will play a role. I know Jada and Hodges have had to be very careful with their splitting of the drivers today because if you're a two-driver combination, it's especially noticeable. And there's smoke. Smoke coming from the Audi TTRS. The Barguana boys have been doing such a good job and they played the strategy game. But that car does not look healthy. an idea of that blinding sun. We'll have a listen to the Audis. It goes past the scene of the incident. Sounds okay. Yeah. Ben, Sounds Audi. It's Jude Bagwana behind the wheel. Just scrolling through some pages on the dash there. Trying to have a look, but that is trailing heavy smoke. And if he doesn't pit on his own accord, you'd suggest that he'll get the mechanical black flag to do that. But is it is it an engine or is it um, is, is something it rubbing work? or what did you call Barks earlier? The Minister for Enthusiasm. Well, he is. <laughs> but I was about to say Barks Senior, but there's so many Barks Seniors yeah, well, Juniors in between us. Pick pick one of them. Yeah. Yes. Gee, I think back. What's that? 23 years now. I think back just to the right of where we were, and I remember standing just before they went out on the podium and Barks and GT there, and boy, was he the Minister for Enthusiasm that day? <laughs> I thought he was going to crowd surf on us. Second to the day when he won at Calder Park, I think, in 1998. Hour and five minutes remaining of this race with the safety car out once again. Probably time to recap this, boys, and settle in for the final portion of the 2023 High Tech Oils about the six hour. It started at 11.45 as we're about to approach 5 p.m. here at Mount Panorama. That was one of the hard luck stories right there, wasn't it? The Andrew Minicky group car going out early in the race, but at 11.50, the race got underway after the aborted start. The BMWs led us away down in turn number one on the Super Chief Auto highlights of this great day here at Mount Panorama. Yeah, it's been one of those days, Nolts. It took us two goes to get the race actually started, (laughs) and it's just gone on from there. Some great moves early. This was a wild, wild moment that ultimately would bring out the red flag and a race suspension for the first time in High Tech Oil's Bathurst six-hour history. The Russells have been electrifying. No matter where they are in the field or who's behind the wheel, that car has been so quick. Hard luck story for the Lexus RCF hard into the fence at McPhillamy Park. That would bring out another safety car. Then the big story for the Sharon Rentals car. Broken upright in this car that would see them back into the pits. They're still in there now, several laps down. Then it was peak hour when Garth Walton's car began to falter on the way down the mountain. They first get Di Pasquale and then Ojeda in the 21. Went to the grass on the inside at first, so three BMWs wide on the way down Comrade Strait. This is when the Juice moved ahead of the four. He now leads this race, incidentally, if you just joined the coverage today. Car 21 sharing with Simon Hodges. It's had a bit of everything. Now, watch the left-hand side. Forget the bitumen, let's use the grass. Two for the price of one at over 200 kilometres an hour for Jaden Ojeda. We're laughing, but it's really no laughing matter how quick that was happening. This was the last round of pit stops that happened just a few moments ago and brings us up to date as we enter the final hour of this race. It's one of the best things I've seen <laughs> in this race. So cool. <laughs> how was your Easter Sunday, Juice? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, just rooster tailed it down, Conrod. <laughs> Here's the leaderboard. So Class X cars dominating, but any one of the six at the front there can win this race. The Mustang looking really good in Class A too. The Barguana is still out there and going okay, but there's some question marks. In fact, Jude Barguana is in pit lane now, so that has rolled through the lane. Jake Camilleri and Scotty Nicholas still leading the way in Class C and that unbelievable Mazda 3 MPS. It is just unstoppable. Dowsett, Madrim and Bloxham doing nice things there in Class D. They've led most of the day in that battle. And Alexander Julian Fowler continue to lead the way in Class E. I need to give a shout out to Lockie Bloxham's dad who brought us uh, some barbecue sausages to the commentary box, which was very good of him. Oh no, it's the Class yeah. C leader. Just to give him props once again, it's come to a stop on the way up to the Worth Cutting. Just, uh, what, 200 metres away from where 
The Holden was being retrieved. What has happened to Jake Camilleri and the Grand Prix Mazda team who've led this all day long? Class C honours has now stopped. They're 19th outright, and they've got a lap up their sleeve. Brock Giblin in the HSV Astra is next. I wonder if this is just a control alt delete again. Stubbsy. Well, happy birthday, Ben. The mountain has given you a present that you didn't want. Tell us what's happened with the Audi. They've just turned her off. Uh, it's absolutely gut-wrenching. Uh, look, uh, it appears to be a coil or something. Um, but, yeah, I bet my leg is looking at this situation going, are you serious? Like, all that work and, yeah. We're back on the podium, but we gave it a red-hot crack and, yeah, that's just motor racing. It is, and your family has been around it. I mean, you've had them here for your birthday and to share Easter with them. It's, it's still a special time, isn't it, as, as hard as it is to cop? Yeah, absolutely. Look, we win together, we lose together. We're a family, so we do this motorsport thing and we love it, and that's just how it goes. We'll see you back next year? Absolutely. <laughs> that's the spirit, mate. Well done. Enjoy the celebrations or what you can of your birthday, and thanks for your time. Awesome. Thank you. Not the present Ben Bargwana was looking for. They finished ninth in this race last year. Of course, Ben won here in Super Cheap Auto TCR, as well as a pole position a couple of years back as well. Their day has come to an end. As we're in car with the 45, the Ram Motorsport entry leading their class today, Krause. Now we're starting to get a feel of how it's all looking. Dylan O'Keefe behind the wheel of the Ram Motorsport, Mercedes-Benz. As we lap behind the safety car, one hour, one minute remaining. And remember, there's a story here because this team have won the race the last two years in Class A1, looking for a three-peat. No one in any class has gone back to back to back at Mount Panorama. So Mike Sheargold looking to be the first to do that for Class A1. This is the triple two Volkswagen. These guys have just flown under the radar all day. Super <laughs> performance. In Terry behind the wheel. Eighth outright, second in class. 30th on the grid they started today as Walden and with Tyler Everingham jumping in behind the wheel. That'll be fuel. That'll be a confidence fuel because they, they were outside the fuel window when they stopped with an hour and 20 to go. So fortunately doing it under safety car, they, they lose a heap of track position, but it keeps them in the race and they should be able to go flat out to the end now where there could be some question marks over the remainder of those leading contenders who have just popped through the field. It's my favourite part of the track. Mountain straight, my favourite part of the track. Really? Yep. I mean, there's all these headline-grabbing acts all the way around this 6.213 kilometres, but this, to me, opens up everything. I mean, you, you're either coming out of pit lane and unleashing yourself onto this, or you're taking on turn one, getting past all the mess, say, at the start, and this is what's in between you and mayhem thereafter. This is where they take the biggest breath, they pull down on the belts, and that's where they let ride. That's, to me, the gateway to everything that unfolds afterwards. I absolutely love it, especially, well, not when they're going that slow, and they wouldn't love it either. Molly? After the, you slow down when you were coming out of the car. Oh, we thought it was a few of them Yeah, unfortunately, we had a bit of a gearbox driver. Uh, well, uh, red flag, there was some vertical issue, and then, uh, yeah, obviously, we lost third and fifth gear, which is not an idea. Um, we come in, reset it, so it was an unscheduled stop. Uh, it seems to be okay now, but we can, we've got enough fuel to get the end. We'll see what happens. All right, best of luck. Thanks. <laughs> so, Gar Garp all along with his customary sense of humour there. So, gearbox issues on car 24, so that, that explains what the issue is, as the class seat leader gets towed back. Uh, Matty, thank you. It's been a thrill. Uh, we look forward to you being down there in the thick of it all at the end of this one, whoever it is that comes out on top. Been a pleasure, boys. Uh, if you're okay, I'll just sub in a bloke called Ambrose. Yeah. You're up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Matty White as the field make their way down over the mountain once again. The shadow's getting longer. Temperature, could it get any colder? Probably. Almost in single digits now. It's about to get red hot out on this Mount Panorama course with 58 minutes remaining. Marcus Ambrose has picked the best time to slot back in after one of the most adventurous hours of the day. I've, I've come back to see the sprint for the finish, but this race cannot get any rhythm to it, can it? Nope, not at all. Nine safety cars and a red flag stoppage. Not Believe it or not, not the record, which is 11. So 
I don't want to jinx it in the remaining hour, but uh, we're not there yet. <laughs> Which I've just obviously done. Well done. <laughs> 59 minutes to go. Yeah, thank you. Four yeah. seconds. Safe. Yep. <laughs> Noted. Uh, we should get lights out on the Hyundai safety car this time by. And Jaden Ojeda, what a performance this has been by a really impressive young guy. He's out of Sydney. He's raced supercars. He's had some wildcard starts in the main game. He's plied his trade through the development categories. But a Bathurst victory, gee, that would put a real stamp that you've got big things coming your way. And we're looking forward to seeing how this plays out. Keeping in mind that they should be good on fuel, these Class X cars, but there's a little asterisk on it because they were right on the very edge of their fuel window when they made their final pit stop. This safety car will have helped. They'll buy a few extra laps by running around at 50 or 60 kilometres an hour. Now it's time to burn it though, Nolts because we've got a sprint race set up. There's less than an hour on the clock. All the cars are stacked together that are contending for this race. So four cars back is the blue BMW of Drew Russell. Right behind him, Tom Randall. Right behind him, Anton Di Pasquale. And yes, the next car in line is Will Davison. So they're all racked and stacked and ready to go. And Jaden O'Jade has got a few valuable lap cars between him and the chasing pack. Multiple lead changes, different names at the front. A couple of cars decide to peel away and get out of harm's way, maybe. Let the field settle down with Ojeda. With the biggest move of the day with those two wheels on the grass before the last caution period. But now, with 56 minutes remaining, we go back to green flag racing and keep an eye on that blue BMW. He needs to get going because he's already dropped two seconds. Here they come, just a full pack of BMWs <laughs> chasing up to Ojeda. Uh, what an advantage he had off the start here. He was able to actually get away early on that green flag. The BMWs behind could not pass those lap down cars until they passed the control line. So he's got a big advantage now, but we've got some big talent behind him. Gunning for him. Thomas Randall, Pasquale, Davidson. I mean, that's a big pain in our sport. It's going to be a very interesting last 25 minutes of the, if this race, if it, if it goes green. I mean, if there's another safety car, we start all over again. It's almost a guarantee we'll get oh, a safety car. It wouldn't surprise me, based on the way this day's rolled out. It has been completely insane. It's what we love about endurance racing in this place. You can come in with a script. You can come in with a plan. Oh, we think this will happen. This might happen. This will be the strategy. And then 25 minutes into the race, you can almost guarantee that all that paperwork gets thrown into the air and the curveballs are pitched and something completely mad and wonderful happens. And that's what we've had today with another great show in the Bathurst Six Hour. We're on the 90th lap of the race. Not going to go anywhere near troubling the record, which is 131 in this race. So <laughs> they're going they're lucky to get to 100. But this is now a sprint race to the end. And Ojeda making hay while the sun literally shines. It is a stunning afternoon. Cool, but beautiful in the central west of New South Wales. What's impressive is how quick these guys have got confidence. These tyres were cooled right off. There is no track temperature out there and they're racing like they've been doing it for 10 laps. Yeah, that's right. You put your fastest drivers in though to, to complete this race um, and we, we're seeing a real shootout here of some of the, the young talent of Australia right now. These guys are on their game. They're going to push these cars to the limits. The brakes are wearing out. The tyres, the left side tyres been on for the whole day. Yeah, they're sick of it. Yep, and, and <laughs> these are production cars. I mean, you know, they, they don't like being pushed this hard. So the last hour is, um, is going to be a really tough battle here with these BMWs. You can just see, it's just a real swarm of them. But Ojada seemed, he was fast in practice. He went P1 in practice That's one right. here this weekend. And he's been pretty low profile, but he's had car speed all day. And a really, I think the right word is professional job by Simon Hodges, who's the, the AM driver in that combination. Really solid stuff. They will be very close on their driver time. So three and a half hours for a two driver combination. Three and a half hours is the maximum amount of time any one driver can spend in the car in the race. And they'll be really close. I think they're safe, but it will be marginal between them. With Hodges having done about two and a half hours based on the numbers I've been crunching. But the team will be well armed with that information. As into pit lane comes Will Davison. So out of that leading group of cars, and I'm not sure at this stage of the day, that is a strategic move. Remember, they've been struggling with straight line speed in car 23. Is this another of the key contenders to stumble? It's a mystery. They came in during that pit stop cycle as well. So certainly not fuel as Russell slides up through Griffins. And that's the invitation that Randall needed on the way up to the top of the worth cutting. Won't be able to do too much through here. Tire, that's down on the left front. It does look like it's got a flat left front tire there. 
or suspension. Tie would be preferable if you're the 23 team because at least you can replace that. Wow. Another one going on. I mean, that barring a, a, a hefty safety car late pulls them out of the game and in fact won't want to spend too much more time there. The leader's already at the top of the hill. Now, another factor here this afternoon is the sun. The sun is starting to set and it, it, it blinds you into the turn in turn one. I discovered that on Friday when I was trying to do the uh, the, shoot, the, um, the commentary lap for you guys. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely going to come into play here. The track's getting cold and it's a very chilly day and Russell's starting to really struggle with this car. This car's been pretty loose all day. The rear end has not been in the track. And he's, you see it now where it's showtime. He's, he's battling to keep the speed. It's the straight, it's pit straight here, and it's the run-ups that cut in where the sun's really bad this time of the day, isn't it? It is. This is the battle for second, for third, and for fourth place. It's being led by Drew Russell, the Nova Castrian, who spent time working his way through the development series. He spent a lot of time in Super 2 with a family-run team. Had a couple of cracks at the great race as a co-driver. Never quite made it full-time in the main game, but certainly had the ability and boy, as he showed that today, his lap in qualifying yesterday was outstanding to get on the front row of the grid. And they've put such a good performance in for Go Karts Go. And this team last year won the Australian Production Car Championship and the Class X Ultimate Class as well. So they have got a proven track record. They might not carry the big superstar surname, but when it comes to this style of racing, they know how to win races. And they're second at the moment. Thomas Randall breathing down their neck and Anton Di Pasquale just being smart and biding his time. And let's not forget the other battles. We've got a pretty good battle for A2 class here between Kasher and Cowan right now. They're pretty close together. And O'Keefe's hanging on tight in that A1 car as well, that Mercedes. Feel pretty comfortable with Dylan O'Keefe behind the wheel on the run to the end, but Cameron Crick's not that far behind in the Evo. And that's the tyre, that's the left front off that uh, the Berry Linton number 23 car. Well, I'm truly delaminated. And the left side as well is an odd one, given the right-hand side's the one that cops all the punishment It's been here. running all day, hasn't it? True. Some teams did change tyres under that red flag, but not everyone took the opportunity. And I think, to be honest, there's been a little bit of a question mark over that in the regulations. And we've been told that race control gave permission to put tyres on if they wanted to. But the regulation, as it's written, says you cannot. So race control saying you can probably overrules that but I think some people elected to maintain the tyres that were on the car. It may have backfired for car 23. It's putting down to 15th position. Now, so we're working the 92nd lap of the race, 50 minutes. And can the Russells hold back the charging Tom Randall and Anton Di Pasquale into the elbow we go once again. Sorry, not. Ryan Cash is doing an awesome job. Fifth outright in the A2 leading... Ford Mustang. That car has just flown under the radar all weekend long. Out, out of all the combinations in that class, which included our co-commentator, they were, to be fair, probably fourth or fifth in the pecking order that you look on the piece of paper and go, OK, well, here's the, the couple of favourites. But it just shows in this race that it's not always the favourites that get up, and they put a really complete performance. Chris Delsma and Ryland Gray, awesome job. The 16-year-old who started this race this morning and drove very, very nicely to bring that car into the end of the first stint. And there is the Ford Mustang being chased down by Dylan O'Keefe, who's got plenty of experience at this place. Colby Cowan as well in second in that class, as you pointed out, Marcus. They've had a, a really quiet day. We haven't seen too much of them, but this is the uh, hour you want to be towards the front of the field. Isn't it? It's better than sitting where I am right now, I'm going to be honest with you. No problems. We're not that bad a cup, are we? <laughs> He didn't answer that nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer a couch for one. Yes. In the race car. <laughs> oh, I completely I sympathise for you. In, in all seriousness, does this, does this give you the drive to want to come back and do it again? Oh, look, I've really enjoyed it. I just wanted to do it for the experience, to be honest, yep. and, uh, and to finish the story with the Badiki family. We built this car at GRM, and, and I did the early testing for it. We struggled with the transmission last year. We scratched the entry. Um, Medikis took it back over. They, they persisted with it, stayed with it, and we blew the gearbox anyway. <laughs> so two years in the making to do a um, to do the uh, the Bathurst one and three quarter hour. <laughs> it could be a new race. Back to the old <laughs> back to the old six B for next year, I think. So this battle continues and fifty minutes to go. There. 
there's still lots of time in this race for things to relax. A puff of smoke from the back of that yellow uh, search for a cure BMW as Randall hustles the thing across the top of the mountain. I've really enjoyed talking to the supercar guys this weekend going, do you know what? These things are really challenging to drive, really enjoyable to drive because they're so fundamentally different to what they're used to pushing around here. Exactly right. And, and how relaxed are they too? Like these supercar drivers come down, they're actually really enjoying their weekend here in these production cars. Will Davison said after qualifying, that's one of the busiest laps he's ever done around <laughs> the mountain. He looked busy. And, and I can talk firsthand. Like these cars are tough to drive. They slide around a lot underneath you. The tyres are howling and squealing. You've really got to push these MRF tyres to get the speed out of it. It's about rolling through the middle with too much momentum and right. being lazy on the throttle. Because if you ask too much of it, the car just snaps sideways. Let's go back and have a look at some of our class contenders, class C and D cars. Running up the hill. Through turn two, so the Mazda RX-8. That's the HSV Astra. So that's the RX-8 Cup entry. Rick Shaw and Tom Shaw, another one of the father and son combinations in the race. And Brent David Cox, who comes out every year to join this team and put on a great show. Nice little RX-8 with the screaming Roach out in front. No, it's no trees. Uh, Roach trees have got a bit of history here, don't they? Yes. Mountain, Alan Moffat days and cast your mind back to production car racing in the early 90s and the 12 hour was Mazda RX-7 territory. I think the cat named Cavage. Yellow Pages, yeah. Mazda RX-7 back in the day. First memories of Bathurst. Give my age away a bit, maybe. And that, that is father of yeah. these two boys, Ben and Michael. So Jada out to nearly four seconds. And he held the fastest lap for the second lap of the day. He reset that on lap 79. This is the 94th lap of the race. This is the margin, first to second now. Just want to point out too, who's leading class B1 at the moment. One J Cox, 17th outright. That car was excluded from qualifying. They had some turbo boost infringements on that BMW. It happened three times. It went over the maximum allowable boost pressure in that engine, so they were excluded from qualifying. They started last. But as we've proven in this race before, you can start last and still get results. And when you've got Jordan Cox in the car, yeah. it just makes the job all too easy. The front-wheel drive hero. Yes, yeah. in a rear-wheel drive BMW. Yeah, yeah, I know, but he's a front-wheel drive master and he, he's built his career on front-wheel drives. I don't know if you've seen any of his YouTube videos, but all of them. <laughs> he, he loves to start at the back and come through the field. He, he doesn't leave from the front that well. We're trying to train him at JRM to, to not have to start at the back all the time because he, he tends to trip up on himself in qualifying. But a major talent, really nice guy. And, and he's coming through the ranks. I mean, he can drive in anything. You put him in a put him in the seat, he'll get the most out of the yeah. race car. He's one of those guys, you, you pay money to go and watch in a racing car because he's just an exciting driver. He does. He just has a go, and he's a real racer too. Like, um, when we're working on the TCI program with him, he'll send me texts of the car at 10, 11 o'clock at night saying, hey, look, I just I saw this photo online. and Look at the front end or look at the brakes. Or He's thinking about it 24-7. That's what you need to be. Uh, doing if you want to really make it in the sport. He understands the engineering. Yeah. Well, he loves the engineering. He yeah. runs his own workshop. That's right. Um, and he works there on his own, working on race cars and road cars, and he's worked it out. Like, he, yeah, he's worked out how to work on the cars, understand the cars, and drive them and push them to the limits. He's a massive talent, that's for sure. Yeah. 59th on the grid up to 17th. Uh, maybe a couple more positions available as we pick off a couple more lap cars here. So, sorry, not so Lockie blocks him. He's the next car behind Jordan Cox and leading Class D. So that's a huge job from that squad who have been on top of that class for most of the day. Murray Dowsett, Mitch Madron and Lockie blocks him. And the Toyota 86 yet to be beaten in Class D at Mount Panorama in the, about the six hour, looking to make it seven from seven, much in the same way that BMW had in the outright battle. There is the Cox BMW down through Chase. Every lap looks like he's ragging it, doesn't he? Through the chase. As he said, from the back of the field, they did qualify well, but were penalised for that technical breach after qualifying. But now find themselves in the second half of the top 20. For the car straight. Rob Rubis joining that team this year as a last minute call up. Another talent around this part of the world in production car racing has a quick look in the mirror and that points out that sun really starting to blaze in the eyes of the drivers here late in the day. Yeah, the next 10 or 15 minutes that sun, if it doesn't uh, get hidden by a cloud, will be a real problem for them. But, you know, 
you've got oil on the windshield, um, the drive's getting tired, uh, the glare comes in, you know, it can make the drive a bit frustrated, but you really struggle to see your brake markers. That's the most important thing on these cars because they're all running ABS and you don't want to trigger the ABS, get into it too hard because the pedal goes rock hard yeah. and the car runs on. And it actually can be quite scary as a driver when you get into the ABS too hard. The BMWs seem to have too much rear brake until the ABS kicks in whereas the Mustang had way too much front. Oh, okay. And so the Mustang would start with maybe 80% front brake until you got into the, eight, and then it would start to recalibrate itself. So if you got into the brakes too hard too early, ABS kicks in and the car just runs on and uh, it is quite a scary feeling. So when the sun comes down in your eyes, turn one and up to the cutting, you gotta really make sure that you don't outbrake yourself. Was that something you had to work on during the weekend to get a feel for it? Oh yeah, look, the, the, brake pedal, the brake pedal pressure's on you know, that we're pulling out of the Motec data is crazy for these kind of cars because normally you just stamp on the brakes as hard as you can to start and then you trail back and you release the pressure as the speed comes off the car. In production car racing it's very different. You've got to actually ramp in really slowly so then the AB or the, the computer in the uh, in, in the braking system has a chance to calibrate itself, work out what it's trying to do before the ABS kicks in. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. Well just don't press the brake pedal too hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is the battle for second place. Tom Randall, he's got to go the long way round on Drew Russell at turn one, but Drew covers his line. Now his exit will be slightly compromised, you'd think, out of turn one. So let's see what Randall can do. But the M2 competition just isn't quite as quick in a straight line as the M4 in front. So it's got more grunt, the M4. It just punches out of those slower corners a little bit better than the M2. And cast your mind back 12 months to last year's race, it was a similar scenario. It was M3 versus M2 in the battle for the lead, and it took a mighty Hail Mary at Brock Skyline for Cameron Hill to get past Tim Slade. He wasn't going to do it anywhere down the bottom of the hill, and this is very much the same scenario. But for Tom Randall, it's not quite the time for a full send at Skyline yet. Well, he's got to do it fairly soon because he's losing time to OJ, and I think if he can clear Russell, he's probably got a chance to run at least the same speed. You don't want to, I mean, we're only talking five seconds behind yeah. right now to the leader in Ojeda. So if he can make a clean pass, maybe he's got to wait to try and pick him off with one of the lap cars that are going to be coming up here in the next couple of laps. They've just dropped Anton Di Pasquale as well in car four. He's three and a half seconds behind that battle. So that car just doesn't quite have the raw car speed to go with the leaders right now. Still 40 minutes to go. Still lots of time for that game to play out. Here's the Harding Performance Volkswagen Golf R. So they've just settled back down into 12th position outright in Salteri. From 30th on the grid, they'll take that today. Mm. Quiet achievers as we jump on board. Beat up. This is only what Marcus was saying about just before. As we turn into the corner, there's that sun coming up. That's the patches there. I mean, those trees have grown a lot over the years. It's still, it's intermittent light, isn't it? Yeah, and it's actually, the, the clouds are breaking up that sun just a little bit here too. The, the sun's getting down, but there's plenty of clouds around. So it's going to come and go here in the next 10, 15 minutes or so. It's a photographer's dream at the moment. I can tell you, the light is stunning. It's a beautiful afternoon. It's still very, very cold. It's never gone beyond 11 degrees today in the central west of New South Wales. This is a cool little dash, isn't it, on this V-Dub here. He's got the little um, heads-up display on the left-hand side. He's got all the, uh, well, the, the gauges down the bottom there. These digital dashes make our job easy because we can elaborate all this information really nicely. I'm, just trying, to, I'm trying to work out what they are. So this, much like your car, has got the DSG-style gearbox, but I, the Volkswagen system different to the, the pure auto in the Ford. And this one's been proven over a couple of years in this car, which has always run quite well. So using the paddles. Fifth gear, we'll grab six in a minute. Just see the speedo tipping well over 200 kilometres an hour down Conrod. This car approached 250. trying to get a read on those dials in the middle there. One of them will be turbo boost, you would have thought. I think the middle one has just got the cabin set to a, a very comfortable 24 degrees on the air conditioning. <laughs> Not too often you have to use the heater on a day in a race car. Use it the other way around. All oh, busy across the top. This is what Marcus Ambrose was just talking about. Lap traffic playing such a role 
And is this an opportunity for Thomas Randall to finally get himself up into second position? Oh, right at Skyline again. And they tuck in behind. They'll have to follow these lap cars all the way down the Forest Elbow. But this is the moment that Tom Randall's been waiting for. They're the third and fourth car in your shot from the drone pitches coming down the mountain. If you can pick one off here, you're going to be very careful. Randall wants to go with him. Lap car pulls to the right-hand side and lets him get on with it. There's more ahead. This is Randall's chance. Oh, look at it. It's so busy. And Russell weaves one way and then the other to get past the VXR Astra. Flags waving. It's real much you can do at points like that in the race. Russell covers off his line, chasing down that Class C. Mazda RX-8. Tom gets a very good run out here. He's just going to have to be so unbelievably good under brakes into Murray's to get this move done. And there's a lap car which sort of helps the cause of Russell and leaves Randall in the 92 car with absolutely nowhere to go. That's very clever defensive driving here by Russell there. He, he's not panicking, but he is wounded. And Randall, if he can clear him, he's, he's going to pull away. There's no doubt that Randall's getting held up. And what's Steve Pasquale suddenly in this mix as well? He was a big winner out of the lap traffic. So three cars now scrapping for second position. Keep an eye on car number four. So they climb the mountain once again. It was three and a half seconds behind a lap ago. That shows you the difference that lap traffic can make. So now Tom Randall has to deal with car number four, which in a straight line and out of those slower corners is arguably a little bit quicker than that Breast Cancer Trials M2 in front. It's our super cheap auto best presented car in Class X. Well done to the brothers Kavich, Ben and Michael and Thomas for a great performance. And that is a Honda Integra Type R. Smoke pouring from the front, parked to the side of the road on the run-up mountain straight. And we've seen cars parked there before today. With 37 minutes to go in the race, how does Motorsport Australia Race Control manage this? Well, you could say it's safe off the track, but remember we had a car spin coming off of Hell Corner before. You can see the wheel track still behind the Shannon sign. It's the Jason Walsh, Alan Letcher and Nicholas Agar Honda Integra Type R. The start of 53, they are going to go safety car. Hyundai safety car is going to come out with 37 minutes remaining. There's probably other words I could use. Well, it sets up a <laughs> huge finish to this race and that has expired in a fairly fundamental way. Now, has it dropped oil? That's the next question through Hell Corner. I hope not, Matt. I'm not sure I can live through another race suspension. <laughs> <laughs> After nearly five and a half hours, you get getting into the last half hour window and bang, your car does that to you. It's, it's just got to be devastating. That's what makes this race so great. It's just hard to even make it to the finish. But at the time, you go, I'm never coming back to this place. <laughs> Next day, no, we've got to come back. I hate this place, but I want to conquer it. What a shame. That's Terry Conroy's team. They've been running these cars for some time. And Terry involved in production car racing for years and years. I caught up with him in the paddock earlier in the weekend. Was happy to have this car and said it was actually running really, really well. Famous last words, but you can say that on a Friday and get away with it. <laughs> so the Hyundai safety car will be back out on the circuit. We'll pick up Jaden Ojeda as the leader. And the other thing to think about is that while that battle was going on, Jaden had pulled out almost eight seconds to the good. So had brilliant track position out in front, and all of that now disappears, Molly Taylor. Nick McLeod, you and Brock Giblin have been doing a awesome job in the HSV Astra. You're sitting first in class with a couple of lap lead and uh, ten, uh, 20th uh, overall. So got to be happy with the race so far, right? Well, yeah, and, you know, I'm very happy with the race so far. It was sort of looking like we were settling for second there because uh, Jake was just so far ahead in his Mazda. But... Um, you know, he had that little uh, electrical gremlin, it looked like. So, yeah, thankfully we got the lead. Um, yeah, we had to be there to sort of uh, be in it in the fight. So, yeah, you know, pretty happy so far. We still got maybe 20 minutes to go or something like that. So anything can happen. It's not over till it's over. So just got to keep pressing hard and wait for the checkered flag. How much fun are you having driving around Mount Panorama? Oh, you know, it's, it's just a blast. Whenever you come here, it's just, you know, it's... The greatest track in the world in my opinion um you know over the top especially in this little light nimble astra 
um, you know, you just really, you really can't beat it. Thanks. All the best for the finish, Nick. Thank you. So, Ryan McLeod Racing Cars, that is the Class C leader. And the third McLeod, the third generation driver. So, son of Ryan McLeod and grandson of Peter McLeod, who won the great race in 1987 with Peter Brock and the Holden Dealer team. And Ryan, who set up A Mark Cars Australia and Racer Industries. Um, now back just to running his own little independent team, but they're running cars in Super 3 this year. And both his boys are very, very talented steerers. So the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree in the McLeod family. Great to see them there. And that Astra dates all the way back to Bathurst 12 hour where they've been running that car and they built a souped up version. They took overseas and ran at Dubai in the yeah. 24 hour over there as well. So cool to see them continuing on. And yeah, they're quite comfortably in front in Class C at the moment. Racer Industries was based out of Norwell there for a while up there at the Dudes Ranch. Up there in Queensland, we just saw the Camilleri car. It did get going, but did come to a stop at the top of the mountain there. Yeah, I think they flat towed it there, Nolts, right. during the last safety car, which feels like a while ago, uh, just to get it out of harm's way there up at the McPhillamy Park. More smoke now, Krause, from one of the cars going down through the dip. We saw it from the drone shot. Safety car lights are going to go out. We also saw Tony D'Alberto come in while that safety car period was on. 12th position with Dwayne West in car 90. Try and pick up who that was. Tough break for Ojeda. He was out to nearly five seconds. It's back to zero with a, a lap car or so. He'll get that advantage though, Marcus, again at the restart like he did before. Oh, he will do, but there's not as many lap cars no. between him and, uh, and, the, and the cars behind. So um, he's got one car there as a pick he can use. But if I was Ojeda, I'd be going early. As soon as those green flags start waving, I'd be going because no one can pass until they pass a control line. Exactly. And it'll give him a couple of seconds head start. And that control line is right where the bridge is. On the way down to Murray's, expect the lights to go out. Ojeda, Russell, Randall, Dee Pasquale, Tyler Everingham now behind the wheel of car 24 that Garth Walton drove up to the last round of pit stops. Ryan Kasher leading class A2 and sixth outright. Could this be the last safety car? Have I spoken too soon? Probably. 30 minutes of racing. The lights are out, all the weaving needs to cease. There's still a bit of that going on down the field. And now, Jade No Jada becomes the pace car until that control line. They've been pretty consistent where they throw the green all day today. It's been basically been under the High Tech Oils Bridge. They're about to get too soon. So the Subaru in between Drew Russell and the race lead. Thomas Randall, you think he needs to attack as soon as he possibly can. Use those supercars restart skills he's built over the last couple of years to try and get one on Drew Russell and have a go at least at going out after the race leader. And Anton Di Pasquale still in the mix. This has brought Tyler Everingham back into the game as well in car 24. It's a little bit further down the queue in a walking wounded GWR BMW with gearbox issues, but Let's see if young Tyler has car speed. There is car 24 going down the inside. So I think we have to consider these guys somewhere in the mix. Fifth outright and in class X. And then you go back to Ryan Kasher, who's still behind the wheel of the 221 Ford Mustang. O'Keefe still leading class A1 in the A45. Looking for the three-peat there for that team. Still so many storylines to play out. And this year's Bathurst six hour. Five hours and 29 minutes of racing is done. The sun pretty much set behind the mountain here. Headlights ablaze on the way to Griffins and up into the Worth Cutting. A lot of that smoke was coming out the number 80 car, the Rick and Tom Shaw Mazda RX-8. Down the field in this one as the battle reignites. That's a change of position. It is a change of position. Yeah, you're right. And Anton Di Pasquale has got by Tom Randall. So Anton now up to third on the road. This team last year with Anthony Sewell and Lee Burgess were one of the many BMWs in the race that were out really early. We had four or five fall within the first hour. We were all worried if we'd had any of them left by the end of last year's race. But they've come back retooled and ready to go and Sully's put together a really good program. It's a terrific livery on that car. 
and it really well presented and it's been driven superbly today as well. So let's see what Anton can do now with Russell. So Tyler Everingham, we mentioned the young Super 2 star in car number 24 for Garth Walton Racing. Well, he's just set that car's best middle sector of the entire car race. And that middle sector's across the top. It is. So I wonder if there's a little twist in the tail for that team to get themselves into podium contention with under 30 minutes to go at Mount Panorama. Let's go down to Josh. So guys, uh, here unfortunately with uh, the gents in the uh, in the Honda Integra DC5, beautiful car, but 38 minutes ago, Jason and Nick, uh, it all went uh, all went up, didn't it? Well, the console actually moved on the car. It was something with the gear lead. We didn't have fixed gears, so we're actually on the limit down the straight. So we're actually losing spots, but in the end, the thing just gave up. Eight and a half grand all day. So you were bouncing it off the rev limiter for how many hours? Oh, probably the last two and a half hours, I'd say. I, uh, I think I might know why the thing expired. That's uh, that's a fairly decent amount of time to limp in a bash even for a Honda. Um, your day up until that point wasn't going too badly, though, was it? Yeah, it was not too bad. Jason and Alan were all having a good drive. Um, good team here. They all came down, spent the rest of the weekend with us here. Disappointing being 38 minutes in, but that's racing, I guess. That's motorsport. It's unfortunate, but... Uh, yeah. Good to see you, and we'll see you back next year. Thanks, Thank Thank you. you. How casual was it? Bouncing off the rev limiter for the last couple of hours. Every engine builder will be throwing stuff at the TV right now. <laughs> yeah, the Honda VTEC engines are famous for being unbelievably good and very reliable, but even that is too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So Randall has just come back to Di Pasquale here, not letting him get away. Tyler Everingham is still flying behind them and catching these two. So he's to set quickest first sector for that car for the race, just emerging over Brock Skyline through the sunshine. So this could be a three-way fight. Russell, 2.9 seconds away from the race lead right now. And going punch for punch for Jaden O'Jada. There's nothing in it in terms of lap speed between the two of them. And Randall with a great run out of the elbow, a big wobble in the tail of car number four. I don't think the M2's got the straight line performance to challenge down Conrod, unfortunately for Randall. Good news for Deep Pasquale. Great news for Everingham, he's flying again. He's coming into the background of that shot now. Three seconds, there he is. He might be on the tail of these cars in the next two laps and challenge for a podium position here. Oh, wow, He's Tyler. dragging this. <laughs> He's driving the wheels off car 24. I'm just getting word through that our Class C leader, Brock Giblin, is in the pit lane. He is in the pit lane. So this is the class that no one wants to lead today. Two leaders, and they're driving that car straight in the garage. We'll follow that for you because we've got this great battle for the outright lead at the moment, but car 10 has been driven straight into the carport. Class C leader. So 98 laps in the books for them. Where's the next best car? Can they get it back out in time without losing the class lead? Chris Holt, 95 laps, is second in class. A little bit further down the field, so they've got three laps up their sleeve to try and effect a repair to whatever it is that has afflicted the HSV Astra. Seriously, how does this place keep doing it? <laughs> It just does it every year. It doesn't matter what kind of race we bring here. There's always drama. There's always something you can never expect to happen. And there's Everingham really starting to close in. It's back to two and a half seconds. Now, there's still plenty of time. We've got 25 and a half minutes left here. Randall's all over the back of Deep Pasquale. If these guys start slowing each other up too much more, Tyler could seize the chance here. And then a late safety car or something like that, he's in the game. But it, Ojada is controlling this race. There's no doubt about it. He's, he's got good speed. He's just keeping the gap about three seconds to Russell. Russell's got a bit of clean air now. Uh, now Randall's been uh, put back here behind Di Pasquale. So um, it'll be interesting to see if um, Russell's got anything at all for Ojeda. Now he doesn't have to look at his mirror so much. Using all of the road down the hill is Anton Di Pasquale. And there is Everingham. He just set that car's quickest lap of the race. 2.25.7. We heard from team boss Garth Walton before that they had to do the reset with some gearbox issues in the electronics of that car. It's clearly been effective. 
They've made it work and Tyler driving the wheels off it at the moment to get himself into podium contention. This was a big shot for them. Garth's always come here with cars in class contention, but since they bought the ultimate Class X in, he hasn't had um, a bullet in the gun, so to say, for the outright fight. And he bought the car from last year that was runner-up in the race and wanted to have a shot at it. Well, they've got it with 24 minutes to go. Stubbsy? We're just talking about the Class C leader, the HSV, the Astra down here. You won't believe it, a drive shaft has gone. So racing against time now to get this back out there and keep that Class C lead. Not going to get that done in three laps. No, <laughs> no, they're not. I mean, it is a weak link with front wheel drives and these uh, CV joints and things, but um, they're going to try. I mean, good on them. Half an hour to go. Let's see if they can get back out there. Well, they could get a podium still because the other guys are so many laps down behind them. So why not have a crack with 22 minutes of racing still to go? Some of the spirit of these endurance races is just to make it to the finish. I mean, Absolutely. Even if you lapse down, it doesn't matter. You just try to get the car back on the track to actually get the chequered flag because ultimately that's that's what they're here for. Yeah. They're here to conquer machine as well as, well as the other competitors. Do we all remember the day the Fastway Courier's car to be pushed across the finish line in the Super <laughs> Tour days? <laughs> Dwayne Bewley. That's it. Everingham just set the fastest final sector of that car. So he's continuing to drive this thing so hard. And well in a shot for a podium now. 3.4 seconds the leading margin. We're not missing anything there yet. Still surely something to bubble over between Jaden Ojeda and Drew Russell. And you can see these guys are really pushing the air. The attitude of the car has changed, hasn't it, since the early part of the day. And they're starting to miss their marks. You can see they're starting to run wide on corner entries, missing their apex points. That's because they just started to go past where that tyre wants to sit. Oh. And again, there's Randall way wide across McPhillamy Park. You don't want to do that too many times. Wow. He was so close to going off there. Car width and a half out of the racing line. And now falls back into the hands of Tyler Everingham. You've got to think he's a sitting duck with that little engine he's got. Yes. There's still a bit, a bit going on, Nolts, as well. Cameron Crick's not far away from Dylan O'Keefe in the A1 battle. So for a class victory there, that's a big story potentially. That Evo is very, very close to the A45 AMG going for a three-peat. So we'll, we'll follow that for you too. Uh, Ryan Casher continues to lead A2, but... Uh, Ryder Quinn's got himself to second in class and ninth out. Right, the local legends car down the inside this time. Tyler Everingham, he's going to get himself to fourth. Chasing a podium finish. Car 24 relegates Thomas Randall down the order and now goes out after a podium. That was the easy one out of the way, I think. <laughs> yes. Right, it's going to be a little tougher here when he gets to deep Pasquale. It'll be a bit of education perhaps coming his way. It's been a great day for the Cabbage Boys and that Race for a Cure program. It's an unbelievable program they put together. Ben Cabbage and his wife Tula work so hard on it. They work very, very hard on their business based at Sydney Motorsport Park Workhorse, which looks after uh, truck repairs and servicing very successful, giving back as much as they can to motorsport, and they've had a great fight today. This has been their best six-hour campaign by a margin, bringing in Tom Randall only added to their cause. Best presented, thanks to Super Cheap in their class as well. It's not done yet. They're still fifth. Anything can happen at Bathurst. And as professional as Tom Randall is, this is his first attempt at the six-hour. And they'll give them their best result here if he can hold on to fifth. They were seventh last year, the Cabbage Boys. But now he's falling away from Everingham. And now Marcus Ambrose, he's got the big task. Di Pasquale will be the toughest guy in Mount Panorama in the next 20 minutes. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. You can just look at the attitude of the cars. They're using up all the track now. The cars are getting sideways. You can hear the tyres squealing through, through the camera feed. And it's just quite incredible to see these guys pushing these cars this hard after nearly six hours of racing here this weekend, this, today. That shot at, at McPhillamy Park was Jake Camilleri sitting forlornly watching with nowhere to go, stranded on the inside of the racetrack with his Mazda 3 parked up, having led Class C most of the race, and he's got nothing to do but to sit there and watch the sunset over the beautiful central west of New South Wales. It's kind of forlorn. All it needs is a, a deck chair and Fernando Alonso yeah. to be tacked onto that photo. <laughs> Oh, that was, that was quite a, a poignant shot for the Queensland team that have been so good today.
doesn't even want to look at the racetrack now. Oh. So close, but so far in Class C honours today for the Grand Prix Mazda team. Final 18 minutes of the High Tech Oils Bath, the six hour. Everingham looming large. In fact, he's looking for a move here. It's a phantom look. <laughs> but there is some traffic ahead here. He came from a long way back. What the other thing that the safety cars have done, is that Look okay to going What's slowly? Going here? Is this the race leader? Those brakes are red hot. 2.28.0 last time round for Jaden Ojeda. 2.26.2 for Drew Russell. The battle for the lead is well and truly alive. Those front brakes are way hot yep. than they should be. He's definitely got some kind of issue going on here. Has he pushed too hard? You don't want to back off here because it's only two seconds. Well, two laps ago it was four. That's right. Yeah. So he's lost you know, a second and a half here. Could be traffic. Could be something else. It's 15 cars on the lead lap of this race, which has been a byproduct of the safety cars we've seen today. That would be a race record. The previous best was 11 cars on the lead lap at the end of the race. So huge... Uh, amount of competitive cars in the race. It shows the depth of the field right throughout the well, outright classes as well. 2.5 seconds, so just stabilising now, Ojeda. And it did look like he got it wrong. There was a big torch, tortured squeal as he tried to get the thing stopped at Murray's. The sun's just poked behind the cloud there, looking out to the west, and all of a sudden it's got very, very dark. Sunset just after the scheduled race finish time proper endurance racing, run into the dark at Mount Panorama. So it's cleared itself for now, but those brake discs were glowing red at the bottom of Murray's. And he hasn't given up. There's a lot of tyre school going on with Ojeda. I mean, he's 2.7. He's stretched the gap out just a tiny bit. There is some smoke coming out of that right front. There is something wrong with his right front wheel. There's no doubt about it. I don't know if the team will be saying anything, but I'm sure our guys in pit lane will be asking the question if there is a drama. Oh, how good. There is. That is Jake Camilleri, Grand Prix Master Driver, watching the TV. And he has got the best TV at Mount Panorama today. I was wondering why that camera was hanging around. What a sight. Nice work by Jordi, our drone operator at the top of the mountain. He's had a big day. I don't know if he's got any feeling left in his hands flying that thing for six hours, but captured some amazing shots. There are the leaders. Here comes Russell. He's cleared the lap cars. It was 2.6 seconds at the last sector. That was coming out of Forest Elbow. The Nova Castrians getting that scent of victory, perhaps. It's 2.8 seconds, 2.26.2 to 2.26.5. Ojeda responds on that lap. Really good response. Lap timing, we need to confirm it visually. Lap timing showing that Cameron Crick has passed Dylan O'Keefe for the A1 lead as well. Molly Taylor. We're just speaking to the team about uh, Jaden O'Jada's car. Uh, he did have a small tap with a, a slower car that he was passing. He said the steering is a little bit out, but it's not really affecting his lap time. So it's probably why we see it moving around a little bit more as well. So this is the battle for the lead in Class A1. So it's not just the outright fight, it's the race class as well. And Cameron Crick in the Campbell's Transport Mitsubishi Lancer Evo has passed Dylan O'Keefe and is powering away. Now, O'Keefe there in the AMG has got behind him Ryder Quinn in the local Legends Mustang. Not for class positions, but it is for an outright place. And Ryder coming through like a freight train at the moment. So there's still some things to play out in this, but there is a potential Bathurst win going the way of car 118. What a performance this has been, and Cameron Crick has hauled this thing up the leaderboard in the last stanza of this race. And Ryder Quinn's only seven seconds behind our class A2 leader. He's got time to catch the bit of lap traffic, Stubbsy. Speaking of classes, we saw the Class C number 10 of Giblin and McLeod with the drive shaft issue. You said, no way, can they get that back out? Well, they have. Looking at the timing screens, they're in second oh. in Class C still. Remarkable effort by the team. And on the same lap, Stubbsy, as the car that now assumes the race lead, which is Chris Holt in car 51. 
There's everything to play for. The Class E lead changed hands about 10 minutes ago as well, by the way. The only thing that's sure right now, and I say this touching wood, is that Lachlan Bloxham is leading Class D quite comfortably and is inside the top 20 in his 286. Are you keeping up? <laughs> I know there's 15 minutes to go. <laughs> Oh, wow. Just when we thought it was settling down, the class honours are all up for grabs, it appears. Oh, this place. It's so cool. <laughs> Never disappoints, does it? Ojeda, 226.9, 228.6 for Russell last time by a slow lap for the current second position. Maybe navigating some traffic. De Pasquale, 27.5. 27.5 for Everingham, who's locked behind for the final step on the Bathurst six-hour podium. Randall's fallen a second off the pace there as we watch Ryder Quinn, the local legends Mustang. He's thrashing away here. He's taken a second out of that margin. He's after Ryan Casher for class honours. He runs in ninth position. He's after car 221. A bit of traffic just ahead. He's going to get some good outright result here anyway. There's the race leader. Up to Reed Park for the 107th time in this year's race. So we're on for about 112 laps. Certainly nowhere near record territory. Last year, 130, the record 131, the lowest 109 back in 2018, which was a race where there was almost two and a half hours of safety car throughout. Class D leader just in front, a correction car that's second in Class D, number 286. So Ojeda's still got some traffic to deal with. The battle will be third and fourth place with Everingham and Deep Pasquale still locked together. Now times two tenths away from each other, so they're glued to each other for that final podium spot outright anyway, and for class honours. So Jada keeps picking off the traffic. Normally in this kind of race, you think we're starting to wind it down. They're going to the opposite way here today. This leader makes his way down towards the DBA chase. Gap got back to about two seconds. It sits at 4.2. Ojeda to Drew Russell and the go-karts go BMW. I wonder how Simon Hodges is feeling down in pit lane, watching his young co-driver lead this race on a knife's edge with 12 minutes to go and looking to potentially win the biggest race of his life. This team, the family squad, spoke to Wayne Russell this morning and said, what's it like driving with your boys at Bathurst? And he broke down, he's so emotional. He loves driving with his kids. They're second at the moment. And then there's this fight, Anton Di Pasquale leading Tyler Everingham and Thomas Randall in the battle for the final step on the podium. This one wide open. Yeah, you know, Jade has really uh, picked off the traffic here quite well the last three or four laps. Got himself a nice gap now to Russell. And it looks like he's really stabilised that attack that Russell's putting on him. So it's really Jade's to lose from here, but he'd be sweating every time he sees a car <laughs> up in the distance. He'd be really getting worried about where he's going to catch him. We saw him have that big moment down here at Murray's, Marcus. Do you think that might have been just a little reset, maybe a little, oh, gee, I need to need to just get it together here and manage this lead? Yeah, we caught it late. Maybe he was mm. trying to pass a car. Yeah. Um, definitely got the front tyres hot. You could hear yeah. the squealing, but he's been able to stabilise that now, and the car looks more balanced and, and back together again. Still some fast lap times going on further down the field. Cam Bella is in the lead now in Class E. So Porsche 944, racer out of Victoria. And there's absolutely nothing between the two Class E cars. 1.2 seconds. The only two cars in the class, the two little Mazdas dueling it out at the end of the race. So everywhere you look, every category has got something on the line at the end of this amazing Bathurst Six Hour. It's a very, very worthy chapter to the list of great races at this place. And Randall's regrouped here now to join on the back of Everingham and Deep Pasquale. It's the dipper, they're coming up to the bow, McGill, Falcon. Down to the elbow they go. But Ojeda, after that little moment, a bit of contact, he feels the steering's a little bit sad, but sits at nearly five seconds. It's really gonna be about these three cars at the closing stages, one would think. They weave their way through traffic down Conrod. 
past Kenny's place and then 505 Conrod Strait and then down to Robbo's place on the driver's left of the kink. That's Crayley's place. Um, is it here? Um, the box? Mate, 20 years ago I could have afforded it. Not now. Have a look at this for the final step on the Bathurst podium. Tyler Everingham's got a great run. Dee Pasquale boxed in with traffic and boxes Everingham off the road on the run down the hill. For the final step on the podium, Randall's going to try and get into this as well. Anton Di Pasquale will never say die. We know that. What about this battle? Brake discs glowing. Sun setting. And the final step on the podium, well and truly alive. Anton on the outside. Can he hold on? Has he got enough to go side by side on the run up to turn two? Then trading paint. Randall's got nowhere to go. He sits in behind. More lap cars ahead. That all started with the lap car down the DBA chase. They need to clear this one. They stay side by side. Everingham hanging out to dry here. Randall tucks in with him. All that work for North. Yep. <laughs> Three corners was trying to make the pass. It was great racing. <laughs> great respect shown as well. Even dicing through that lap traffic. Uh, traffic giveth and traffic taketh away in this one. They're bottled up together. More lap cars up to Reed Park. Threading the oh, eye of the needle. Commitment up through there, guys. Great job with the lap traffic. <laughs> this <laughs> is for third place outright in the race. The lap cars have done fantastic here. They really have. I mean, that, they're spending half their race looking in the rear vision mirror. Deep Pasquale oh. commits hard at McPhillamy Park and gets through. Everingham's got no choice but to go. Molly. Uh, well, there's a whole lot going on in the garage down here of Jade and Ojeda. Looks like these guys are getting ready to refuel. They're standing oh, around. Not 100% no. sure what's happening, but yeah, everyone's on standby, so stay tuned. Are they out of fuel? Will this car get to the end of the race? Remember, they did this on time. They didn't need to do it as a compulsory pit stop. Have they got the calculation out by lap? They ticked all their compulsory stops off early, so their final stop was quicker than everyone else. They used it to get the track position that has them in the lead of this race. That explains why he's been driving this thing so hard, relentlessly, to try and build some track position. Do they pit or don't they? Not this lap. How big is this fuel concern? You'd have to push, would you? Oh, surely. There's no way you'd come in now. It's easy to sit up here and say, surely you're just running out of fuel, <laughs> but Molly? That is, he's staying out for now. So everyone's looking pretty tense, but he's staying out there, not refueling. He used to be armchair experts like us right now. But... Well, well, I'm not sure what setup they've got going on their car, but in our case with our A2 Mustang, we, we had enough fuel where the, the, the fuel light came on and we had enough to do one and a half laps. Right. So if we're at Forest Elbow, we could complete a second lap and still make it into the pit lane without right. running out of fuel. So the driver will know before anyone else does. <laughs> the margins are tiny. So they used that last stop where they could put as much fuel as they needed to in on time. Did they get the calculation right? So he did that just for track position yeah, that totally. time too. Totally. Wow. Wasn't there a great Robbie Gordon that rolled this dice in Indianapolis years ago? <laughs> It was. It'd kill me if I, if I brought that one up. There was a Michigan race as well, I think. <laughs> so is there going to be another twist? Ojeda has four and a half seconds. His last lap time by was in the 28s. This, this battle could end up being for second if the leader runs out of juice. I mean, surely... Oh, it's easy to sit up here and say it, but surely at this point with six minutes to go, if you're stopping for fuel, it's 45 seconds out of your life and you are outside the top 10. I don't know. Surely just run the thing dry, see what happens. Who knows? There could be a safety car and you might get away with it. So you just, you never know at Mount Panorama. These are the margins we work in in this race. What a classic. Meanwhile, Everingham still locked in behind the number four BMW that Anton Di Pasquale has made wider. We've gone yellow, we've gone safety car because there's a Mitsubishi Lanta that's been in the fence and it's on the exit of the elbow and there's another car crashed on the exit of the final corner. The Hyundai safety car is out. Fuel dramas no more.
Jada No Jada and Simon Hodges are going to win this race. What a crazy way to end a crazy car race. And that's had quite a big crash. It's a Cowham car that was running 13th outright, finding the wall at the final turn. They were third in class, Nolts, in A2. So two separate incidents that have forced the Hyundai safety car out. And all the concerns you'd think will wash away now for this team. With what should be this lap plus one to go at Mount Panorama. So there's the Hyundai safety car. Tyler Everingham showed in third place. Car 24 shown in third. Oh, he got Anton Di Pasquale. He did. He's in front. So Where did that happen? Well, it did it happen before <laughs> the yellow came out. But that could be an absolute clutch move for Tyler Everingham. He might have just got them a Bathurst podium. What, what did you say? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> I'm just thinking about poor old Ojeda. He's yes. in that car saying, I needed the safety car now. I've got it. And now what he's going to do is be worried about seeing that fuel light come on. Yes. I mean, who knows how much fuel he's really got in. Showing a minute and 44 on our screen in this race. It's 17.43 plus one to the finish, so we're not quite there. But the safety car will slow things down, and honestly, they, they won't get a restart with this one with just three minutes remaining, unless it's a restart this time by, but there's still cars crossing the start-finish line. Gee, that'd be wild. Wouldn't put it past this day, though. So with three and a half minutes to go right now, is that three more laps under safety car we would see? Two. I think it's two. Yeah, I think two. So it's 17.43 local time plus one. So when they come around to complete this lap, it should be the commencement of the final lap of the race. So they need to get it cleaned up ASAP if we're going to get a restart. And they'd need to confirm that by the time the Hyundai safety car gets to the elbow. But the Mustang that crashed at the exit of the final corner has gone in quite hard. They're trying to tow him away. I can see out of our commentary box window right now. They're trying to tow it back. Just at least get it out of harm's way. There it is. Just to the right of our commentary position. So the V6 power of that Ford Ranger recovery vehicle. Might just do the job here. But what about that Mitsubishi Lancer Evo that was parked at the top on the exit of the elbow? That was the other question mark. We could get one lap here. Can you imagine it? <laughs> could you imagine that? I mean, that's off, out of harm's way up there. Could just be a local yellow. I'm just race fanning here. I no, just want to yeah, see the one lap yeah. dash. I Come get on, it. Motorsport Australia. <laughs> <laughs> These guys will be hating what I'm saying, but... We're being told they expect to go back to green this time by for what will be the start of the final lap of the high-tech oils bath of six out. But it will be a lap. It won't be to a sector. It's going to be a lap of <laughs> racing. <laughs> Very topical. Very nice. So we've raced for six hours for a one-lap shootout. It's a long way to get to this point. <laughs> <laughs> the Hyundai safety oh. car goes down, Conrob. We <laughs> watch with anticipation for the lights to go out. Somebody get a camera on Wayne Russell as well. <laughs> I, so surely he's left the building. <laughs> So 23-year-old Jaden Ojeda from Sydney. He's a Western Sydney boy. He's a bright young star of our sport. He's fast. He's charismatic. He's enjoyable to watch, enjoyable to interview, and he's a great young star of Australian motor racing. And he now leads this race with one lap to go. We wait for the lights. Do they go out or do they not? Yes. They do. Here we go. They do a one lap dash to decide the high tech oils, but the six hour. Everything to play for in every class, and it's decided in 6.2 kilometres. Ojeda, Russell, Everingham, Di Pasquale, and Randall for the outright victory, and then all the classes up for grabs as well. And he's going. And no lap car in between this time. Gloves off for the final 6.2 kilometres. 
the green flag waves. This is your last lap of the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. Who's going to win? Lights ablaze on the mountain, driving into darkness one final time. This is the battle for third place. Everingham loose on the exit of turn one, sliding around. He's got Anton Di Pasquale locked in behind. Great restart, OJ, though, perfectly judged. Drew Russell's got nothing for him at the moment. Is there enough fuel in the 21? He'll hustle right to the top of the mountain here. He has to. Everingham still third. Parked in the middle of the road on the run up to turn two. And clear and safe. We look and find the class leaders a little bit further back. What are the leaders doing? Across the shell for the final time. Ojeda's got enough of a margin. It's out to over half a second. For Russell, it'll be the drive down. Here it is squirming as it did on the last restart. It'll be the run down to Forest Elbow and the exit out of the elbow. Then time starts running out. The chase will be his realistic option here. Oh, Jaden's just earning this victory, isn't he? Absolutely. He's been fast all day, but this last lap, what a cracker he's put on here across the top of the mountain. He's got about 10 car length lead here. It's his to lose, but not forget about the fuel. <laughs> exactly right. Through the dipper. The sun has set here. It's incredibly dark at Mount Panorama. The camera brightening up the conditions. What a finale. What a finish it's been to High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. Ojeda leads us out of the elbow. Oh, there's still a fight on for third, fourth and fifth. I think Randall was looking pretty racy on the run down into the elbow. Everingham's clear and Randall was throwing everything he had. I think that was the last opportunity for Thomas to get Anton on the run down there for fourth and fifth. I think those positions are settled. Simon Hodges has put together a good little race team. They rolled the dice early on strategy and it's paid off. They got track position and it's paid off. They took a gamble on fuel and it's paid off. And Jaden Ojeda, after passing people on the grass down Conrod, is going to deliver an incredible victory for Car 21. It's a huge win in the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. Jaden Ojeda and Simon Hodges have won an incredible race. <sighs> Breathe. <laughs> what a drive. He earned that one. Worked the tail off that BMW. Put through all the emotions, wasn't he? Had to sit behind a safety car. This is some drama perhaps on the last lap just from earlier in the race. So we're replaying. This is the pass. It ah. was under yellow. So race controller looking that. That's Everingham on Deep gotcha. Pasquale. And the yellow flag had just come out. He was alongside. Good luck, race control, yeah. telling them that. Go karts go. Wayne Russell and his boys have finished second. Australian production car champions last year. Fifth in this race last year as well. They get a podium. They block your ears, Krause, when you get over there. There's oh, going to be yes. a lot of noise. Marcus? <laughs> oh, just congratulations to everyone who's made the finish of the six-hour race. I did not, so I had to congratulate everyone that did. But Jade no Jody, he really deserved that picture today. He's been fast all day, he's super smooth and, and clean. Um, I don't know much about him, but here he is. He's done himself no harm here today whatsoever. Can you hear more about him? Here's the replay once again. So the yellow flag is flying. In the background, they oh. were wheel to wheel. Good luck judging that. There'll be a massive argument from Car 24 that they were already side by side when the yellow started going. Wow. Let them one sort it out. Nonetheless, take it, don't take anything away from Ojeda and Simon Hodges. What a run. To pick up the win here by two oh, seconds. And no. off the track is the West Alberto car. And that's in the chase by the look of it. And they were showing 12th on our screen. Oh, they didn't cross the line, no. No. They didn't get there. That was on the final lap. Oh. And that's had a huge off. Even, no small off at that corner. Even after checkers, the race is still delivering. <laughs> Another classic here on the mountain. As the field make their way back into Park Ferme, Class X cars filling the top six on the podium. There is Everingham coming in to shake hands. What a finish.
The juice has done it here in 2023 at the High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour. He's raced through Formula Fords, open wheelers here in Australia, in F4 and then into supercars. He's had wild card rides, walking short. Legend. <laughs> nice work, buddy. And, but that is the biggest drive of his career. That is enormous, oh, anchored by some bold passes, oh, scything his way through lap traffic. And that moment there. down Conrod straight where they were 15 wide and he kept his boot in it going down Conrod well, that, with two wheels That's what won him in the race. Mm. you got to say, I mean, that's where he got... And we're, Marcus, we're being told that Anton Di Pasquale is going to finish third in this race. 15 second time penalty for car 24 for Tyler Everingham. We're being told from Motorsport Australia Race Control. Oh, they made a decision at least before the podium. Yeah, but Jade, no, Jade, passing the grass to, to yeah. win the Bathurst <laughs> six hour. Congratulations to him, biggest win of his career. Absolutely. Jade, no, Jade, you are victorious in the 2023 High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour. How do you react to that? Oh, I'm speechless. It's such a. Bathurst has been so tough, but yeah, today's good. Talk us through those last few laps. First of all, the fuel, you were right on the limit, weren't you? Yeah, between I got a, a knock with one of the lap cars and then we are managing a, a box problem as well. And then, yeah, the fuel arm um, just to top it off because you couldn't handle enough more. And then, yeah, we got one more lap on the green. We thought it was going under, under safety car, but yeah, awesome. What was going through your mind there when the safety car came out and you get told, we're going green, you've got to do this for one more lap? Yeah, that safety car couldn't go around any slower. I was just trying to, I almost wanted to drive into his rear bar to get him to get to the line a little bit quicker, but uh, ultimately awesome to do it on the green and uh, like, what a, what a day. Amazing, let's get up to the podium, you go in and celebrate. Thank you. Well done, Jaden Ojeda, Simon Hodges here today, confirming your race results here with those penalties being added. So Tyler Everingham drops him to fifth position. Hodges and Ojeda win here today. The Russells on the podium in second place today. Sul Burgess and Deepa Squally fill the podium today and take Class X honours for Ojeda and Hodges. Uh, class A2 going to the Quinn Denya combination down there in seventh. And just 36 cars getting home here today. 23 cars DNFing and 112 laps completed with a red flag, a false start earlier in the day, and a lengthy cleanup period for the cars that went off down in the chase. The safety car that came out late in the race and a one lap dash to decide the winners and the top three in this edition of the High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour. So the stories here are dropped down. Got a feel for Dwayne West and Tony D'Alberto. DNF didn't make it to the finish there on the last lap, found themselves down in the gravel, Jake Camilleri. Well, they led Class C, didn't they, all day long. He ended up just taking to the grass by the big screen up there at McPhillamy Park. Bowing out this race late this afternoon. Of course, the Levitt and Griffith car, the first one out earlier today with that contact at the top of the mountain. Super Chief Auto race heat highlights of this incredible one. The High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour for 2023. The BMWs led away. We had to cleanse the field on several occasions, but ultimately that crew of cars at the front would end up leading us to the end. It's another BMW domination here on the mountain. That was Dee Pasquale going past Barry Linton earlier in the race to put himself into the lead. This was Ojeda picking off Dee Pasquale. This was his charge in a secure one. This is where it all began for car 21 today. First big incident of the day for the Levitt car finding the wall. That was our first safety car period of at least eight we had during the course of the six out. The spin here for Dwayne West in front of traffic, managed to escape with no damage, but stacked the field up in the process on the 86s, just glancing the wall enough there to put it on the driver's left. They got that car repaired back on the track. The story of the day though, the Ambrose, Brook and Mediki car retiring early in the race after leading car 81, hitting the wall really hard here at the exit of the second turn. This one would bring out the red flag, the 42 Holden laying a big oil slick down there through the chase. We went back to racing. The Lexus was served up here at the top of McPhillamy Park, giving car 10 a 15 second penalty. The Sharon Rentals team bowed out with rear end dramas in car 27. Then it was on really, wasn't it, for the final one hour and 10 minutes of competition. The BMW is just scrapping it. Three wide coming out of Forest Elbow. We thought that pass was cool for Ojeda, but moments later, 
could make that one look pedestrian-like when he parked the car on the grass. Left-hand side, check this out. Two cars, make it three. Doesn't need the racetrack. Took three cars in the process to ultimately move up into the lead. Cut down tyre here for Will Davison in the BMW. The sun was starting to become a bit of an issue here late in the race. So Jada led away. He disappeared, trying to put a margin out. Then this incident would bring out the safety car late in the race. In fact, the final three minutes. And that was the move that cost the 15-second penalty. One lap would settle the high-tech oils. Bath the six-hour. Jade and Ojeda to victory. Another win for BMW. Ojeda and Hodges, your winners of the 2023 High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour. It's going to be a very noisy podium very soon when we head down there. BMW is locking out the podium once again at this great race here at Mount Panorama. We're getting set now for our podium for our top three and our three pairings up there. The beautiful podium set to welcome our top three into this year's edition. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the trophy presentation of a wild 2023 High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour. We congratulate all teams that finished today's race and pay special thanks to our volunteers for their incredible efforts this Easter at Mount Panorama. Now, please welcome the top three outright finishing teams to the podium in third place today for PI Store, Anthony Sewell, Adam Burgess and Anton Di Pasquale. Presenting the third place trophy today is Councillor Robert Taylor, the Mayor of the Bathurst Regional Council. In second place today for Go Karts Go, Wayne Russell, Aaron Russell and Drew Russell. <laughs> Presenting the second place trophy today is Vivek Ponsame, CEO, MRF Tyres Australia. And ladies and gentlemen, the winners of the High Tech Oils Bathurst Six Hour for 2023 for Secure Wealth Advisors, Simon Hodges and Jaden Ojeda. And now we welcome George Gambino, the CEO of High Tech Oils, to present the winning trophy. Congratulations to our winners. It's time to celebrate at Mount Panorama. The end of an amazing day at the High Tech Oils Bathurst six hour and the celebrations on the podium. It's the best view you can get here at Mount Panorama. What an extraordinary day of racing. We started a quarter to 12 local time. The sun is definitely disappearing on us now. It's been cold all day, but these champions above us are soaking it all up. Wow, did we see that one coming? 6.213 kilometres, just one lap, Marcus. Just another classic Bathurst six hour. What an amazing finish. You raced for six hours for a one lap shootout <laughs> and it went to the worthy winner, Jaden O'Jada. His biggest race win for his career, no doubt about it. Yeah, and Simon Hodges as well. I mean, we, we can go through this race in detail and we'll do that in the coming weeks, but there's always going to be that moment of Jaden down Conrod straight. <laughs> what grass, I'll just go out there. <laughs> yeah, very great. A bit of rally style, so, so we like that. But even up and down the field and the battles for the classes, such impressive performances by, uh, you know, quite a lot of people up and down that grid that have definitely done a lot for their careers today. Josh, we asked you at the, qu at the question at the start of the day, can anyone beat the Beamers? Well, the answer's right behind us. <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive, isn't it? Look, just so happy for uh, Jaden and the team. A lot of guys involved in that actually work in, uh, selfishly, my team with HMO <laughs> Custom Racing. So uh, amazing to see them get up, and Jaden deserves it. He's, uh, he's an amazing driver and a, a great result. 
So many storylines, Stubbsy. Yeah, so many stories. I love the Simon Hodges story. I mean, this is a guy who's been racing at state level for some years. He's been coming here to the six hour for a number of years and he's been close each year, getting better and better and he's pulled it all together and he deserves the spoils and the champagne today. Marcus, you can have the final say. You came back, you got the helmet back <laughs> on, you went out there, it didn't turn out the way that you wanted it. Do we see you back next year? Uh, maybe, let's wait for that, but I just oh, want to say on, I'm please. the epitome. What do you think, folks? Do we see Marcus Ambrose back next uh, year? If, You're if in. I do come back, I'm coming back with a manual gearbox, yeah. OK? <laughs> yeah, well said. All right, well, listen, it's been an extraordinary event. Our thanks to everybody who's made this happen. The High Tech Oils Bathurst 6 Hour is an absolute beauty. It is round two of the Shannon Speed Series. Next up, we're going to Phillip Island. So from one great racetrack to another, a full schedule on the Shannon Speed Series. Congratulations to all of those who took part across the weekend, across all of our categories. A big thanks to our Stan Sports team. Well done to our commentators, Richard Crail and Matt Nolte. Thank you to you down here in pit lane. Did you like it, folks? Not bad. Not bad at all. What a way to finish. We'll see you next time for the Shannon Speed Series.